All right, now we're really getting started. Woo! All right, guys, what a way to start. We are here Tuesday, October 20th, and we are getting started with Global Maker Day. All across the world, we have people joining in, and we actually have um, our organizing team here, as well as our first presenter that will be getting us started. We'll introduce her in a second. And um, we're gonna go ahead and just introduce ourselves. I'm Jamie Donnelly. I'm here with my daughter, Eliana Donnelly, getting started. And uh, Michael Dresick, do you wanna take it away? Hey everyone, happy Global Maker Day. My name is Michael Dresick, and I'm part of the organizing team. And I'm joining in from just outside of Buffalo, New York, uh, here in Angola, New York, uh, and tuning in from Lakeshore Central School District. So thanks for joining everybody. It's gonna be an awesome day. All right, Katie, you wanna get us started? In California. Good morning. <laughs> Good morning, guys. Katie McNamara here from Bakersfield, California, representing North High School and Fresno Pacific University. It's ready to rock and roll and all the meeky stuff. Oh, I gotta make breakfast. It's early. I still gotta <laughs> <laughs> That's perfect. We're all makers, right? All right, Mary Alice. Uh, happy Global Maker Day. I wish I was physically in the same room, same place, same time with the organizing team, but this is a fabulous. I'm so happy to be joining you virtually from Connecticut, and I'm looking forward to, to making and learning with everyone today. Awesome. Amy. Hi, Amy Storr in Montgomery, Texas. Excited about kicking off this event. And yes, I agree with Mary Alice. I wish I was in 3D with these awesome people today, but I will take what I can get and excited to learn alongside you all today. Awesome. Nancy. Hi, everybody. My name is Nancy Pinchev. I am in Miami, Florida, and I am with Shet Khalil Community School, and we're very excited to be here today. We're going to have some of our middle schoolers and my lower school students also presenting today, so we're super excited. That's great. We're going to be having people joining in as panelists all day long because this is a day of craziness. We've already started off with our craziness today and you're gonna join the craziness with us all day long. We're gonna be making and creating and seeing what our incredible students can do and get started and hand this over to Jess. Jess will be in the background ready to support you and help you. And you can just let us know um, if you need any help and then we'll roll over to our next presenter here shortly. Thank you, Jess. Thank you, Jamie. Hi everyone. So. My name is Jess Harris. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here so you could see some of the things that I'm going to be sharing. Look good. So good morning. And like I said, I'm Jess Harris and I'm coming to you from Limestone University here in Daphne, South Carolina. Um, I'm the director for STEAM in Space Education at our Center for STEAM and Space Education. And we're proud to be an Aldrin Space Learning Hub. Um, I'm actually wearing my moon shirt here in honor of the moon and Mars maps that I use from the Aldrin Family Foundation. And our center specializes in STEAM pedagogy, which is the integration of science, technology, engineering, art, including humanities. I have to add that in with art because it's important, and math as it's applied to inquiry teaching. Um, many of the best scientists and mathematicians are makers. So um, I'm starting off this morning talking about chaos theory and double pendulums. So basically, I'm mainly here to share about the integration of math and science, essentially physics, as applied to making. Um, so before we talk about double pendulums, let's discuss single pendulums. So a single pendulum is a rod hanging from a pivot that could swing back and forth. And a double pendulum has one pendulum swinging from the tip of another pendulum. And a triple pendulum hangs a third pendulum from the tip of the second and so on and so forth. This could keep going. Um, I wanted to share a simple pendulum simulator. And this is a simulator at myphysicslab.com. I wanted to point out that if you're interested in coding, the open source code at My Physics Lab is available on GitHub. In fact, um, all of My Physics Lab is provided as an open source software under the Apache 2.0 license. 
and all of its source code is on GitHub. So this includes the other simulation of a double pendulum that we're going to be looking at later during my chat today with you. So as you could see here, a simple pendulum is basically a mass swinging back and forth from a fixed point. Imagine a ball hanging from a string. So there's lots of variables you could investigate using this simulated pendulum. Right here, I've just grabbed it with my mouse to move it on my own. But in this simulation, you could even change gravity. So um, you can notice on this page too, all the physics calculations used to calculate different factors involving pendulums um, can be explored. I'm gonna scroll back up to our pendulum. But what about pendulums in real life? Are they just like this simulation? The best way to find out is to try it yourself, which brings me to your classroom challenge. How can you create your own pendulum using classroom resources? Um, share out your creations today using hashtag Global Maker Day. It could be a simple pendulum, just like this simulation represents, or you could try your hand at a double pendulum. Um, some fun connections using pendulums include keeping time, like in clocks, keeping the beat, like in a metronome, um, or even pendulum art. So you could use paint or sand falling out of a cup as the pendulum swings. And I'd love to hear about all the other pendulum connections you find or use to create. So before I talk about double pendulums, I wanna mention chaos theory. So chaos theory is a part of mathematics that looks at systems that are very sensitive. So sensitive that a small change in the beginning could result in a completely different outcome. So I wanna share a fun example for you today. Uh, weather is often used as an example of a chaotic system because there are weather patterns, but they do not repeat. And this makes it really hard to make long range weather forecasts. So in the 60s, meteorologist Ed Lorenz, he built a simple computer weather model that could make simple predictions about wind speed, precipitation, and temperature when given some initial measurement values. Well, like all tinkerers, Ed played around with his computer weather model, and he found out something really surprising. When he rounded down the initial values that he put into his model, from six significant figures to three significant figures, he found out something surprising. The results ended up completely different. So basically what he did, let's say he had a temperature as 12.3456 degrees Celsius. Instead of putting that into his system, he input the same temperature reading as 12.3 degrees Celsius. And he was super surprised that such a small change in the input resulted in a totally different output. So Ed's results show chaos theory, basically that sensitivity to initial conditions. So a little change in how you start has a big impact later on. This is sometimes called the butterfly effect. So you may have heard of this term before, because it's just a real cool thought experiment to think about. Um, a lot of times when people talk about the butterfly effect, this is when others wonder about the beat of a butterfly wing in China could, in principle, have an impact on the weather in New York. So the idea is that a small flap of that butterfly's wing, as it coasts on an air current, would have a different impact than if the butterfly flapped its wing on takeoff. Um, so it's a really beautiful idea to consider. So with that in mind, let's look at double pendulum. So I have an example here. This is my example that I made. And this is a double rod pendulum. And it's one of the simplest examples of dynamics that creates chaotic motion. So dynamics is the branch of physical science that studies the motion of objects and the effects from physical factors like force, so the force of this moving, mass, each of these items have mass, momentum, and energy. So this simulation 
also shows a double pendulum. So we're gonna look at that as well. This is again from myphysicslab.com. Um, generally for large motions in a double pendulum, it's a true chaotic system. So if I really move this around, we could get some really interesting results. Slow it down. And then for smaller motions, it's more of a simple linear system. So you could see here how a small starting position has a more predictable result, one that you might imagine for a pendulum of this swinging back and forth motion. Whereas a large starting position has a more seemingly unpredictable result. So I have some questions for all those makers out there. One, how can you describe the motion of a double pendulum? So with this example I have here, or um, an example you create yourself, and I want you to form a hypothesis about how a double pendulum will move when released from different positions. So you could imagine all the different ways you could potentially move from this initial point, because this is where this pendulum starts and any motion away from its resting point, when I release it, it's gonna have a different impact on the way that it moves. In order to best investigate, you're probably gonna to wanna to build your own double pendulum. And this is how I built my double pendulum. I'm gonna explain it. Uh, initially, I didn't know what materials I was gonna use. So I pulled out all of my maker stuff. And for my final prototype, um, I ended up using some pretty simple materials. So my maker stuff is everywhere. Um, so here's an example of like one of my crates of maker materials. And a lot of these things I get from the dollar store or the recycled or reclaimed materials. Um, cups from eating out, um, just interesting things that I find at the dollar store. These were all the supplies that I utilized when I was trying to figure out a way to make my own pendulum. And I went through a lot of different ideas. A lot of things were too heavy. A lot of things were too light. But once I pulled out my supply of fidget spinners, I realized this is what I needed because it has a spinning mechanism that is much more stable. Notice there's not a lot of wiggle in this direction um, than other things that I had in order to make a spin. So I paired it with some wooden craft sticks and these are the jumbo craft sticks. So these are about six inch in size. And what I did was using hot glue gun and glue sticks, um, I basically hot glued one end of my stick to the center moving part of a fidget spinner. So I glued it here in the center part, the center spinning part. So the stick is attached to the center uh, bearing of this fidget spinner. And so from there, I glued a the other end to the stationary arm of my second fidget spinner. So I went from the center of my first fidget spinner, I hot glued it, and then I glued it to the second stationary arm, the second fidget spinner. And then on the second fidget spinner, again, I hot glued my wooden craft stick or popsicle stick to the center moving part of my fidget spinner. So I made sure this glue is attached just to this moving bearing mechanism in the center. And that is how I created my fidget spinner, um, double pendulum, using simple materials that I had around the house. And I actually share about this experiment in my book, Real Science Experiments, 40 Exciting STEAM Activities for Kids. So 
now that I have this, I hold this top part stationary and I could experiment with different ways of letting go and allowing my fidget spinner to move in different ways. So I think it'd be really cool to attach a light to one of these arms of the pendulum and record a time lapse um, of its motion in the dark. The light might be too heavy, even if it was like an LED throwy. And I'm throwing this out to you makers to come up with something cool with this. Um, but I haven't tried it with an LED throwy, so it might work. Another workaround could be using some glow in the dark substance, like glow in the dark paint. There are other ways to create double pendulums using different materials than what I shared here. So feel free to use whatever materials you have to make it work. Um, again, this brings me back to my classroom challenge. How can you create your own pendulum using classroom resources? So you could use like my approach here and make a double pendulum, or you could create a simple pendulum and just have one um, kind of moving point for that. But definitely share your creations out using Global Maker Day. I would love to see all of the things that you create um, using this idea here. So um, thank you so much for the time here to share this morning. Um, definitely my mission at Limestone Center for STEAM and Space Education is to provide memorable learning experiences that are going to instill passion for the use of STEAM pedagogy by formal and informal educators and learners of all levels. So find me on Twitter at Harris Teaches and we could talk about STEAM learning, STEAM teaching, pendulums, um, and of course all of your cool creations that you think of using either a single pendulum or a double pendulum. I would love to see it. Jess, this is great. I'm so glad we're starting off with a concept that really works across both elementary, middle school, secondary students. Um, could even go into college level, depending on how complex that they wanna make this and talking about maybe some of the physics and, and the math behind that as well. Um, so it's so great to, to hear your session and to see your session. I love how you are a maker and oftentimes we don't see that in math. And I'm so glad that today we're seeing the visuals that really do come to pass within math in our classroom. So that's, that's perfect. Um, thank you again for joining us. I know we're going to be getting started here shortly with um, Wendy's classroom, Mrs. Cope's classroom. And um, while we're doing that, I'm going to go ahead and just share with you again the website because there are a couple things that have finally loaded. And I'm going to go ahead and um, share our main page with you. And here on the main page, you can see the first thing you're going to be able to watch is looking at um, our main page right here. If I push play, you're gonna see us a little bit delayed uh, for us, but you'll see us here live on the screen. Um, on the next screen, you're gonna see, I'm gonna make sure that's muted. You're gonna see our Spanish session going right now, which is just amazing. I love to see how um, our students are learning across the board, across the world and to see that they have sessions going on and live stream happening and lots of great information going out there for our students and maker opportunities. And they're using, of course, the same hashtag, Global Maker Day today, if they are posting. And then they're also able to post on our website and I'll show you that in a second. So you'll see also throughout the day that we have different sessions going on. Of course, we started off with Jess's session. Next, we're gonna be introducing Mrs. Cope's classroom who are joining in remotely, which is really interesting and neat because typically it's the whole classroom that we're seeing. And so this is gonna be a whole new day of learning considering the pandemic um, and giving our students a chance to be able to share right from their home as well. And then we have um, some other classrooms that are gonna be joining us. We have a classroom joining us from India. And then we have Tim Needle sharing. So we have just great sessions coming up throughout the day. I'm gonna be transferring over in probably the next um, 30 minutes or so, uh, about an hour and a half from now, transitioning over to a campus. So you're gonna catch me and Eliana, my daughter, joining us from a campus. 
and we're going to be with students creating. So all day today, you're going to see this happening, all these great sessions happening. So here's Ellie with me right now. She's actually, do you want to tell them what you're working on? So why don't you show them your hands? <laughs> So you can see that she has some slimy fingers right now because she's working on slime, the various slimes all day today because she is writing a book on slime and um, using the different ingredients and sharing different ideas um, to be able to use. And so today her goal is to complete some of those photos that we're gonna be taking and we'll show you what that looks like throughout the day as well. So here we are, we have our um, agenda also in Spanish. So that's something that you can check out as well. And then the challenges are listed here for Global Maker Day as we're going through in English and sharing. And um, down below that, you're gonna notice our Padlet is here. And this is where um, you are able to share out whatever your challenges are, whatever you've accomplished. As students, this is great because if you wanna share what you've created, but we're not sharing that on necessarily on social media, this is a great chance for you to post your responses to these challenges here. And we're gonna be watching this all day. So as you have questions come in, comments come in, we'd love to see that. So that is available to you right now. And I know we're right getting started right now on our uh, next session. We have about a minute to go. So uh, Wendy, Miss Cope, if you wanna join in now, we'll get you and your students going. I can see a few of those students joining in. And as you're sharing, we're excited to kind of hear, you know, what your students are going to be presenting. Today's challenge from them or today's session is going to be looking at this crazy COVID time and connecting virtually with your students. So um, I think Wendy is here. Wendy, if you want to go ahead and join in. And then three of her class, so I'll go ahead and ask her classroom to um, start joining in with us. Hello. Hello. Can you guys hear us okay? We okay. are. We can't hear you at all. <laughs> we can't hear you at all. Not at all. That's what I tried to type to you in the chat. But I got oh, it. All right. Um, well, you can hear us okay, so that's the only thing that matters, right? Hey, so my virtual friends, if you guys would turn yourselves on, on your audio and your video, I see several of us who are here as well. Good to go. Maybe I can, do you see the other folks who are? Yes, hooray, yay. I'm so glad to see you, yay. Awesome. Oh, yes. Ocean. There you go. Yay. Hooray. Okay. So welcome. Uh, my name is Wendy Cope and we are, um, this is our Woodstock Middle School Maker Group and we are from Woodstock, Georgia. And um, we had a particular issue because last year our, um, our maker, well, the last five years, our maker group has been um, completely after school program. And of course, with, uh, with COVID, um, we have several students who are virtual and we have several students who are face to face and we wanted everybody to be a part together. Um, I mean, you know, together with our making project. And so um, we developed the idea of maker takeout. And so um, for virtual students, I made a delivery um, for a basic of a couple of different kind of deliveries, but um, for some basic maker supplies. And um, the kids who are here at school, they came and picked up boxes of bo boxes of materials. And then we meet on Teams every Tuesday afternoon, and we um, actually get a chance to um, to participate that way. Um, I want to be able to hear. See if I've got that. All right. Can anybody talk for a second? Unmute my speaker. Am I still on? I'm so sorry. Can I get a thumbs up? I'm still good to go. Okay, awesome. All right. I, I wish that I could see. <laughs> I wish I could hear from my other friends who are virtual. Um, I will be asking you guys to, to chime in as well. So let's get on with it. Um, this is kind of like how we would do it. So the view that you guys see, that's how we work with things. Um, so what I do is I give the, um, 
give the challenge on Teams, and then we get started. So today's challenge. We have some babies in the box. We have glue stick, and we have a ruler, and some, you know, some different, uh, let's see, those are called index cards, and rubber bands, and paper clips, and a sharpie, and some scissors, and regular pieces of paper. So, I'm going to give everybody their challenge. So, yeah, we'll let you guys just all introduce you, yourselves, and we'll start with Ms. Adasi. Ms. Adasi, will you introduce yourself? Um, my name is Yaira, and I go to Woodstock Middle School virtually. We're so excited to see you, Avery. Thank you so much for joining us. And Mr. Reichel, will you enjoy, introduce yourself? If you would go ahead and turn yourself off mute, baby. Okay. Dynamite. Um, my name is Ocean, and I go to Woodstock. Very cool. Thank you. All right. So here's your challenge for today. So your challenge is to solve a problem that you are, that is either COVID related, digital learning related. I want you to think about how, I mean, and these, remember, these aren't necessarily items that will work, but if you can get something to work, thumbs up. Um, but think about an idea that will help you solve a, or help somebody else solve a COVID related problem. So, um, you know, we're not talking about masks. Those are getting, the, I want you to be a little bit more creative. Think about pushing the limits. So what are some of the issues that you guys have heard about with, uh, with COVID-related with COVID issues? Yeah. Oh, yo, when I introduce you, I mean, when, I, when you raise your hand, make sure you say your name. So Cynthia, say your name. Yeah, yeah. So, um, anybody else? Yeah, go ahead. Um, Introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Julie. Hi. I think the problem is you and all the way have like six foot hands, six foot hand sanitizer. So, you need an organizational system, is what you're looking at. What else? What is another problem? Okay. Avery or Ocean, do you have guys? Y'all have some, um, some, you know, some issues that you thought of when I was just saying this? I know I'm putting you on the spot. No? Okay, friends. So, you know, um, Avery and Ocean, if you guys would unmute yourself so that you guys can talk. I can't hear you at all, but, you know, feel free to chime in too, especially as virtual learners. Um, kind of talk about what it is that, you know, that you've enjoyed with what we've done or some of the challenges as well. Um, I'm going to kind of introduce you on that. Okay, so let's get to making. Um, so you have these, you know, these really quick supplies. And uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. It is 9.36. So we are going to make until about 9.50. And then we'll have some time to everybody introduce, I mean, to, you know, to explain what your project is and how it solves the problem. Yes? All right. Okay. Let's get started. So let's talk about what it is I've used Zoom before. Oh, so great. What you got? Oh, a walkie talkie. Very cool. That's our mic. Yeah, I know. It would make it here. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, that was a good idea. So remember, one of the things that we teach first is how to um, do some cardboard um, construction. So that way um, it's a little bit easier to, um, uh, to, to build. So you don't have to use as much adhesive. So one of the things that I especially enjoy Oh, did I steal your video? Yeah. Oh, I heard something. I did, I heard something. All right, so one of the 
one of the things that I really like is using is a tab and a slot. So, so basically, so this becomes my tab, okay? And then I'll cut a slot in here. So, and we have this as a resource on our, we, we operate out of our Canvas page and through Teams. So that's how we get together. And then we record our sessions too, so that everybody can um, you know, get to see it, even if they weren't able to come. I know that, um, for example, Lily uh, is in volleyball. And so there's a lot of times that she hasn't been able to come, but she's still interested in the program. So that can kind of get her into the groove of what's going on. We do afterwards as well, we do, um, we do a flip grid so that they can share their final, and it's never a final project, right? It's never a final product. All right, so here's the slot that I've got in it, and here's my tab. Usually what I do is I just fold this in so that I can slip it through. And that way it's connected and it's secure. So I did this making a hat that was fairly unsuccessful except for the tab and slot issue. <laughs> what are some of the projects that we've done, guys, that you've enjoyed? All right, go ahead. Oh, so making costumes. Talk about the costume that you've been making. Keep making while you're talking. Yeah. I'm so sorry. I um, so yeah, there's always something good about being creepy, uh, creepy baby. Hey, so um, yeah, so guys, make sure. Do you see that Ms. Dolly says it's hard to hear the students, so you've got to be really, really loud. All right, um, Avery, would you talk about some of the things that you've enjoyed, um, and then I'll go to Ocean after that. Some of the things that have worked well for you, or some of the challenges that you've experienced as a result or what you what you appreciate about our after school? Um, one thing I really liked was making the costumes and I also really liked the project where we were like finding, uh, um, trying to solve a problem from something fall related. And yes. I really oh, liked those like projects. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Well, it's, it's so good for us to see you too um, on, on the screen. I know everybody, and you know, like today when you popped up, it was like, oh, we see you, Avery, it's so good. So that's great. Hey, Ocean, what have you enjoyed that we've done? Um, I like the first one, the, um, the fake Olympics one. Oh yeah, we did, we did faux, we did a faux Olympics um, challenge that, uh, so we were supposed to make our own sport. Um, that because, you know, it, you know, it's, it's COVID so that, you know, that we could stay socially distanced and, um, and to be able to, you know, to still, to still compete. Who did you get to complete your sport? Did you, did Reed do it? Did your brother do it? Yeah. Did he win? Did he do a good job? <laughs> That's good. Hey, so, um, Logan, tell us about what it is that you're making. Uh, so that he can be able to talk to his friends a little bit more. So that was especially during during the shutdown when we really didn't have much opportunity, right? So Madeline, tell us really loud what you're making. Um, I'm doing a Yeah, and that's, that is one of the things to try to be able to, you know, connect, connect, uh, you know, to try to be able to organize yourself so that you have everything that you need so you don't have to keep on popping up and down. Abby, you've been, you, I, what I really appreciate is that you've been communicating with us at your mom's school. So she comes and picks you up and then you join our team's meeting at her, in her classroom. What has been unusual about that for you? Super loud. Yeah. 
so she's so she's taking advantage of her mom's teacher closet to be able to. But I mean, that's one of the things that we've really enjoyed is the flexibility um, to be able to, um, you know, do the. Yeah, I was gonna say um, that to be able to to do you know to do the task wherever you are. So making doesn't have to be in this space, um, and we've really we've really enjoyed that. Um, hey, Ocean, uh, what what works what works well with you guys um, with being virtual? Um, like in general, or just with school? Um, any either way. Um. Like first, I get to eat whatever I want, and <laughs> with school, um, I don't gotta wake up early. So you get to work on your own schedule. Yeah. How has um, but how has the maker program worked in with your with your schedule so far? Um, because like uh, it worked because what right after um, after we're done with our maker take out um i have music lessons so it fits perfectly in my schedule yeah and that's one of the things too is that you can hop in and hop out you don't have to your folks don't have to um you know haul you someplace and maybe if you were here at face to face you wouldn't be able to participate in um in your in the maker program because you'd have to go right to your music lesson and this way at least you can do that um we've got about five more minutes friends five more minutes to design i know we better hustle so okay well you know what and sometimes that's what it is right maker sometimes you just play around with the materials until you get it together so sometimes the materials give you So he's going to try to uh, super, you know, uh, customize. No. Oh yes. So the problem that he's solving is a smelly mask syndrome, right? So he's trying to figure out something to put in the mask. Yes. Oh, is there a bacon mask? Yeah, is that what you said? Like bacon in it. I don't want, I don't know if I would want to have a meat smell in, uh, in my, my thing. All right, so let's see what else we got. Yeah, it's okay. Just, hey, keep playing around, right? Don't be scared. It's all right. Avery, how about you? What are you working on making? Um, this is kind of for online school, but I'm always doing meetings, so... Um, I made like a machine thing where you can attach it to your laptop and then it has an automatic um, light switch so you don't have to sit by the window so you're not like dark in the meeting. So. All right, guys, it looks like Mrs. Cope is getting disconnected and reconnected right now. Can you students still hear me? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I think, have you guys been remote all school year so far? Yeah. Yeah, has it been challenging at times? I mean, are there times where you're like, did I make the right choice? Yeah, when, when has that been a, the biggest challenge? Um, sometimes I miss seeing my friends and um, I've been doing online since the end of fifth grade, I think. Really? Mm -hmm. Awesome. And um, what, what would you say? I, I think it's OSHA, right? Am I saying that correctly? 
Osha, what, how about for you? When have you felt like that maybe it wasn't the right decision or did, did you make the right decision? Um, first of all, I miss my friends. And then um, also like, I, I feel like I kind of made the right decision too because I can sleep in, but you can't do that when you go face to face. Yeah. Well, there's definitely some pros to that. And I've even heard some people have a blended classroom. And I think we're seeing that across the country as well. Some people go to school on certain days and go to, you know, do it remote on other days too. So I completely understand about the friends issue because I have two girls and my oldest son and they're the same way. But my oldest son is in college, which is really interesting and in how they're handling this. You want to show them what you're making? So my daughter Eliana is doing slime in the background while you guys are creating. And she is, remind me what grade you guys are in. I'm in sixth. Perfect. She's in sixth grade as well. And um, she is making, do you want to tell them about it? Okay. <laughs> All right. She's making slime. Oh, there we go. We are connecting right now with audio. Mrs. Cope's class. Oh, it looks like you're muted. There we go. Sorry about that. No problem. Can you hear me? All yeah. right. Can you hear us again? Yes. Yeah. I just wanted to share with you what these guys were doing. And I'm going to start over here with Abby. And uh, oh, I'm so glad that we still had Ocean and Avery there to fill in the gap. Sure. All right. So talk about what it is that you're making. Um, so this is like basically like for businesses. So like not a lot of people like use hand sanitizer. And this is going to be like in the window. You put your hands through like this thing and then there's hand sanitizer and then you like the business worker or worker for anything will just squeeze it and then you'll get hand sanitizer. So there's a, so it's a business aspect so that more people will use hand sanitizer um, as, a, as a result. That's very cool. Y'all, can we get some applause for Abby? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. All right, Madeline, let's show us where you are with your. So I'm doing. Um, a desk organizer like I um, said earlier so I did um, compartments in there like so you have like pencil holders in place to put um, different items that you would use for school yeah tell me about the rubber band how what is that for and then it um, then this is kind of like a hanging compartment if you need to like put anything there all right so it's like a bungee situation yeah 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 okay applause for Miss Madeline yes all right Logan talk to me And, um, and then this is like to hold it. And this is basically like the radio thing. So you're, you're just creating something that you wish you had during, during the pandemic. I mean, sorry, during the, the shutdown or yeah. pause as we call it. So all right, guys. She is, she's going in and out. So I'm just going to be here to kind of fill it in as you're going. Um, but Ellie did want to share with you guys what she's doing because the classroom right now in White Oak, Texas is watching and they said, is she chewing gum? But she's not. Do you guys know what she's making? What kind of slime she's making right now? All right, Bruce. It is. It's edible slime. That's exactly right. So what do you think she used? Um, maybe chewing gum or Starburst. Yeah, she used Starburst and what else? Powdered sugar. How did, do you want to show them closer to the camera? See the slime? So how do you make it more gooey or could you make it more gooey? Microwave it. So the colder it gets, the harder it's getting, right? So at first, <laughs> she did wash her hands, just FYI in case anybody's wondering, because I did. Um, but she, she was able to, she's over there just making all these Various slime. Have you guys ever made slime before? Yeah, I did. What kind have you made? Um, usually fluffy slime. Yeah, lots of shaving cream. Mm -hmm. so her dad doesn't like that because every time he goes to shave, all the shaving cream's gone. But okay. we do that too. Osha, how about you? Have you ever made slime? Yeah, uh, one time, but it was very sticky. <laughs> yeah 
And most parents are adamantly against having slime at home, right? So that's why it's perfect at school too, because this is a chance to make. Um, yeah, do you want to tell me about what your book is going to be? ABC slime. So every page is going to have a different type of slime uh, from A through Z. What's Z, by the way? I have no idea. We have to go look at our list. <laughs> there is a, somebody asked me that yesterday. Do you guys know any Z slimes? Zebra slime. Is there a zebra slime? I think so. Like the stripes? Yeah. Yeah, that yeah. might be. True. Yeah. Um, so as you guys are doing this remotely, um, how often do you have to join in on video, or do you get to join in on video? Um, usually you have to have your mic muted and your camera turned off because they record it because mm -hmm. they have like a slideshow and you want to take notes so they record it so you can go back and look at it. So normally you're not on video when you're joining in in class, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you like that or not? Um, I don't really mind. But on Maker. All right, friends. We're going to try to finish this up. All right, Abby. What? Talk about it. Oh, I'm making, um, I'm making cups that, like, with the string that it goes along. And when, when they're connected, you can actually communicate with each other. So now you can just, like, your friend lives next door and, like, your, their parents are super strict. You can just have this and communicate. Okay. Thank you very much. Can we have some applause for those? Yay. All right. Coming back around. Um, Billy. So I was trying to make a box, and then I was going to put like a tall bun, up, and I was going to put a paper clip through, so it could be like you could put it on your book bag or like your pocket, and it could be like something to carry hand sanitizer and mask. But um, I forgot that they had to actually be the same length to do it. <laughs> so and I ha don't have any tape. So. Right. So I the the tab it. the tabs would work, and then yeah. of course if you had some tape that Mrs. Cope wouldn't let you have, sorry. All right, All right some applause for Lily, please. Yay. All right, Joseph, help us so, out. So what I made is that I uh, made a little mask scent that you can use in your mask. Currently it is Sharpie Flakes scented. <laughs> we'll have other flavors out soon. <laughs> Like, um, it's the only scent that I could think of. So. Yeah, I was going to say, yeah. a lot of people enjoy smelling um, sharp, uh, yeah. smelling markers. Well, and this is a big time entrepreneurial spirit, too. Yeah. So I like that. Applause. Yay. Hey, can we finish up with, um, can we finish up with what Ocean and Avery have done? Would you please hold yours up? Okay. So um, thank you, Avery, for sharing yours. Ocean, were you able to get it? together uh, uh, no not really well are there any other issues that we as I said that we haven't gotten a chance to talk about guys are there any other issues that you guys want to talk about that um, that or that what you've enjoyed okay is it working <laughs> A communication system where it's connected by string, and then you can like flip it onto your walkie talkie and like talk from far away. Yes, so we, we need to have a, a few more a few more rubber bands in order to get our six feet distance, right? Yeah. So that would be that. Um, other things that we um, that you guys would say to um, to to encourage other people to continue making even if you're virtual or if you're face-to-face. -face. Yeah, Lily, what do you like about the making process? Um, it's just like really fun. You get to use your creativity. Because a lot, because we do, now that we're in sixth grade, we have a lot of schoolwork. Yes. And so this is kind of taking my mind off it. Also, the thing I like is I get this. Um, I just really like this. Yeah, thank you. I'm so glad. Yeah, Abby. Um, it, this is good because like being at home, if you're a virtual learner, being at home, like all like cramped up in your house and not being able to go because of coronavirus. I mean, this is a way that like you can do something to get your mind working again, and you can feel happy, and you, you don't feel as confined. Right, right. So if we had if we had been able to continue this over over the pandemic, over the lockdown, then that would yeah. be it. So I'm really glad that we've got Avery and Ocean to have, have to add us add on what you got Cynthia Wait, so um I think it's good to be like 
part of this because after a while, um, you like doing online school, you just rely on computers and everything. But if you learn yourself how to do stuff, then it's easier. And like we learned how to make um like attach stuff without using tape and stuff, which you can really use in the real world. Right, and it's less expensive. Uh -huh. Abby, did you want to so finish this out? Or are you good? Okay. Um, one of the next skills that we're going to be working with, um, one of the next skills that we're going to be working with with our group is um, is actually sewing skills um, because we wanted to make sure that we've got some um, you know some you know some manual dexterity and it's something that in a lot of STEM um, a lot of STEM careers uh, that they're looking for. That was one of the things that they've noticed that has kind of fallen off with surgeons and people in the medical field or people who have to have, you know, very fine motor skills. Anyway, um, thank you so much for letting us, you know, have some time today and getting to talk about, uh, you know, talking about our program. I hope you guys got to make something fun and maybe that you were able to solve the problem that, um, that you've experienced over, over the pause. So thank you guys so much. You're awesome. Very good. Yay. Um, thank you, all these amazing makers. I especially, and I hope they have a chance to go back and listen to this since they can't hear this now. We, and I'll put this in the chat. We loved it. Okay. So you guys did a great job. The communication um, option with the cardboard to hear through the rubber band. That was brilliant. I, I <laughs> love that idea. So very good job, guys. Um, we're going to be moving to our next presenters here. We are right at the time. Thank you guys so much. Have a great day. Thank Bye -bye. you. Appreciate y'all. Yeah. All right. So we have a couple classrooms right now. Actually, um, one delivering individually um, and, and another going to be um, sharing out for um this maker day today, and that's going to be coming from India. So we have two classrooms joining in, um, Samita and uh, Anju, and both of them are going to be sharing and splitting their time. So uh, Samita is going to be joining us first, and um, then we're going to be hearing from Anju and, and from what they're doing in this great time. So the first one is going to be focused on um, the SDGs, which I'm really excited about hearing and learning about. And then the second one that we're gonna be hearing about is really gonna be looking at coding using Scratch. So both of those will be presented here and I wanna give you as much time as possible to get started, but I will be here in the background available to support you. So just let me know if you need anything. Okay, thank you so much, Madam Jamie. Uh, I'm too excited to be part of the Global Maker Day. Please allow me to share my screen. Is it uh, visible? Is my screen visible, ma'am? Looks great. Okay, thank you so much. So good evening, everyone from India. Here it's uh, 7.30 p.m. And I'm joining with my colleague, another colleague from India, that is Miss Anju Chug. So let us get started for the Global Maker Day. Welcome all the educators, all the students from the global scenario, Welcome everyone for the Global Maker Day. I'm Sumedha Sodhi from India and I am a global maker. I'm proud to say that because I believe in instilling digital citizenship by using different tech tool among my learners. So here I'm going to talk about the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals in today's Maker Day. So first of all, I would like to ask you, do you know what are SDGs? Let us learn about SDGs through this video. Did you know that the UN Sustainable Development Goals are a universal call to action that unites 193 countries around the world? If these global goals are fulfilled by 2030, life on Earth will be better for everyone. So what are these goals? Eliminate poverty in all its I think there is a internet issue here. The video is uh, taking little bit time to download.
its forms. No hunger. Everyone should have safe, nutritious, and sufficient food. Everyone has equal access to health care, thus ensuring our well-being and a healthy life. Equal access to a quality education. Ensure gender equality where women and girls have the same opportunities as men and boys. By achieving these goals, each member of our society will be equal, safe, and happy. UN Global Goals also include Access to safe drinking water and sanitation. Access to clean energy that is safe for people and the environment. Sustainable and stable economic growth. Everyone has a decent job. Strong infrastructure and the support of innovations. Lower inequality within and among countries. Cities and settlements be developed without damaging the environment and people. Achieving these goals will result in the well-being of people and our planet. We can further take care of our environment with the following goals. Sustainable and safe production and consumption of products. Take urgent measures to reduce climate change and its impact. Ensure the sustainable use and protection of ocean and sea resources. Restore and protect Earth's ecosystems. By achieving these goals, we will form a society where strong institutions ensure peace and justice. It is important for everyone to be involved and to build partnerships for achieving sustainable development goals. You are part of this process. Demand the implementation of these goals. Take the lead and share information with your friends. So thank you for watching this video. As you know that everyone's participation is very important in the global goals. So here for the Global Maker Day, I have made a challenge for all of you. So let's all become a SDG guardian. In this challenge, you have to tell us which SDG goal you are passionate about to work upon out of these 17 goals. So share your plan of action to combat the challenge to planet and humanity. So I have created a Bunsi board here where you can share your goal and make a video and tell us about which goal you are passionate about. You can simply draw, create, sing and can do anything according to the available resources with you and suggest us what are the solutions according to you to combat the SDG challenge and be a SDG guardian. So these are the slides which you can use in the Bunsi animation board and tell us about your passion, mention the SDG you are passionate about and how you would like to work upon it for the attainment. You can give us five best solutions according to you to combat the challenge. So I invite all the educators and the students around the world to please scan this QR code to see the Bunsi board that will help you to know what kind of Bunsi slides you can create and you can share your opinion with us. If you do not know about Bunsi, so do not worry at all. You can make a poster or you can record your thoughts in a video you can share a mind map or a sketch note, write a poem or a rap song and share with us on the Twitter with the hashtag Global Maker Day. We are eagerly waiting for you. And if you don't like to do all these tasks, then there is an interesting SDG quiz for all of you. We're using the tool quizzes. So you just have to go to the web browser, joinmyquiz.com put this code, it will ask you for a code to play the game. The code is 29515336. You can play the quiz there and share your score with us on Twitter with the hashtag Global Maker Day. So here I am, Sumedha Soji. You can also tag me on Twitter. My Twitter handle is at the rate Sodi Sumedha, and I am the social science educator in India at Elkhorn International School. Now, let me show you what are the different SDG goals 
that you can try upon. So here is a spin wheel. Let me spin the wheel and see which SDG goal we receive. You can also choose your own favorite SDG goal. So let us see which SDG goal we receive or which you can share with us your passion or you can choose your own SDG goal also. So here we get SDG 17. Wow. We have a winner here. That is SDG 17. So let me tell you something about SDG 17. Those who are passionate about SDG 17, it says that we have to work for all the SDG goals in partnership. All the goals are interrelated to each other and we have to come in a partnership to achieve the Agenda 2030. So let us see the next SDG goals which comes. So whatever SDG goal you are passionate about, you can start working upon the challenge. Oh, wow. It's SDG 6. So do you know what is SDG 6? SDG 6. SDG 6 talks about clean water and sanitation. So if you are passionate about working for clean water and sanitation, please take a step forward and share your work with us. Let us try one more time. So here it is, SDG 15. Do you know what is SDG 15? SDG 15 talks about life on land. So if you are passionate about working for the life of human beings, for the plants, for the animals, you can tell us about your passion, that what are your solutions to combat the challenges faced by the humanity and the living beings on the land. So thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed the challenge activities. I'm waiting eagerly to see your participation on Twitter. And now I invite my colleague, Ms. Anju, to take forward the session. Thank you so much. Hello, all. Welcome you to Global Maker Day. I'm Anju from India. We'll be doing coding through Scratch. I'll be sharing my screen. I hope you all can see my screen. Looks great. Thank you. Welcome you to Global Makers Classroom. In this classroom, what we'll do? We'll catch the sprite, this cat. We'll catch this sprite and we'll make a wonderful things using our creativity. Now, the question arises, what is Scratch? Scratch is a free programmable toolkit which helps kids, especially the students, to create their own games, animated stories, interactive art, and yes, whatever you are making on Scratch, the students can share their creations with the another world through internet. We'll be doing everything through Scratch. So get started with Scratch. Scratch can be done online as well as offline. That means in you can do online through scratch.mit.edu. We'll be doing online. For offline, you have to download Scratch Junior from Google Play Store. So let's start Scratch. We ha will have some hands-on on Scratch. So you, I have already started scratch.mit.edu. You can join the Scratch community so that you can share your creativity with the other world. You can directly start creating your own projects, but that cannot be shared if you are not joining the community. So let us join the Scratch. If you click on this button, certain formalities you have to fulfill and you can sign in your page. I have already made my own sign in. So I'm log logging in. This is my own 
scratch here you can click on create whatever you are making for yourself that can be saved in my stuff or you can see here my stuff whatever you are making will be saved here so let's start and explore what is there in scratch creating a project this is untitled every window has untitled we have to name it so today we'll do fun with letters so i'm writing fun with letters so this is my page where i'll be doing some creativity with my letters that is my name this is called a sprite this is a working area where i'll be writing the coding we don't have to learn each and every coding just drag and drop and you can see the creativity how the sprite will look you all will be th thinking that this sprite is not a letter how will we do this so for that we'll be changing this sprite this cat to a letter so i'm deleting this i'm making a new scratch sprite from here you can create new sprite and from here i'll be changing the white background which is shown behind the cat so let's first take letters i'm taking a so this cat we don't want so i'll be deleting this sprite now i'm taking another letter b you can take your own name also and any other fun letters which you want to do i'm taking three letters i i'll be showing you three creativities rest you all can explore there are so many blocks with the help of which you can make your own creations so now the background is not looking very nice so i am sharing or changing the background there are so many backgrounds for the i am taking this so i am placing drag drag and drop so now i am making coding for a these are so many blocks i am starting with this this is green button which means start this is red button to stop the way it's red light red light green red light says start red light says stop so this is events block where the green button will be shown so for a i am doing this is for a see i my block a is selected here this is when green button will click what what a will show i want a to move turn around can you hear me okay and you yeah, uh, we're in your, um scratch your slide screen right now do you want to go ahead and share your screen in scratch for us we're right now your... i'm doing online mhm mm we can just see your slides so we're not able do okay. you want to stop sharing and then screen share again now you can see um the wait a minute i'm doing again sure that would be perfect now it's okay Yes, we can see it now. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm starting again for in a few minutes. Wait. See, this is my scratch window. I'm starting again. So sorry. scratch. mit. edu. The page will look like this. I have already logged in, so so I'm logging out. The page looks like this. You can join the community where you can share. so join scratch certain formalities you have to put a username password you can or you all are smart enough that you i know you all can do this so i am doing i have already logged in so i am logging in through my username here it is a create button you can create we'll be doing fun with letters so i am untitled page i am naming it with fun with letters now this sprite this sprite doesn't look nice for letters so i'm changing this sprite to letters so i'll be taking certain letters c letters d letters e this sprite i don't want so i'm deleting it from here background you can just drag and drop and place it where you want just drag and drop background there are so many backgrounds even the so many tabs are there you can choose any options from here 
I'm placing this. Okay. Now let's do some animation, some creativity on these alphabets. Let's do it from for C. For this, there are certain tools here. These are blocks. And here we'll be writing the coding. We'll not write the code. We'll just drag and drop. Green button, start, red stop. So green button is an event section. Events, when clicked, this is for C. I want to do turn around. It will turn around. Let's see what it do. It has turned a little bit. Again, I'll click, it will turn. Every time I have to click and turn, but I want it to continuously turn on. So we have to put a loop for that so that it can keep on moving. To For putting the loops, we have to use control. I have to control this action. So I'm doing forever loop. I'll be putting it in forever loop. Now see, it keeps on moving. I can reduce the degrees also from here. I can change to 10. So it will move slowly. I can increase. It will move ahead bigger. This is for C. Now let's do it for D. D again. I'll stop it. D. When if go to events, when clicked, you can say when clicked, you can say when you press space bar, then it works. You can say when this sprite is clicked, when you click on this, the function, the creativity will be shown. So I'm doing it for green flag. Everything to be put on green flag. So when this is clicked, I'm now going to looks. I'll change the color, color picker tool I'll take. So I'll be changing the color from here. See again, only once it has changed its color. I want to repeat it. I want to repeat it only for 10 times. So again, control, I have to put the control. If you want to repeat it for 10 times, use repeat command if you want it forever. So put this tag in forever. See, it keeps on changing. This is spin the wheel. This is color changing. Now let's do it for E. We'll do something more creative for E. We'll go to sound. We'll put some sound in this. So go to events. When clicked, let's say sound now. Play sound, you can change. There are so many sounds. You can record your own voice also. I'll tell you from where you can add more sounds. This is meow sound. You can record your own sound also. Now, if I click, it will show you only once. The sound will be shown only once. But if I want to repeat for 10 times or forever, you can put a forever loop. You can put repeat loop. You can put some condition also. So it depends on your creativity, what you are doing for C. Stop. That nothing to be done, only sound is being created from E. So now my challenge is you can also use more extensions are there. See, there are so many extensions. You can see the sounds, you can play the sound. Let me take one more alphabet. Letters. Oh, so what it will show? Go to events. When this is clicked, extensions, I want the play sound, play drum. Let's see what it do. Drum sound is there, but I want movement also in this. So I'll be going to motions. Motion means movement. I want this move 10 steps and then back 10, steps, 10 steps. If I want back 10 steps, I'll be putting minus sign backwards, minus, and then I'll put again sound. Let's see what it do. See, one time it has moved. If I want to keep on moving, glide, so I'll be putting control forever. Put all the tags in forever loop this way. If you don't want any tab block, just drag it and drop it here. But I want it again, so I'll be taking it and putting it here. See, each and every alphabet has its own creativity in it now. Now, what my challenge is,
Now, what my challenge is, you have to you have to animate your own name or any word. And the same way that Sumedha told, you have to hand, uh, tweet it on with the hash line, tag line, global makers day. You can even create your own story with the sounds. I told you sounds, so many sprites are there, so many backgrounds are there. Even you can make a game also. There are controls, there are variables, there are operators where you can use and you can play games also. I hope you all have understood. Thank you. Great job. Both of you did an excellent job. Uh, definitely learned something from two totally different contrasting groups. I'm curious what age groups you both work with. Yeah, I work with the age group 13 to 15 years old, high sure. school. Okay. Yeah. I'm working with till 15 years. That is from uh, small kids. This is what coding can be done from smaller kids to the younger uh, 15 years till 10th class. Great. So with your different groups, what subjects do you teach? Yeah, I am a social science educator for classes 9th and 10th. So I take history, geography, economics, and uh, the political science so all four branches of social sciences I teach to high school students in India. Great. Andrew, how about you? I am computer teacher for grade second to 10th. That's wonderful. Do your kids just have a blast in your class or what? <laughs> <laughs> Seriously. Yes, our students are very passionate about technology and all the new tech tools like Bunsi, Seesaw, Nearpod, Quizzes, Quizlet, Flipgrid. We are using all tech tools to make this virtual learning experience great for them. And the learning should not stop. This is our motto. So we have mastered these tools first ourselves during the pandemic. And now we are giving uh, all the experiences to our students so that the learning becomes a lifelong process for them, whether it's COVID or it's known COVID or whatever disaster we face, but learning should happen for the children. Are your students actually in your classroom with you? So are they back to school? No, no still now we them. are having virtual classes. Mm -hmm. We are continuing with the virtual classes because in India, the cases are increasing. Right now, the situation is not... Uh, uh, comfortable for the students to call them to school but very soon maybe in the month of Jan we will be shifting to the hybrid model and uh, few students will be called to school and few will be learning virtually so very soon the hybrid learning will start in India yeah is that the same for you as well Andrew yeah we are from the same city okay you're experiencing the same yeah. things. I'm guessing yes, at yes. two different two different campuses. Is that correct? Yeah. <laughs> two okay. different campus, but same city. We same are from city. the heart of Delhi. India, that is Delhi, yeah. the capital of India. <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah. How do you how do you learn what you learn to bring back to your classroom? Yeah. All these tools, uh, first I have mastered through the webinars that are going on by Weeklate, Flipgrid and join the community. And then I started applying those knowledge, whatever I was learning with my children in the classroom. And once I learned, I started teaching those skills to my students. And now my students have become Bunsi ambassador and Weeklate ambassador. So it's all overall learning process, which is going on, I think. This pandemic has brought the students and teachers closer because now we are not only the mentor and the guide, but we are also learning from our students. Since uh, this generation is a, a digital generation, I can say generation Y is much more faster than the teachers in terms of technology. So some uh, few things the children are teaching to the teacher how to control Zoom, how to manage Microsoft Teams and <laughs> some of the learnings the students are telling and some we are sharing. So it is a collaborative effort that how this pandemic situation we are making most of the success with our learners and thanks to all of you educators like you, Amy, ma'am, 
and uh, Michael Sir, um, Maria Lice, ma'am, for conducting these programs and various uh, webinars I have attended by uh, Michelle Sir and Amy, ma'am, for the Bansi Wakelet and the Creative Beginning Session and the uh, Bansi Clock Ideas. So I'm really thankful to such educational leadership around the world that has helped to come up with the challenges as educators which we are facing due to the COVID-19. Thank you so much for the wonderful collaboration and they always uh, keep teaching us the new tools and new EdTech tools through your YouTube videos and through your webinars. I'm highly grateful to each one of you. Thank you. Cool. Well, I want to tell you that while you both were presenting, the organizing team and I are all texting each other saying, this is fantastic. You know, we love it. Uh -huh. We're really Thank excited. you. Thank you so much. Thank you both Thank you for so bringing much. your knowledge. And, Thank and you so much it. for giving us such a platform. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we hope to see some good responses from these two sessions. They did a great job. And their students, I'm sure, are going to be watching in and participating. Well. So we look forward to seeing those responses on hashtag Global Day or on the website if they want to post on the Padlet. So that would be both options for our students and our teachers. So thank you both. Have a wonderful day. Oh, thank you. you so much. Thank Happy you. Global Maker Day to everyone who is watching here. And I hope you will have a great learning experience with everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye. That's wonderful. Thank well, you. We're going to be. Have a great day. Have a great day. Have a great evening. Bye. Thank you. Bye. -bye. And we're thankful they joined us this evening, 7.30 p.m. their time. And so now we're going to be transitioning over to our next session with Tim Needles. And this is his first, Tim, correct me if I'm wrong, is this your first Global Maker Day? Yeah, first I'm presenting. I've actually been, been watching along and doing the projects with you guys for years. But yeah, this is my Very first time presenting. We're so honored. I know Nancy Pinchev, one of the organizers, was adamant about reaching out to you and getting you in here and hoping that you would say yes. Oh my gosh, look at your classroom. What a set. <laughs> wow. Yeah, no, we actually have a split classroom. So I'm going to start in here and then I'm going to move into my adjacent room to show you some of the student work. So we're in a hybrid learning situation right now. So we have some students at home and some students here working. So we'll get to show you some of the student work, which is great. Well, I can't wait to see and learn with you. We'll, we'll be in the background watching and let us know if you need us. Sure, thank you so much. Um, so uh, uh, my name is Tim Needles and I am here at Smithtown High School East on Long Island, New York. Um, and let me show you the project we are doing today. So um, let me just screen share. So um, this is a, a engineering challenge and I wanted to make sure that everything was really equitable. Um, so uh, this is um, a really handy project uh, from my book, Steam Power, that is sort of adjusted for uh, the modern day. Um, so we are going to build a catapult out of paper uh, and using all available items like bottle caps and rubber bands, cardboard, anything you could find around the house. Um, so I like uh, these creative challenges. This is one thing that I've done since the pandemic started. Um, each week I give a different creative challenge on Wednesdays and I share them on YouTube. So uh, it, it's been a really nice project um, that uses all equitable materials. We use some apps, we use uh, free tools, um, and it's been really handy. So this is one of my uh, Create Wednesday assignments. So the, the, this is the challenge. So create a catapult that can throw a penny using paper and materials you can grab around the house, like cardboard tape, paper clips, bottle caps, or rubber bands. So you need to engineer a design, then sketch it out, use design thinking to build it and edit if necessary. And we're gonna share some of these this week uh, with the hashtag ISD Steam Power as well. Um, so feel free to join in and share some of yours. So I always like to start with a little bit of history that helps. Uh, the catapult uh, was first invented uh, back in the fourth century BC in China and evolved and then the Greeks sort of mastered it. Um, and, I, and I think that like the last time it was used as a weapon actually, was in uh, World War I in trench warfare, but it's still used today uh, in aircraft carriers to catapult planes off of the decks. So one of the things I really like to uh, underscore is that process teaches more than product. So even if it doesn't come out amazing, you're gonna learn a lot and that's really important. So uh, a lot of failure 
uh, is necessary sometimes to come up with a success. So these are some elements that we always hit. Um, so I think that being an artist is all about being curious and you wanna really think about how a catapult works uh, when you do this. Here's an example of a really simple catapult uh, made with paper. Um, so, you know, we, we focus on the creative process, you know, brainstorming, thinking about it, incubating it, let those ideas cook, making, uh, evaluating, and then revising. And then finally, make sure you share. So here's some examples. Um, I did mine out of origami. Um, so you could do it just with paper and I will share how to do that. But I like students to come up with their own ideas. Uh, below is another example. Um, so I'm gonna now show the students. Uh, we'll take a look at some of the work that they're doing. Um, so remember, even if you fail, uh, Thomas Edison said, I've not failed, I've just found 10,000 ways that won't work. Uh, so that's important. So it should also be fun. So catapults are fun. Uh, we're, we're gonna have a contest to see who throws the furthest penny and who has the best design. Um, so uh, we are gonna now take a look at what the students are doing. Um, and I'm gonna switch to another camera. Um, so let's take a look at what the students are doing now. So let me just switch. All right, it looks like it's going um, through another device right now. So we'll just wait to hear back from Tim. Um, we're seeing it on one side, and I think the students are joining in in another room. So they'll be joining in. And we, again, are watching here as the live feed's going. We're sharing the content that's being created, the challenges that they're working on, either at, at, in the classroom or at home. Hi. All right, I'll let you take it away. Go and share your project. Hi, so I'm Kaylee, and right now in Mr. Needle's class, we're working on building paper catapults. So my partner Alexa is on her way here, but so far we've been drawing different concepts to try to get our ideas together. And it really helps communicate between us because we're very visual people. So that's what we were working on right now. Sorry, she's on her way. So with that in mind too, a lot of us have been trying out different ideas by actually building and not so much with the planning process by drawing. So it's a lot of trial and error, but I think that's part of the creative process. Right? Yeah. So I'll take over for a second. All right. Okay, so we have a couple more students coming in. We were uh, changing periods right now, which is why it's a little hectic. Um, but it makes it more exciting. All right, so here is Hannah. And hey, Tim. Hello. Do you still need to be screen sharing right now, or do you want to have it um, just full screen for the girls? You can have the full screen for the girls. That's fine. Okay, I'll go ahead. <laughs> Hello. Hi, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we basically did. Uh, we uh, decided to roll paper to make it sturdier and then use like painter tape to do connections to kind of help the support. Yes. And we are not done yet, but we will be soon. We have the little arm for the with the know, water bottle cap for the here. penny to slingshot it, but we just need a rubber band to attach and that should be good. Yep. <laughs> This is our beautiful model. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, yeah, basically the start of the process, we just kind of sketched out the general design of what we thought would work. And then we just went to work rolling paper. <laughs> yep, very fun. Very fun. Very fun. Yeah. Go on, then, Alexa, you want to show yours? So go ahead. So this is a sketch of our slingshot that we have made. Yeah, so we decided to start with different paper bases and build up on them with stronger supports that we roll up. 
And then we were actually going to take a rubber band and put it in between so that we could create the slingshot part to throw the penny. To bring this a little closer so I could see the design better. Yeah, so this is um, a more innovative design than most of the other students. A lot of people went with stuff you could find on the internet, but this was sort of an interesting one. So uh, what do you guys have for your build so far? We only have a, like half percent of it. Half okay. Percent. So you guys can continue working. Cool. All right, yeah. So I'm going to share um, uh, a few other elements that we kind of go over. Um, <clears throat> so one of the things we do, like I'm a, a high school art teacher primarily, and I, I do do media as well. Um, but one of the, the benefits of um, approaching it like this is uh, that we have um, uh, design thinking part of the process all the time. Um, and uh, we uh, like to work with other departments a lot. So one of the things that we do uh, when we do interdisciplinary work is that we make sure that we respect all of the different elements. Um, so I think that's really important, uh, especially with a project like this. Um, and we want to always hit the STEAM fundamentals. That's really big. Um, so I'm going to share again and just show you some of the things that we make sure that we hit um, whenever we can. So there you go. I'm screen sharing it now. So uh, when we talk about STEAM fundamentals, um, one of the things that's really important uh, is uh, creative collaboration. So we like to collaborate a lot. We do with different departments. Um, and even just having students work together. So that's one of the nice things about hybrid is that you're still able to work together um, in a limited capacity. Um, and we also try to always focus on authentic learning. So making sure that the projects we do have some function um, and actually get help. So we actually build up. Uh, so we're, you know, in our second month uh, and we uh, redesigned our courtyard recently. So we looked at different examples of how to upcycle and how to redesign it based on the students. Um, so projects like this, when they're doing engineering is really helpful uh, because it gives them a sense of the things they need to consider. Um, and then of course, here's some of the resources. I have uh, a Creative Challenge YouTube playlist, so you could find this there. Um, and this is how I always like to uh, end my course uh, with, uh, be kind, be creative, and change the world. So I'm going to have a couple more students um, share some of their work now. We have about 15 minutes left. Um, and um, again, we'll uh, welcome to see um, people from around the world try this challenge. So there's a lot of different uh, ways you can approach this, um, building out of paper like this. Uh, paper is a really versatile material. It's something that's available everywhere. Um, so it's pretty amazing in that sense. Um, and you could do uh, some amazing engineering projects just with paper. So especially if you reinforce it with tape, there's different kinds of paper. Um, that's really helpful as well. Uh, and uh, the students came up with really creative solutions to the problem. So with a, a challenge like this, like a catapult that has a function, um, a lot of students want to kind of go to the internet first and take a look at examples. Um, so I did share some examples with them that I will share with you now. So this is just up on my class blog, uh, which is Art Room 161. Um, so uh, there are some how-tos that you could shoot to use if you want to get an idea of how to create. So um, particularly uh, something like this, doing it out of origami is interesting. Um, you're able to uh, make a, a functional catapult uh, just with a couple of steps and it's not that complicated so we are able to do it pretty easily uh, in just about 10 steps so i tried this one first just to get an idea of how they function um, and it works pretty well one of the the things that we uh, have learned in the, doing this project is that um, it's not too difficult to make a functional catapult but it is difficult to make a functional catapult that holds up uh, for a couple of throws. So reinforcing some of the uh, folds if you try the origami one is really important. And if you try using just paper, reinforcing it with tape is really important as well. So using things like cardboard um, in certain parts of the design. And we, we, we learned about how triangles uh, work really well. So that when you're building to kind of 
focus on some of the triangles in your design. So this kind of fold is a little bit challenging, um, but I managed like we, we did it along with students really just watching the video and trying along. And this helps kind of like understand the basic functionality. There's some things that a catapult sort of needs. So you need a basket and you need a frame and you need some kind of function that's going to help uh, propel it. So this one works a little bit differently than most of the others. The basket fold here is a little bit smaller. So the penny just fits. but then you're able to sort of pull it and that works pretty well. Okay, so I'm gonna have some more students. Um, uh, no, that's in the other room, I think. Um, so uh, most of the students chose to actually build like this. So they uh, use tubes of paper instead. So the tube method actually holds up a little bit better. The origami catapult uh, falls apart quicker. But um, I did share some of these uh, methods, uh, which is really helpful. So um, I did, uh, we do have a prize for originality because I really want students to make sure that they are uh, working. And I don't mind um, accessing some of the resources to learn how a catapult works, but you really want to make sure that they are um, working on it themselves and coming up with an original idea. Um, all right, so uh, I'm going to have a couple more students show their work and I'll have uh, Alexa come back and share some of what she is doing now. So they're currently working and let's see, I'm gonna try to switch to the other camera as well so I can walk around the second classroom. So if you guys have any questions about the um, project, feel free to reach out. I'm gonna share a bunch of the different um, student examples uh, in a video tomorrow, we have a party where we are going to actually launch them all and see who has the best uh, designs. And uh, one of the things that we like to focus on a little bit is, you know, not just the creative process. So the creative process is helpful, and I find that it actually mimics the scientific process. But we also uh, like to look at uh, design thinking. So design thinking is uh, when you are going to start with um, you know, it, it works better for when you're designing around people, uh, but we actually do use it here too, um, in terms of uh, considering um, what's gonna hold up uh, and be strongest over time. Um, and in terms of the kind of design that you might wanna make uh, in different situations, so that's helpful. Okay, so, um, let me just switch over to my second camera and we'll show some more student work. Um, one of the things with a project like this that's fun is that, you know, like many of the other classrooms, I think it starts looking like anarchy at first. Um, but, uh, you know, that's sometimes what learning looks like, a little bit crazy. Um, so let me just switch this out. All right. So I'm going to have two more students come over and show you really quickly. All right, and Tim is bringing over some students right now. Um, and we have just a lot going on right now. The organizing team is in the background, making sure we have the transition correctly and that we have everything ready to go for you guys today. Um, I know that following this, we have David Lockett joining. Oh, perfect. We have Tim Needles, his students joining in. Perfect. Welcome, ladies. Hi. Hi. So uh, we're just working on reinforcing our base. You guys are just kind we're of- 
So I guess we're just going to continue working in here so you guys can see what we're doing a little bit. Yep. Um, can I take this off just so we can see yeah. what we're doing? All right. Yeah. You can pull this over closer so they can see you. Okay. Yeah, right in this closet right here. Well, that one's second. Well, yeah, also it's going to have. Oh, so I'm going to take it over. Yeah, I did. I'm going to pocket though. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> So what is it that you guys are trying to do right now? We were just make it sturdier because when we initially put that on and then tried with the rubber band, it was kind of yeah. flimsy. We also added a pencil. Just the whole the yeah. cylinder shape. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Do you want to add something? Mm -hmm. to the middle, so yeah. So how about we add like a piece of paper that we put the penny on from the rubber band? You know. Go at it. I want to like this one. Okay, I will. Yeah. Okay, how big? I'm just gonna um, check it out. <laughs> like an inch. Yeah. Okay. Should this far be enough? I think. So wait here. I'll just put it on first, and then we'll. Okay. You have to like. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Where's the thing you had? Like a bar. Great. How do you want me to? Yeah, I'm gonna figure. Okay, I'm gonna look closer. Yeah. With that. So that looks like you guys are big. Seems like a bar. Yeah, okay, we're we can... not. Maybe just. Okay. What's that? Oh, the bar. Yeah. Oh, you put it like that. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like yeah. one. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. The thing next to the table. Okay. Over there. Okay. okay, that kind of stays. Oh, no, not really. Oh, wait, no, we don't want to use okay. a water bottle cap. Take to hold the that one. Maybe we could take one from the back. Okay, put it forward. Okay, that'll make it easier. Do okay. you have a water bottle? Yes, I do. Let me go finish drinking it real quick. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that's. Okay, so not does bad. that launch now or no? Yeah. You can try. How are you guys yeah. so good at this? Ooh. Yeah, I feel like that might like, do it. Just kidding. <laughs> not I don't take the risk, though. Definitely not that. Oh wait, I actually yeah. think I have a penny in my pocket. <laughs> Not a penny, but a dime. A dime Either way. Guys. Okay, do it this way. Oh, All right, so you can <laughs> launch. Now, now you have to just figure out how to launch Farther, further. Maybe, yeah. Uh, tighter over there. Yeah, more tension. You want to like, you want to try three times? You don't want to do three times. Yeah. I'm or actually, stop. if we just. Okay, I got all. I got them. Mm -hmm. All right. If you guys actually take, uh, yeah, there you go. A little guy. It's a little not straight if we twist it. Okay. 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 Now we're gonna draw more tape. Yeah. Don't cut it just yet. That's like even less. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Or maybe not. Maybe, maybe yeah. yeah. Okay. Try cool. there, you know? Yeah. But I mean, at least it's right here. Yeah. Yeah. Well, can you stop screen it? sharing so we can oh. see up close what they're making? Oh, yeah, sure. I'm sorry. I didn't realize you saw it. Mm. You guys are making a big one. So that, yeah. might, <laughs> that might be how it goes farther. 
Should we add I think another should... rubber band? There could yeah, be more try tension. Yeah, try another rubber band. Here, can you hold this while I sweep it? Um, do it like the same way. All right, it looks like we might have uh, Tim's disconnected here um from the event here that's all right hopefully they're able to join back in but we are really close to that time and i know we're going to we need to be transitioning over to david who is set to begin hopefully david you're in the background there it looks like you are and um if it, tim if tim's able to join back in and say hello and goodbye that'd be great otherwise it looks like we're right on time to transition over for david to be able to join us so david um i would love to hear where you're going to be joining in from and sharing a little bit about what is going on in your background there we go we have david joining in how's it going david hey i am well i'm excited to be here at global maker day today perfect show me your shirt what are you wearing We've got a look at that. A new addition to the <laughs> to the several. That, that is so well. Where are you joining in from? I, I'm joining live from Washington, DC today. So uh yeah. interesting. I'm interesting times. Absolutely. So are you ready to take over and run with it? I I am I am more than ready. Let me know. Uh, we can we can begin. Perfect. Go for it, and we'll be in here in the background. Hey, fantastic. Uh Welcome. I'm going to share my screen. So give me just one moment. Hey, welcome to uh, Global Maker Day. My name is David Lockett. Uh, I'm a STEM and computer science teacher. Uh, I've usually joined Global Maker Day in the past uh, in my STEM lab, uh, but I was recently appointed to the Albert Einstein Fellowship. Uh, which allows STEM teachers to uh, join different federal departments, well, in my case, the NASA Office of STEM Engagement, to learn a little bit more about how STEM processes in the, in the federal arena work. Uh, this particular project that we're doing today is called the Universe of Making and Doing. Now, with maker projects, of course, they're, they're hands-on, they're collaborative, kind of piggybacking off the last session, uh, Tim Needle's excellent session, when we work on these different projects, we want students to be collaborative. We want them to create. We want them to try something that they might not normally be able to try. And the activity that we're working on today, a little bit more about me, there's a, a David Lockett, STEM and computer science. The activity that we're going to be working on today is in that upper corner, uh, the exploding star circuits. Uh, just a little bit about me. I am an amateur astronomer. Uh, I love to solve Rubik's Cubes. I often try to uh, outpace my students when I was in the classroom the prior year. Uh, lots of coding, lots of computer science. Uh, this year, I'm excited to learn more about NASA STEM and all that it has to offer. The activity that we're working on today is rather unique. And I know a lot of you've worked on uh, paper circuits before. Uh, with paper circuits, they're very inexpensive for you to work on in your classroom copper tape, uh, coin cell batteries, uh, LED lights. I know in a lot of these different projects, my students have wanted to add in just a little bit more. They've added in light sensors, they've added in motion sensors. So there's lots of extension activities that you can work on in your, in your lab for this particular project. The paper circuits, uh, different templates are provided. They're excellent sources of learning for maker fairs for libraries, classrooms, and other STEAM and STEM-related events. Uh, I like these activities because students can actually take them home uh, and they can add on to them if they'd like. Uh, it's a great way in the younger grades to show them open and closed circuits. With paper circuits and with this particular activity in general, students can learn a little bit more about LEDs. They can learn more about positive and they can learn more about the negative side of an LED. Uh, with this particular activity, I know with the younger grades that I've tried it, there are, you know, it's, it's trial and error. It's a good way for students to get an idea of how they're going to kind of solve a problem if their circuit doesn't work the first time. 
I know it's a good part about this project. Now, why paper circuits and why? They're good for all ages. Uh, it teaches students the basics of electricity. They can learn a little bit more about electrons, protons, uh, conductivity. Uh, with paper circuits, uh, students can make just about anything. And in the case today, we're gonna have a kind of an astronomy and space focus. Uh, again, there's no uh, limit on the types of LEDs that students can use. You know, they can use different colors. They can add in series. Uh, with this particular project, it's a very good idea to uh, have your materials organized in a fashion to where students can come away with a better understanding of why circuits are important. Uh, and we'll talk about the extension activities for this one as well and why light is so important and how students can learn just a little bit more about uh, this particular lesson. I'm gonna stop sharing for just a moment to give you a kind of a background on our particular project. When working with paper circuits, I'm gonna stop my screen for just a moment. This particular activity, students are able to make, they're able to create something new and something different. When they create these, these uh, exploding stars, they are able to uh, you know, expand on their learning. They're able to uh, create at the same time. Now I'm gonna show you a short clip. There is no sound on this. We are gonna walk through the activity as well before we meet the activity. Now, I don't know about you, copper tape, it, it takes me a few times to uh, line my circuit up and make sure my copper tape is along the lines as well. When we work on this particular activity today, it's okay if you tear off a few pieces and uh, you know, we need to uh, you know, fill the gap to say. Now your paper circuit, you've got to make sure that you have your uh, negative and positive leads facing the correct way. You've got to make sure that you have your battery on the positive and negative. And there's uh, a quick demo for you there. Of course, we use binder clips, we use paper clips, we use just quite a variety of materials that are around your maker space. Testing connection is essential. See that green check? So what happens if it doesn't line up? This is a great activity for not only testing your educated guests, testing your hypothesis, but also in a way, uh, troubleshooting uh, open and closed circuits. All right, we're going to transition back. All right, who's ready? I know I am. All right, paper circuits. When we work on these particular projects, uh, safety is key. Now on your paper circuit, and we're gonna transition over here in just a moment and press play so you can see. So what is a paper circuit? Now, as you work on your particular circuit, this is a great way to extend the activity. The light that we can see from our eyes is part of a, a kind of a range of radiation known as the electromagnetic spectrum. These particular pictures here from uh, NASA JPL demonstrate that shorter wavelengths are light, uh, are, they do have higher energy and longer wavelengths of light are lower energy. So with this particular activity, you can extend it across the curriculum. I know you can introduce uh, various ELA and various math activities as well. 
with this particular activity, where these images were taken from the Hubble telescope, uh, the Hubble primarily sees visible light, but kind of located here uh, in these particular images that you see, as well as infrared and ultraviolet ra radiation. Uh, when working on the paper circuits as well, it's always good to say, hey, human eyes are only a small uh, portion of the range, or human eyes can only see a small portion of the range of radiation given off by these objects around us. I know here in astronomy, it's been an exciting uh, past few weeks, especially with the Mars opposition. So it's always a great uh, idea to bring in those current events so students can say, hey, wow, you know, not only are we uh, you know, getting to uh, you know, work on these projects to learn a little bit more about electromagnetic, the uh, electromagnetic spectrum and learn a little bit more about radiation and visible light, but we're able to learn more about the projects around us. Uh, by only seeing these, these visible lights, you know, we miss out on the information, uh, you know, from other types of radiation. Uh, you know, other creatures and other animals on Earth, you know, they can see some of the uh, electromagnetic spectrum that we're blind to. Some of those examples include things like fish, uh, uh, bullfrogs, snakes, things of that nature. And when we think about those, you know, they're, uh, you know, a lot of those times they're in, you know, whether it's, you know, murky water or it's dark, they have to be able to see. And when you think about those, you know, you've got butterflies, you've got some species of birds that can see ultraviolet light, which helps them identify certain markings uh, on other species. When you think about these objects and what comes to these cosmic objects, uh, key information is revealed by different portions of the electromagnetic spectrum. So when we work on these circuits, you know, think about how can I bring in different types of learning? How can I, you know, bring in the uh, collaborative components so students can research so they can learn a little bit more about the galaxy around this? Uh, you know, when we provide this information, you know, humans, you know, of course we can detect these wavelengths on our own, but the Hubble, the Hubble telescope can also detect a portion of these infrared and ultraviolet wavelengths as well as visible light. So if you look, take a look here, you have the, uh, you've got the ultraviolet light, you've got infrared, you've got the entire wavelength and the spectrum. When you think about this light and you, you think about what's visible to humans, uh, you've got shorter wavelengths and you've got on the spectrum and you have wavelengths that are primarily visible, uh, kind of look at that rainbow that's, that's there in the middle, infrared and ultraviolet light. Uh, so when working on the you know, paper circuits, you know, you, you think about how can we integrate all of these, you know, different components of learning? How can we integrate new ways to bring in the spectrum for students to have a better idea and a better understanding of the circuits around us? Uh, when we think about the electromagnetic spectrum, we don't want to miss out on any of this information. So, you know, I know a lot of you might have used prisms uh, in your lab before, but it's definitely a great way to identify uh, different objects and think about cosmic markers. I'm going to stop sharing just for a moment. All right. So, paper circuits. I'm going to the camera here for you. So, when we look at our paper circuit, we have a template and we look at that particular template. I'm gonna switch here for you. Uh, we've got our circuit here. Uh, we wanna make our circuit in a way to make a connection. Uh, in this case, for the activity here. And uh, this is a supernova remnant that I made earlier. And one way to integrate that is how can you bring in the uh, learning about you know, supernovas? How can you learn a little bit more uh, about nebulas? It's a great way to introduce activities for students that are just learning about energy and how they want to get a better understanding of that. So today with this particular activity, we've got light up exploded stars. When we make this particular activity, uh, this is the template. And when students make this, I'm gonna switch here. They are free to use just any template on the Chandra NASA site that they like. So when we make this particular template, uh, students can kind of use pen or pencil and draw in their circuit. 
And when they do that, they want to make sure that they can follow a path for their copper tape. You know, similar to what you have here. They're going to have their power source. And a lot of times when I'm working on this particular project, I like to bring in, you know, just different artifacts so students can say, hey, you know, wow, how do these circuits work? Uh, when we're soldering in the lab too, they're able to get a good idea of open and closed circuits. So that's kind of an example that we worked on previously with our students. So if you take a look, uh, students were able to look at their coin cell battery and they're able to determine, you know, positive and negative charges. When they look at their LEDs, sorry, I've got a lot of a tray of LEDs here. It's always good for students to have a good idea of their leads. So you want them to be able to understand the leads and why the leads are so important. So when they're looking at their leads, a lot of times they're gonna say, you know, I don't really see a difference. And I say, well, look a little bit closer. A little bit closer. Do you see a lead that might be shorter? Do you see a lead that might be longer? And then from there, they can get a better understanding of why the leads itself are so important. So you've got a positive and you've got an, a negative LED lead. And they're, they're just amazed the very first time that they see that LED light. They're, they're just truly amazed. So they sometimes they'll, they'll say, well, what happens if, you know, if we're, if we're using our circuit and it doesn't always light up the first time? And it's going to happen. You want them to troubleshoot. What's going on? And that's a good first step for them to understand, hey, you've got to connect leads in your circuit in order to make your, um, to make your paper circuit in a way that will produce light. So how do we get there? We draw our template first. You want to make sure that when you're laying your copper tape that you lay it accordingly. I'm going to lay a piece here for you. So when we're working on this particular one, I, students always ask, what happens if, if, it's, if it doesn't light up, what's happening? Why not? So it's a good way for them to troubleshoot. It's a good way for them to understand that, hey, you've got to make your, your circuit in a way that's going to close your circuit. So again, taking a look here at my template, we are going to go through each and every step. When we go through those particular steps, I'm gonna share my screen one more time. This particular activity can be found on the Chandra making site. I'm gonna go right back so we can take a look. So when we think about a universe of making, we want them to make sure they're going through each step accordingly. And when they look at these particular steps, they can kind of cut out their circuit in a way or in a fashion so they can troubleshoot. When I showed you before on that diagram, when they're troubleshooting, uh, we have a lot of times it might not work the very first time. How can I work through each and every step in order for my circuit to light up? And this is where I might purposely add in a, a step of the project where the copper tape might not be touching the battery. Uh, the copper tape might not be touching the LED. Uh, you know, I ask them, hey, flip the battery over. Will it work backwards? Uh, uh, you know, look at your positive and neg negative parts of your circuit. Check your connection. This is where the collaborative component comes in. When students are able to work on this particular project, they can collaborate and come to a better understanding of why that circuit isn't working. Is the tape connected? Is the power source connected as well? Can we connect the leads to the circuit using more copper tape? I, I can't tell you how much copper tape I've actually used on these particular activities. And at the same time, 
do you have a connection for your LED? Now, when you're working on this particular project, don't limit your students. Have them be as creative as they can. I know with this particular one, we've added a series uh, LEDs in. We've added series circuits. Uh, because again, that end goal is how can we connect the circuits in a way that's going to produce current? How can we do that in a way that's going to, you know, elicit that learning that's going to say, hey, my circuit's working. So I'm actually making the circuit now. So as we make that particular circuit, think about how your copper tape how can you bend it? How can you place the LED in order to uh, line up with your positive and neg negative ends of your LED? What happens if it doesn't work the first time? How can we troubleshoot? Troubleshooting is always a plus. So again, we're troubleshooting. How can I work through this particular one? I don't have a connection. Can I make it? So again, the template is a great way for students to have a better understanding. So the very first time that they're working on this, I always give them the template. And then from there, uh, we can kind of identify and troubleshoot how we're working on it step by step. I'm working on it as well. With the particular template that we're working on today, there are a variety of galaxies that students can choose from. They can choose from Blue Giants. Uh, they can choose from uh, Cat's Eye White Dwarf. And with each circuit that they're making, they're getting to know a little bit more about the galaxy around them. Uh, with these particular circuit templates, students can come to better understand uh, when uh, sunlight stars die. They can come to understand a little bit more about planetary nebulas. Uh, there's a pulsar as well. I know pulsars are very popular in physics and some of our high school students. And when they're placing these for their circuits and they make their template, how can these, how would their template, so again, their template is they're free to be as creative as they can on their template. We want them to be creative. But at the same time, they're getting a better understanding of why the circuit is important, why the particular activity they're working on. Uh, this particular nebula, the crab nebula, is kind of like a, a rotating lighthouse. Uh, this one gives off a lot of radiation because it's, it's got a pulsing source of radiation. Uh, kind of the jets and the rings in here are caused by high energy particles flowing away from the nebula. So this, with this particular activity, there's a variety of uh, cross-curriculum activities that students can learn as well. So there's a, there's a blue giant, hopefully you can make that out there. And with this blue giant, it's, uh, uh, it's kind of got a blue variable light on it. And these are formed from, uh, you know, unstable and uh, explosive nebulas in our galaxy. I'm going to connect our circuit. Let's see. Let's see if we've got a working circuit. Got our LEDs. And I don't know about you, but I, I went through uh, lots of LEDs for my students to work on. Keep watching. Oh no, we've got an LED that's not properly coming on. So again, how can we troubleshoot that for students? So take a look, Dean. When we troubleshoot, how can we come to better understand open and closed circuits.
And again, the, the troubleshooting aspect of this project is, is immense for students because they can get a better understanding of how they can connect, how they can understand the positive and negative aspect of this particular project. And I'm gonna show you the template. Make sure you have a good idea of what our students are making. And hopefully we'll have, all right, let's see what we've got. So what happens if it doesn't work the first time? Again, you use trial and error and continue to show them and troubleshoot each step as you go through. So again, I'm gonna show you the wavelength one more time. And we'll break down this particular project. How could these, why are these wavelengths important? Uh, you know, you want students to be able to understand infrared and ultraviolet light and ultraviolet radiation. Uh, when you think about these wavelengths, they are uh, on the visible light spectrum. You know, when you're extending this activity, how can telescopes provide more information? How can they detect these lights on their own? Uh, when you think about these, these activities in paper circuits, think about how you can extend the activity. Uh, they're, they're launching the James Webb telescope. That's another telescope that will be using wavelengths and lights for student understanding and research. So again, this is another way, this is an excellent way for students to uh, understand wavelengths. It's an excellent activity, not only for circuits itself, but it's a great for the way for them to understand paper circuits and why they're important. Uh, you've got, again, a low, vol low voltage coin cell battery. Uh, you're using copper materials, very inexpensive materials for you to obtain for your students. Uh, excellent source of experiential learning, experiential, uh, excellent source of collaboration for students. Uh, when you think about this, how can you uh, build upon it and go to the next lesson? Uh, you've got uh, ELA, you've got science, you've got physics, you've got so many different avenues that students can work on in this particular project. So again, with paper circuits, think about that. How can you expand that learning? How can you get your circuit in a way that students can better understand that and they can come away with something new and something different? I will be posting various paper circuit projects that we work on throughout Global Maker Day today. There's so many different ones that we can work on. I do thank you for joining in today. I'm gonna to switch my screen one more time. So again, this is a universe of making. I have switched my screen back, so hopefully uh, we're back there. So hopefully your, your particular circuit is working. Please make sure that you are following each and every step because we want your circuit to be interesting. Uh, we want it to be different. We want yours to uh, be as hands-on as it can. So again, this is Light Up Exploded Stars, A World of Making. Thank you. Thanks, David. Um, Jamie is working on getting back in right now. Okay. Um, so give us just a minute. I'm very excited to watch this because um, 
I'm Nancy Pinchev, by the way, guys. Um, I have a lesson coming up in fourth grade about energy and we're making paper circuits and I had no idea what I was doing. So I'm very excited to watch you do it. So now I know a little bit more um, about how to do it. So I'm very excited about that. Yes, thank you. Uh, it's always a fun process going through each and every step. Troubleshooting, you got to take your time. If not, you know, you always want to have that, that closed circuit. Yeah, and and my classroom is all about making mistakes and learning from them. So I'm hoping that my kids will take that on because I know that they will make mistakes and I, and I will be making mistakes right beside them as I'm trying to do it too. So thank you so much. Definitely. All right. Jamie's still trying to get back on here. Let's see, is our next, let me try to find Yes, I, I did forget to add one point as well. These projects are available on the NASA STEM at Home site as well. Uh, not only do they have uh, <laughs> makerspace and STEM projects at home, but they're podcast. There's a virtual reality, there's coding. There's a variety of lessons and activities that students can work on uh, in order to uh, you know, build on that virtual learning at home and make at home as well. There's a lot of different uh, ways that they can make and a lot of ways that they can bring in these activities so they are making at home. Again, inexpensive materials and a lot of recyclable and reusable materials that can be made at home. I think that's very important that we have things because my school's going, we start back our first grade and below started back Monday and next week our middle our elementary school starts back so I know having and we're we're on the cusp of where we'll be there all the time will we not be there so I know having those materials from home is really helpful um things that you can just grab up and make is is super important I see Jamie's here now I am and I'm actually joining in from a classroom which makes the global maker day that much better let me tell you can you guys hear me okay Perfect. All right. I'm joining in with Miss Brantley's classroom and here she is. She is part of Global Maker Day this year is so perfect because us not being able to be in the classroom um, and hosting this together as an organizing team. Um, we were really bummed, but um, the local school district where my daughter attends um, was able to join in and they said, hey, we want to be part of Global Maker Day and you can come to our campus. So we said, yay. So here we are with Miss Brantley's classroom. You can see All right, there you go. You guys want to say hi? Hi. All right. And they are making galore right now. We are um, here in, let's see if I, there we go. We're here in White Oak, Texas, and the kids have been doing a lot of different creation activities. And what I'm going to be showing them is um, something fairly new called Hubs, Mozilla Hubs. So we're going to be creating a virtual reality space. Um, they're actually able to see themselves right now up on the screen. It's a little bit delayed. Um, they're streaming live what we're doing here right now. And as we go through, um, we're going to be essentially first joining a space. I have a special space available for everybody. I think you guys will like this. And then um, after you join, I'm going to talk you through a little bit on how to create using Spoke. Um, so first things first, what you need to do is go to the browser. So if you're on a Chromebook, if you're on a computer, if you're on a, a cell phone, if you're on a tablet, any of those, as long as you can connect to the internet, you're gonna go to this link, hub.link. And I'm gonna go ahead and screen share and show you what that looks like. And right. All right, and on here where you're gonna go is hub.link. And when you get there, when you arrive, you're going to see some buttons that you're gonna to have to put in for a code. And what that means is you're gonna be joining my virtual reality meeting space here. So all the students in here. Now here's the deal. It gets a little funny if more than 50 people join in. So they limit it to 50. But the ideal is anywhere between you know, zero to 25. That's gonna be your best performance, which is perfect for a classroom. So perfect for that class to join in. I know it being Global Maker Day, we're gonna have a lot of great kids joining in and folks joining in. 
And you know what else it joins in on? Not just your computer, not just your tablet, not just your cell phone, not just your Chromebook, but you can also join in using virtual reality. This is actually the new Pico. Um, and the new Pico actually has um, eye tracking. It tracks your eyes to use as your um, remote, uh, your mouse, your, your uh, access, your controls. Um, it also has two remotes and it has the front facing cameras so that it tracks your walking and moving around. It does some cool stuff. But we also have around the room and I'll show you here in a minute that we have um, two different other virtual reality headsets called the Oculus Quest One. And then the one that just came out that the organizing team has access to right now as well. They're all sitting at their places right now and they have their headsets, I know it. They have their headsets ready to go and they've went into their browser and in their browser, they're gonna go to hub.link and inside the browser, they're gonna join us in virtual reality in the same space you guys are in inside of your computers or cell phones or tablets, which is really cool, but we have two virtual reality devices as well. We have the Oculus Quest 1 and Oculus Quest 2 that we have set up ready to go. And they're gonna need to put in this code as well. So I set up a really hard, special place for all of you. And this space that I set up is our very own Global Maker Day 2020 VR maze. You guys are going to have to try to make it from the front of the maze all the way to the end. And at the end, we're going to celebrate and see if anybody makes it there. It's really hard. I've tried it. It's hard. You get confused at which way did I go? Just like a normal maze. It's really cool. So as you guys are going through, um, I'm going to talk you through how to do that. But the first thing I need to do is get this um, space started. <laughs> and give you that code because that code is very important. Now there is other ways to share it because the code changes, I believe every 72 hours. So it's best to share it in a classroom using hubs by a link. And you can see up here, I have that share and it's best to share that link right there. But because we're at Global Maker Day and I want you to experience it as simple as possible, we're going to hub.link and we're using that code right there. Again, that is something that shareable makes it easy. But what I could have done, which would have been really cool, but I didn't want to give you guys, tip you guys off that I already had made this for you. I could have grabbed that embed code and the embed code could have went on Global Maker Day's website at globalmakerday.com. And then you would have been able to just go to the website and immediately go into this virtual reality experience. So. I can see people joining in the lobby right now. Check it out. You guys see people joining in? All right. Several of you are joining in. Now here's the key. When you join in, you do not want to have your microphone on. And the reason being is because it's very tricky in these new VR meeting spaces because in the VR meeting spaces, you're using the browser and the capabilities in a browser makes it very difficult to not have an echo. And the only way you can do that is if everybody in the group is wearing um, wearing some sort of microphone and um, they, they are able to speak and hear clearly. Otherwise you hear the echo very easily from the device you're on. So it creates an echo inside the room. So everybody joining in, make sure that you have your microphone muted. Now I set it up as your default that you're gonna be muted. Look at, look at this. You guys wanna see these kids right now, look. You can see the kids joining in. I see you guys already starting in the maze. Maybe we can learn from some of those kids, the ones going in the right or the wrong direction, right? And it, they don't have the top view like I do right now. This is called the lobby. So I'm actually not in the space yet. And the way that I get in the space is by entering the room. Now, if I'm in a virtual reality headset, I'm not gonna choose to just enter the room. I'm gonna choose to enter in the VR headset because it gives me more options to be able to control and move around. Now they're gonna to have to figure that out. That's gonna be something brand new to them. Um, funny enough, I have the room set at 50 people, but right now we have 107. So this is gonna be really cool. Um, and I wanna make sure my microphone is muted. That's really, really, really important. And I'm curious if any of our organizing team and their VR headsets are actually in here already. But here I am, I've joined in. As you can see, I'm gonna use, I'm gonna be able to walk around. Look at all these kids, this is great. 
Um, oh, somebody has a duck on their back. That's awesome. Okay, so as you can see, I'm Santa Claus. That's because it's so easy to find Santa, right? And I'll, every time I join in here, they can always find me because I'm, I'm Santa. Um, but as I join in and move around, I can use my arrows on my computer or on my phone, I can move around by tapping and adjusting in my movement there, or same as my tablet. On the virtual reality, you have to oh, point to it Santa, and right? move. And I'll, every time I oh, see how people, somebody joined in and they're I'm, not I'm muted. Um, I'm able to see that. I join in and move around. And I'm going to make sure that everybody gets on muted in there. Or on my phone, I can. There we go. So that way I don't run into anybody accidentally coming in and, and not muting there. So on my computer, I can use my arrows to be able to um, move around. Now, when I wanna rotate on my computer, I have two different options. Either I can select somewhere on the ground and click on it and then swipe left to right, holding down my click, right? So I'm swiping around left to right as I look around. Or I can choose Q which will let me go left or E, which will let me go right. Those of you that are gamers out there, you guys already have this down. You're already inside the maze. You may have already finished the maze. Um, and you also have the option to be able to move forward or backwards if you don't wanna use your arrows, then you can use your keys for W to go forward. S moves you back, A move, moves you to the left and D moves you to the right. So you kind of have a group of um, letters on your keyboard that are like your controller to be able to move around in the space. I like to use my arrows, but it is a little bit challenging to rotate around. So it is nice to have the chance to rotate with Q and E. So you can also chat in here. This is really cool. I can say hello to everyone. Even though I didn't capitalize, let's change that. That would be embarrassing. All right, I'm going to push enter. And that goes out to everybody, all 87 people in here right now. And they're able then to see that chat and then they can chat back appropriately. Okay, so um, they can come in here. Also, there is a plus button here that I can add in different 3D objects if I want to. I can pull in files and images and, and things of that sort. And then there's a creation tool, which is the best, but this really bogs down your bandwidth. So you gotta be extra careful with that. So when you choose the create, it will bring you out to um, a place within Google Poly to pull 3D objects into your virtual reality scene. So since I'm Santa, I gotta bring some presents, right? So let's see what I can bring in here. Oh, Christmas presents, that sounds perfect. And there it goes, I'm able to bring in these objects into my scene and then I can move them around. If I choose my space bar, you guys have a chance to use your emojis. So if you, I already saw a couple emojis out there. If you choose your space bar, you can have, I could say this is so fun. And I tap that and I can bring in that emoji. <clears throat> And there's that emoji. I can bring it around and we can laugh about it. And it's fun. Oh, look at that candy corn. And then I can choose um, my space bar. And I can actually make my presence much, much, much larger. So I can make them small. I can make them large. Now, right now, we're just, we're editing. We're just seeing what's out there. But if I wanted those presents to stay here forever, then I would choose my space bar and I would pin it. And that means that's something that will stay inside my space forever until I say you've got to delete that. So it's really nice because having it pinned in that space gives you a chance to um, essentially redesign the, the virtual reality meeting space. So if you and your students are working on a project right now, then they'd be able to join in and they would be able to create and uh, work on that project. And when they came back, it was gonna be exactly where it was left off. Okay, so you can design inside of the virtual reality. Look at that, somebody brought me some food. Thank you, Sushi. Thank you. I appreciate that. That's lovely. Um, so thank you for that Sushi, I really appreciate it. All right, so what we're gonna be doing here in this class, are you guys, any of you able to join yet? 
Okay. Yeah. Um, I don't know if we can create another separate room for. Yeah. Absolutely. So I can get another room going right now. Since I'm screen sharing, I'll show you what that looks like. I would just come over to my um, hubs mozilla.com is where you create the spaces and i'm going to create um i'm going to create another room and since you probably want to do the maze do you guys want to do yeah. the maze yeah. well let's do the maze so i'm going to go back in here to create a space and mozilla has already created some templates of spaces that you can use and I'm gonna choose that scene that I want. Now there's haunted houses, but I'm not gonna go there. Uh, this is sixth grade and you know, no nightmares. Um, but there is a maze challenge, so I'm gonna do that. Now right now it, it gives me a defaulted name and then I can also share out, again, the same concept here, Let's see. I can share out that link with my students, maybe in Google Classroom. Um, or any LMS that you're using. And so you're sending that out, or you can use this code to be able to join in in another space. So this will give people a chance to come in if they couldn't get into the original one, you'll see it here soon. Um, the code is 415967, 415967. So people can join into that space if they couldn't get into the first. So. We'll see. Now I'm not going to enter into that room because it takes me out of the other and shuts that one down. So I'm just going to leave that one open right now for everybody to join in and walk around. Now, if it's running slow, guess what? You're in virtual reality. That's why um, it's doing some really, really, really cool technology. Um, so hopefully, oh, mm. I think that one started me a new room. That's okay, we can join in this one. All right, so inside of here though, I'm gonna be showing you in a second how to take this concept and beyond just the templates, actually designing and building your virtual reality spaces on your own. So inside of those headsets, if we're able to join um, in the browser, Eliana, in the browser, do you see the browser when you get in? This one doesn't even have to do yeah, it's on the right hand side. Uh, the browser's in there. So go ahead and bring it over to me and I'll get you set up. So hopefully you guys are in there playing and learning and. There we go. All right, this is a challenge because I can't see. Put the shield. Let me see if that shows it enough. Yeah, I'm going to have to look this up. All right. Now, if you don't want to go all the way inside the space, you can go in to just the lobby and see what's going on. That means you're not taking up any room in there, but you are able to still join in. Um, inside let's see browser and the code is 415-967 we'll see if it will let us in in this one Hey, once again, if you're logged off on the hub, Ellie, you go ahead and hop on without your glasses on. Welcome to go back to yeah. Coast And there we go. Are you up to going? Do you see it on the right side? What do you see in there? It says never miss an update. And then okay, I'll look on the left side. Okay, then it's just loading. Okay, so right now her room is loading if it lets her in again. I think we're just far exceeding with the quantity of people, which is great. That's a good problem to have. Right now we have about 40 people in there, so let it load. Just stay inside and hopefully we'll let her load here. Again, it also is contingent on your internet, right? So if um, you have quite a bit going on in here and you have, you know, we're live streaming in here. We have um, all these classroom computers probably on one access point. 
You guys got in? All right, and I'm gonna mute all. Bert, you're in? Yep. I'm okay, in. Ellie, you're gonna go walk over to that space and then you're gonna hold down the Oculus button for five seconds when you get there so it realigns where you're at. You're gonna pray up to set up your stationary boundary. All right, so we'll get that set up and no one will wear a shield. So one of the things that we're doing here because of these COVID times and it's not a bad idea, this is stuff I had bought actually before COVID. So this is really important because I'm, I'm very big on making sure when we are passing things around that are going around somebody's mouth and eyes and nose that they have that shield there. So every student is able to put on that shield before they hop in and have one of their own. Um, in addition, we sanitize the outside and we also sanitize the lens, but the lens cannot be used. You can't wipe down the lens with the typical Clorox wipe. So what we use is our lens wipes um, for glasses. So that will be something. Yes, and we did the hands. Perfect, and all of their hands. Awesome. So, um, hey, I see people joining in and sharing. Perfect. So I'm gonna go and share that code again. So if you're joining in, this is something that you're gonna to wanna to know and be aware of so that you're able to join in easily. Perfect. Okay. So you're gonna walk. Why don't you um, Why don't you talk to the group and tell them what you're working on, and I'll set it up. Okay. Go ahead. What? Global Maker Day. Tell them what you're working on your project today. So what have you been doing today, Ellie? Um, I've been working on my sign book. Your sign book? So what have you done? Okay, so what have you done there with that? Um, I'm doing an ABC book on each and every sign. <laughs> so, and earlier, you know, uh, that slime, you were eating it, which made it look like you were chewing gum, but it was really the slime. So were you scared to eat it that first time? No, it's just starburst and powdered sugar. So you knew what the ingredients were, so you were okay with eating it? Mm -hmm. That that was pretty, like, cool to find out that you had made that. And so... Give me a couple of ideas with your letters, what you're going to be using. Um, so, do you want to just say a letter or not? Yeah. Okay, or I'll say C. Crunchy slime. Crunchy slime. Um, H. Uh, oh, um, I forgot the name. Is it hairball slime? <laughs> no, no hairballs in um, your slime? Okay. okay. Um, holographic slime. Holographic slime. Okay. Um, e. I have a paper, but I don't have it with me. You don't have it with you? Yeah. Probably like Ellie's famous line. <laughs> the secret ingredient. Is that the one? Or is S going to have the secret ingredient? Um, we've honestly just got to. We've eaten. Wait. Let's just say eat. I'm so Yes, I know. And um, hey, guys. So just to let you know, we have been in school for 11 weeks. And we have really been able to jump on and learn some new ways because like, you know, we normally manipulatives are a hands on activity. We've learned how to do virtual manipulatives this year. And the chat room is going to be a great way that my class is going to be using in the future as a way to kind of even help each other out. Absolutely. So, so gonna, yeah, okay. and this is a great way to really connect with your students in a different way beyond the, the typical zoom meeting right. All right, Ellie, I just restarted it, so you can go ahead and get it set up, and I'll tell you the code when you do. All right, so as we're doing this, I want to show you one thing inside of Mozilla Hubs that I think is really important and critical for you to put this into practice. So I'm going to go into um, hubs.mozilla.com. And I'm going to go in and go up to spoke. So instead of going in through hubs, we're going to go in through spoke. And there again are a lot of different templates to work with. I, I can go in when I get started. I can go in and take one of their templates. Um, I'm actually working on a space right now for authors for a conference coming up here at, at for ISTE. Um, and there's a lot of different other meetup spaces. Mary Alice, one of our organizers, we came in and we created a space together. And so I'm going to go ahead and choose new project or a new project right here. 
appreciate that chance to be out here. All right. And so um, I can, again, choose one of their templates that they already have pre-built for me, which, you know, is great. And they're amazing. The, the maze is amazing that they brought to us. So I really like the templates. You have to keep it over there to keep it from being sick. Okay. Okay. Then let somebody join there. Um, so we're going to go ahead and say um, a new empty project. And I'm going to show you kind of how to build this from scratch the last few minutes that we have. And this is actually going to load and pull from a lot of different 3D libraries. So we have, I know Sketchfab's in here. I know Polly's in here, Google Polly. Um, you can see I'm going to make this smaller so that I can get a better picture for you. But essentially, I can add in different items, anything that I can load myself. If I have my own 3D models that I've created, maybe in Tinkercad, I can load them into this virtual reality meeting space, which is pretty cool. I can also load different images and videos to pull from. So if I have my video maybe up on a screen playing as my television in my space, I can do that. Um, and then you also have your um, items in here to be able to select. It kind of just categorizes that for you. But it's really nice if you come in to, for instance, um, let's say Google Poly. And I were to type up something that would give me a great scene, or I can come down here to scenes in their category. I could type up uh, the beach, or I can type in a boat, or I can type in classroom, um, anything that I want to see. And so I'm going to bring in this lighthouse, which is really cool in the middle of nowhere. So I tap it and select it. And then it asks me where I want to place it. And so I'm going to place it right here because if you look closely, This is called the spawn point. This is where the person is going to arrive when they get there. And so I'm going to go back over here to that lighthouse. And I am going to make it larger because right now it's teeny tiny. So up at the top, these are my three main areas that I'm going to use. This is going to be a movement. I'm going to be shifting it from up, down, left, right. This is going to be a rotation of how I'm going to tweak it to make sure it's, it's sitting there correctly. And then my scale is going to give me a chance to resize this. So I'm going to grab it from the middle and I'm going to lift up. Whoa, ho, ho, that's a big lighthouse. All right, I'm going to give the lighthouse right about there. How about that? That looks pretty good. So I like that lighthouse. I want to bring my students to that lighthouse, but I can bring in many different objects as I want to to redesign this space. And inside that maze, what was done is many different brick walls, 3D objects of the brick walls, were brought in to create a maze. And so that's something that you can build yourself as well and upload it in here, or you can go and look up brick wall and layer it inside of this space to eventually make your maze. Now, when I'm done, I'm gonna choose publish to hubs. And when I publish it to hubs, I can call it something like lighthouse, save my project, and then I'm gonna save and publish. Now, typically when you're doing this with your students, you're not working in a global event, right? With a lot of kids joining in, watching at the same time. This is typically done in your classroom, sent out to just your students. So guess what? If your teacher sent this out and she made this in hubs right now, she would be able to send it out to you and you all would be joining in, right? And so, that would be the preference is having your group joining in and Mozilla Hubs has also created Mozilla Hubs cloud and that cloud feature is really for the uh, organization joining in so that could be for a larger group. Um, and a larger setting to be able to invite maybe a conference situation where you're inviting many people in to join at one time it's obviously giving you a lot more storage to work with as well so i'm going to go into view my scene. It might kick you guys out, so hopefully um, you've created, um, you've already made it through the maze, if anybody is inside. If you're not, that's all right, because I'm going to move to the next one just to show you what this looks like. And I'm going to create a room with the scene. And it will open up inside of Hubs. 
same way. And then I'm going to um, share this out with you. You guys ready for the code 402? If anybody wants to join? <clears throat> 374, 402-374. You guys have a heads up because they're a little bit delayed. 402-374. Now I just brought you in to a basic space with the lighthouse that I brought in from Google Poly. All I did was look it up and I could see people joining in right now, perfect. And as you're joining in, you can go around and explore. Again, making sure you're muted. Well, probably mute all right off the bat, just to make sure. And as they're joining in, they're able then to move around. They're able to move around and um, essentially they can bring in different items as well. If they want to bring in through um, sharing, Let's see, they are able to go up to the top and choose create, where it looks like a magic wand. They can draw if they want to leave some drawings in the space. They can draw. They can also um, join in and uh, bring in slides for teachers if they want to present their slides. They can also present their screen and join in in video. Um, so all those things are available for our students to be able to still connect in this space without being connected to Zoom. Now, my preference in using this is first connecting in Zoom, getting people there, asking everybody to stay muted. And that way, as we want to talk on Zoom, we can inside the class. I see people uh, moving around in the space, lots of people joining in. That's perfect. And even four items that have been loaded in the space. So pulled from Google Poly, we have a car and different items there. So that's perfect. So as they're going through, I can also bring them into a different scene. But the, again, that would start that new code if I wanted to do that. And there we go. So that's how Mozilla Hubs works in creating these, these virtual reality spaces. Now we only have, I know we're getting close to our next transition, which is gonna be Stanley Black and Decker. Um, but with Hi. that, I wanna make sure. With that, I wanna make sure. Mute all. Mute all. Mute all. Perfect. Okay. So as we're going through, um, I just think people are joining in and not getting hold on real quick. There we go. I'll leave it at that. Okay. So as we're coming through, um, we have two people joining in from um, Stanley Black and Decker, as well as um, one person joining in from Discovery Education, who is going to be sharing with us on the topic of creating a, um, a maker moments with protective designs. So that's going to be great. And I can already see Sky Van, Sky Van uh, Eider's sign. Did I say that right? All right. I yeah, that's right. Appreciate okay. it. Yeah. And we also have um, now, I believe we have R. Corbin. So is it Robert? Yes, that is correct. Perfect. Um, and I know it has um, you joining in with a specific link, so I'll change the name for you, um, or if one of the organizers can change the name for them there. And as we're going through, I'm going to be in the background. The kids are going to be making, and when we come back, we'll probably have some questions for you, and then we'll also showcase what the kids are making in this space as well. Um, so I'll be in the background. Take it away, guys. Thank All right. You. Sounds good. Uh, I'll just start sharing my screen here and uh, bring up the uh, presentation. Okay. We're kicking off our Maker Moment live demonstrations to celebrate Maker Month. If you want to follow along with us, just click the link in our post to access today's activity. You can join us all month long in celebrating the Maker spirit with additional live demonstrations. The next one is on October 29th. Hello and welcome to this edition of Stanley Black & Decker Innovation Generation Maker Moments. My name is Sky Van Eiderstein, and I'd like to spend a few minutes telling you about my journey as a maker and about Stanley Black & Decker's commitment to empowering makers like us. 
I'm currently a product development engineer at Stanley X, where I help to chart the course for Stanley Black & Decker's future. I joined Stanley Black & Decker about three years ago as a 3D printing engineer, but my, maker, uh, my status as a maker began much earlier. Like many of you, I've always had a desire to make the world a better place. As a child, I did this for making things like myself, like paper airplanes, uh, pinewood derby cars, and uh, slingshots. As I got a bit older, around high school age, my horizons expanded and I started to realize that making the world a better place would require me to start making things for others. So I started to use my abilities as a maker to solve the problems of those around me. And when I started to pay attention, I realized there were opportunities everywhere. When it was finally time to go to college and select a course of study, I looked everywhere for a degree in making things and I couldn't find it. So I settled on the next closest thing, which was mechanical engineering. This took making to the next level for me. In my sophomore year of college, I started an online leatherworking business to serve, uh, which served customers all over the world using just my laptop and an internet connection. My customers loved the products I made so much that I would regularly get emails from them about how pleased they are. From then on, I was hooked. I realized that by leveraging technology, the ideas in my head have the power to create joy across the globe. Of course, these were just watch traps and I only sold about seven of them each week, but it helped me to imagine the potential of more powerful ideas supported by even more powerful technologies. In my sophomore year of college, uh, I, uh, let's see, I'm oh, sorry, in my senior year of college, I invented a device that was capable of 3D scanning hand impressions, which I used to custom fit, uh, to develop custom fit 3D printed bike grips. By using an automated means of production, this idea had far more potential to scale my efforts than my leatherworking idea in which each product was made by hand. I learned that by leveraging digital manufacturing with the same effort, I could either hand make a single product or design it in computer-aided design software and have it made over and over again. After seeing what I had done, I was hired by Stanley Black & Decker, the largest tool company in the world, to explore opportunities for improving the lives of makers all around the world. For the past six months, that's meant that I've been working on improving personal protection equipment, also known as PPE. My latest work was to improve the design of face mask frames. This product can convert any cloth into a face mask and it can improve the protection offered by surgical masks by creating a seal around the edges. It was invented by a maker earlier this year in response to the COVID pandemic and published online as an open source design so that anyone can download it for free. However, there were a few problems with the design. First, it didn't properly fit smaller face sizes, so it didn't fit most people, including women and children. Second, it didn't conform well to every face shape. Uh, it left uh, gaps for air to enter for many users. Um, so whenever solving a problem, it's critically important to consider those who will use your solution so that you can tailor it for them. Uh, since everybody needs protection from COVID, um, this is a pretty tall order. Uh, so I decided to redesign the face mask frame so that it fit everyone better. Over the past few months, my team and I have done just that. And this month we're releasing the design online for free so that anyone with a 3D printer can use it to help protect themselves and others from COVID-19. My purpose in sharing my journey with you is to show you the power of being a maker. I used to make paper airplanes and Pinewood Derby cars, but thanks to my STEM education and organizations like Stanley Black & Decker, that empowers makers, I now make products that help to protect people all over the world from airborne disease. So now is the time for you to start thinking about how you want to change the world, because that's what it means to be a maker. Stanley Black & Decker is committed to supporting makers like us in many ways. I highly recommend checking out our no-cost classroom and family activities available through the Innovation Generation Program at innovation-gen.com. Now I'd like to introduce Dr. Robert Corbin from Discovery Education, who will be demonstrating one of our newest activities, protective design. Thank you so much, Sky. What a privilege to be here with you today. And I love the journey as it was shared because what Sky just demonstrated is anybody can be a maker, anybody. So we're gonna go through and I'm gonna show you my thinking on what it is that I did for this protective design activity. Remember again, this can be found at the Innovation Generation uh, website. 
Don't hesitate to reach out to me, by the way, if, if you should have questions or concerns. Those that tweet, my handle is at Stemancipate. You can also contact me through email at rcorbin at discoveryed.com. So thank you so much, Sky. As I said, what I love about that narrative, about that story that Sky just shared is what I call the democratization of making. The idea that making is in all of us. Who can be creative? Everybody, you and I. It's not just for artists, musicians, writers, or designers. What matters is trying and failing and working at it and then trying it again. So truly making is for everyone. So here is the challenge itself. Here are the particular criterion that we are challenged to meet. Uh, and by the way, when we meet criterion, we're always sort of forced to be innovative, to think creatively about the material that we have at hand and the resources that we have available to us. So the challenge is how do you create a protective device that will prevent the spread of harmful viruses in the workplace it must also provide protection from harmful chemical agents by preventing inhalation or eye exposure. So how do we protect our eyes, nose, and mouth from breathing in things that could be harmful? A very timely challenge. So it must fit tightly around the nose and mouth. It must be adjustable to ensure proper fit. It must protect us from inhaling. It protects our eyes from chemicals. You must be able to see, of course, and then it must be comfortable. So uh, OSHA is the organization that actually helps us to think through safety in the workplace. So these are actually OSHA standards. I love to think about a systematic or intentional process, much like an engineer. So when I think about challenges, I often think about what are the needs and constraints that I'm facing? Well, we just gave those to you. And then in addition, we have our own individual needs and constraints, the things that we have available for us. So I like to research the problem too. I like to imagine solutions and then plan by selecting a promising solution and then create a prototype. So pretty soon I'm gonna show you the materials and uh, tools that I use in order to go through my design process. So. Uh, again, check out innovation generation for this activity and other compelling fun maker activities. And without further ado, let's go ahead and jump in and get started. So what are some of the resources that you might want to think about using? So you might want to think about using tools that are commonly available. I'm sure you're all familiar with this, scissors, string. These are the things that I used, a ruler, in order to measure. And then I used glue. I happen to like this type of glue. I found some rubber bands and elastic material that I could use to think about putting over my head in order to hold my mask. And I used some twine. My very first prototype, I actually, I hope that you can see this, I actually used a needle and thread. Then eventually I used a sewing machine here, I think, is an indispensable tool that I think all makers should have at their disposal. This we know as duct tape. Duct tape can do so much. It's crazy how much you can do with duct tape. And then, of course, you're going to see later why I also used food coloring and eggs. You'll see how I use the eggs a little bit later. So those are sort of generally the material that I used. And I'm gonna take you through and show you some mask examples. So it's always a good idea to research what it is you're going to do first. Well, take a look at this particular mask. So this is actually a lacrosse mask and it's huge. And you may say to yourself, well, that's a little bit crazy. How could you actually use this as inspiration? Well, if you look at this and you think about its use and its function, and it's designed, it's kind of elegantly designed. It has padding in here. It has a way to be adjustable and to hold it onto your chin. And uh, so you might be able to get some inspiration from this for how to protect your face and how to make it adjustable. Other example that I found in my household, I love these. These are actually racquetball goggles. And I like these because, well, first of all, I'm a big fan of insects. It looks like I'm a bug. Right? 
But I like also that it sort of conforms to my face. So I have sort of a big head and I also wear glasses and those things sort of come into consideration when I do my design. I actually love the racquetball goggles that come that don't have lenses at all. They sort of have a raised acrylic or plastic frame to prevent the ball from coming in and hitting your eye physically. So there are other sources of inspiration, right? So of course you all know what this is for. This is scuba. And so what I like about this is the use of the elastic band. And I noticed something that is worthy of consideration too. I did not know this, but there's a little label on here that says that this is a really hard polycarbonate. It makes sense. If you were to break this lens underwater, then it would be very, very difficult to navigate. And of course, that's important if we're trying to protect ourselves from a place where there might be flying projectiles, etc. And then of course, we always need to consider comfort. And so I found inspiration from these ski goggles, the use of this foam right here. What I love about these ski goggles is they fit up against my face really comfortably. Right? When I put the strap on, I don't feel like the mask is on at all because of this really cool use of foam. And then again, another way to adjust. Then of course, whenever we make, we can't forget the importance of style, right? So this is an entirely different purpose, right? So you gotta love that. We are coming up on Halloween. So it's important to think about how things look. So those are sources of inspiration. You could also, of course, look at other research like particle size matters. What is the actual size of the particles that come out of our mouth that I call mouth rain? What is the actual size of those compared to the size of the uh, holes in the mass that we will use? So let me take you through my process. I'm gonna show you my very, very first prototype, right? So here's one that I sewed and I sort of used material that does not stretch. And I had to go back to the drawing board for this one. So take a look at it. First of all, it's not comfortable. Second of all, it doesn't protect my eyes. Third of all, I have kind of a big head. So I would want it to have the mask extend from the bottom of my chin all the way up to my nose. So I would consider this one to sort of be a failure. So I decided what could I do to actually make this more expansive? So you can see my second prototype. I went back to the drawing board and I tried again. And you can see I sort of created an accordion sort of a mask where the material actually can be expanded out. So take a look at this. And I also, of course, based on what I learned from my first failure, by the way, fail stands for first attempt in learning. In my first attempt in learning, I learned that I wanted to have elastic. So I connected elastic, elastic to my mask. You can see this is much better. It goes all the way from my nose, all the way down to the bottom of my chin. And that accordion effect allows me to stretch it out to cover more of my face. All right, now the other consideration, which is important. Some of you may have noticed, if you look really closely, this mask is sort of pinkish. It's got a pinkish color to it. Well, where did that pinkish color come from? I want you to think about, once you have created your mask, how could you test it to make sure that it's actually effective? So here's what I did. Here's where the eggs are gonna come in. Right? If you take a look at the egg, if you put the egg inside of your mask like that, and then you use food coloring like this, I have red food coloring in a spray bottle, and you spray it, you can actually see the extent to which the pink goes through the mask. And you will see my first prototype, not good at all. You can see the pink went from one side all the way to the other side, which sort of indicates that fluid could go through this mask. Somebody's mouth rain or chemicals or anything else could go through this mask. So here's what I did. In addition to thinking about having this accordion type of a mask, I actually sewed in some fabric. So I want you to see that I sewed in layers of my second prototype. And then you can see the pink does not go through to the other side, right? It's on this side. So I was successful 
and that I prevented it from going through one side to the other. Now, I wanted to know what an egg would look like if I exposed it completely to the food coloring. So that's an extreme example. I would call this one my control. This one doesn't contain anything on it at all. And then this one's gonna be hard to see, which is why I showed them all. This is actually the egg that I tested with my first prototype, okay? So this one where the pink went all the way through, you can see not very successful. Here is the one that I tested with my second prototype, right? Pretty successful. So the last thing that I want to say to you though is don't forget style. So you can see in my final prototype, I decided I wanted to use the accordion style. I wanted to actually make sure I had elastic and I also wanted to have some style. So I represented my undergraduate alma mater. This is where I went to do my undergraduate work at Michigan State because style matters. Now I wanna show you just one more design because you'll notice that it didn't protect my eyes. Well, guess what? I used the inspiration from the padding that I showed you in those prior masks. This is padding that came in a box that I had a TV delivered in. This is the plastic on the shipping container that contained my TV. Here's the elastic I learned I needed to use. So watch what happens here. I can actually use my final prototype to cover my mouth and nose. In combination with this prototype, right? You can see my duct tape, right? So look what I've done. I think I have pretty much accomplished my goal. I have prevented exposure to chemicals and exposure to airborne and waterborne mat uh, materials. I've created comfort. I have held it to my face. And so you can see, I hope, that what you learned is the importance of being iterative, right? So important to try, to fail again, to try again, to use the material that you have at your disposal. Again, I want to leave you with this. Everybody's a maker. We can all be successful. We can use the material that we have at our disposal. And you can see from Sky's example, you guys really could enjoy a career in making, manufacturing, and designing. That kind of thinking is available to everybody. So I hope you've enjoyed this maker moment and gotten to try out some of the activities, old and new from Innovation Generation. And we hope that you will share these resources with one another and uh, you know, keep the maker movement alive in your community. The most important thing I would say about making is it's so much fun. So thank you so much for Stanley Black and Decker for supporting this maker moment. I appreciate all of your time. I hope that you have a great day. So I'm gonna hand it back over. Thank you all so much. Have a wonderful day. Thank you so much. Thank you for sharing. That was amazing. Um, we also want to make sure that everybody knows about the um, the Maker Month giveaway. If you um, share out anything that you've made during this month um, with the hashtag Maker Month giveaway on Twitter and Instagram, then you'll be entered to win a prize. Jamie, yeah, that's can you tell us more. I'm going to tell you right now that that has been something I've been trying to share out a lot on Twitter because you know what? We're full of classroom makers. They should be posting every day about this. This is a perfect opportunity for them to take this and run with it and um, reshare uh, the great stuff that they're doing to bring it to a broader community. What I love about Stanley Black & Decker too and what we do with this partnership is that it isn't just about what they're doing in their classroom today, but they're really looking at the industry shift that's happening and the changes and the questions people are asking about whether or not I go to college now or do I pursue this career and get this specific certification or training here. So um, Stanley Black & Decker, I think, opens up the door for all of those other options as well. Um, and, you know, they have engineers and, and people that were joining in here a moment ago 
um, but really it began with them being makers and thinking outside the box of what is that norm. So it, it brings to light some really practical ways of how the maker community transforms those future careers for our students, which is really powerful. Um, so I'm actually here with some incredible students doing some great stuff. It, it, if it's okay with you, Arlene, I'm gonna take one second, a few minutes here. I know we got a couple minutes. I know you're gonna be rocking and rolling. Your students do great work every time. And um, I wanna showcase some of the great work that they've done in co-spaces. And so I shared about a virtual reality meeting space, but there also are options to create virtual reality and augmented reality spaces using co-spaces which is amazing. So I have a student that has actually built, if you guys haven't heard about Merge Cube, you need to, it's fantastic. But he built some content using CoSpaces on the Merge Cube. So we're gonna attempt to do this here on our screen. Why don't you share your name, your first name? Uh, my, my name's Bo and I've made the Merge Cube with the CoSpaces. All right, so let's go ahead and open up that app again. Perfect, and I'll hold this for you. I'm gonna scan it up there and see. There we go. Look at that. So he's going to just rotate it and turn it around and show what's going on on this scene. And um, and why don't you share with us kind of the concept? What are you sharing about right here? It was just, um, I just thought it'd be kind of funny if I made like a tiger farm thing. And I just on every side built like a different area. And I had to improvise on a few things because I couldn't find fences. So I used chalkboards. So good news. Great news. Mm -hmm. Inside of CoSpaces, you can do a search for 3D objects that search all of the internet, mm -hmm. and it's all filtered and safe for your students. And if there's anything they can't find inside of CoSpaces, they can type in the word fence, and it will populate all the 3D objects out there available for them to load in to CoSpaces, which is really cool. Mm -hmm. um, in addition to that, if you're a maker, which you are, right, then he can go into Tinkercad, and he can go in and design 3D objects and create those con those pieces, maybe your own, design your own fence, right? And then he can load that into CoSpaces as well. So all of those options, if you ever get stuck, just know that there's always options. Now, some people use the blocks feature in CoSpaces and they rebuild something, which is pretty cool. Like I kind of did on the, like the tower. Yeah, why don't you show us kind of, okay, so I know you can't see, so I'll come over here and why don't you come over and tell us on this side. Like wanna... This side's like this like little like a rock post thing that it sits like the tiger sits on and then down there's another one eating a deer. Yeah. And then the fence is kind of around it. But here's like a rock I made out of something else and it's like a like it was like a long one and but I just made so you wanted to have a boulder. Mm -hmm. Couldn't and necessarily find that. So I just made like one out of this. Cool. So he used some shapes to kind of design what he wanted to look like. You customized the color mm -hmm. to make it look like what you wanted it to look like. Perfect. And um, again, next time you can go into CoSpaces and he can search for that exact thing and it should populate. So great work. I'll hand that back to you. Is there any students we can walk over to? All right. Do you want to share your first name? My name is Carrington. Carrington. All right, Carrington. We're going to look at your screen, and why don't you tell us what, what you were developing here? I made the, like one of the 13 colonies, but I did Jamestown. And, uh, she did one of the 13 colonies, Jamestown, just in case they can't quite hear you. And I uh, made it to where it was, it was like back in the, uh, back when Jamestown was like alive, like when it was going. So do you want me to press play? Sure. Yeah. She's been doing some coding with ours. Nice. There we go. Oh, I did that. that was that code. There we go. I am interested in seeing the code though. That's awesome. Uh, that lady just went back to work. It was it went before I could do it. And that is moving because it won't like not move until it goes because oh. I couldn't find it out. So you had a condition saying that this will happen when this happens. Great. Yeah. Totally Great. using math right we there. Have another one that wants to share. All right. Thank you so much for sharing, Carrington. Do you want to tell us your first name? Cohen. Um, and I did this for the same class project. Yeah. So, and if you can see. Sure. Actually, if you want to put it down on the table. Okay. Go ahead and just um, set it on that table I right there. I need a code for someone to look like they're chopping a tree. 
And also, I have the mice having a conversation about taking over the world. Okay, was that done in the seven colonies? Um, no. <laughs> so what's the connection there? What made you do that? Just to be creative? Yeah. Okay, cool. Love it. Do you want to put the, go ahead and put the computer down on the table, guys. I've and then you can my, talk me through it. I've got my project for the 13 colonies. I made my own little colony here. Mm -hmm. Do you want to well, share your first name? My name's Owen. Owen? Awesome. I've also got a bit of coding into it. Can you show us your code first before you choose play? Oh, wait, no. That's okay. We'll put, we'll go back to it. I'm curious about what you guys have done with the code. All right, so, so for the first part, I've done this. There's also some people talking I've coded. Nice. It's a ton of things. I've coded the wolves. I've coded the animals. The animals? So some of the things you may not even see behind the scenes that are happening in this. Do you want to show us your code? Because I think that's really helpful. Have you ever done coding before? I've done a bit of coding. What kind of things have you done in coding? I've, I've done like the main coding stuff in computer and I think that's about it, but I'm pretty good at it. Awesome. There's the wall. So you can see the different that's, items that he was coding there. That's him running over there. And this one I was, I was checking I was it just, out. Yeah, I was just trying with that. that Very cool. Thank you so much. Do we have any other students that want to Does share? Anybody else want to share? Yeah, out? Okay. I, I, I wanted to show this. You want to show one other thing? There's this. And if you the, uh, oh, you have different scenes. Of, the other part of our project is we had to do what it would be in 2020. And... Here's my in 2020. Boy, did we not have any idea, did we? Also got a lot more coding in this one. <laughs> so if you guys notice, he switched his scene. It's still the same co-spaces project, but you can have multiple scenes set up, kind of like slides in a slideshow. There's all the cars going by. The animals over here moved. Wow, that's massive. Yeah. This one has a lot more code behind it. That's the cat. I use this one to do the dog. This was the tr this was the truck that went over there. That was the car. Oh my gosh! Car must that, drive everywhere. Don't know what that was supposed to be, but I also have one for the bus. Very cool. Thank you so much for sharing. All right, as you can see, there is so much going on here in the classroom. Do you want to share? All right, we have one more student, and then Arlene, we're going to be switching right over to you. So let's go ahead and show. Do you want to share your first name? Uh, Nathan Shrew. All right, Nathan. All right. Um, I'm not done yet, but it's. Awesome. What are you setting up? You want to uh, share? King Phillips War. Okay. King Phillips War. And then if he comes over, oh, look at all of them marching. That is crazy. Are you able to zoom in? Mm -hmm. There we go. Can you show us your next scene too? Mm -hmm. So he's able to share how he's set up the different, oh, it looks like some people lost, huh? Mm -hmm. So you can use code to show the process. So the storytelling of historical times, right? And uh, events that have happened in history using code spaces is really powerful. And I love the fact that the math teacher has decided to bring in the other curriculum. So that cross-curricular learning for our classrooms are, are just vital. You know, coding on its own is not something that's purposeful. It's useless, but there has to be purpose for it. So they're using those, those concepts, those basic foundation foundational concepts to then bring it into multiple different um, learning settings and situations and uh, even in subjects and certainly even in the future of where they're looking for their future careers so very cool so glad to hear from these kids and um, i just want to go ahead and let arlene take it away let's go ahead and arlene are you still there i'm here Can you awesome. hear me? let me start I I can. Are you starting my video? Oh, I need to start. Here we go. Hey. Hi. All right. I'll Hello. let you.
it away. I'll be in the background here for you. All right, perfect. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, welcome everyone to my classroom. This is my middle school classroom. Uh, all of my students are staring at me all starry eyed, wondering um, when, it, when and if they're going to, to be interviewed. So that'll happen in just a moment. But I wanted to introduce you to this project and then I'll be in, um, interviewing some of my students and they'll be able to share from their perspective. So this project is, um, it's called Sowing the Seeds of Change and it's a community project that's based on um, a little tiny work of art, but with a great big mission. And the reason it started is because back um, over the summer when we were shut down, we had um, a local uh, Black Lives Matter march in the community. And um, it brought out um, a lot of people with varying thoughts and philosophies and um, which I welcome all, but it came with um, a side of hate that in the community that was kind of sad. And so we decided um, with my students, we decided to create a project that would help to bring people together um, and help to create change within our world. So we decided to do um, a seed packet project promoting the growth of wildflower seeds. Um, and because it's something that we could work on while we were alone, but all be together. Um, and it's much deeper than all that. And it's just been a really wonderful thing. We've worked with um, a local Boy Scout troop. We worked with our mayor. We worked with TxDOT uh, for our roadways and uh, local people within our community gathering seeds. And we even uh, received a grant from Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center here in our home state of Texas uh, to help uh, purchase seeds that were native to our, um, our community, our world here in Texas and, uh, and be able to distribute those. So without further ado, I'm going to be introducing you to a few students so they can share um, their perspective on, um, on, our, on our project. All right, so bear with me. This is going to be a microphone. Again, you're on, you just speak into it, just hold it up to your mouth. Okay, so who am I supposed to say? <laughs> well, to speak. Okay, so yes, we are doing this community project. Hey. You can read that if you'd like. Psychologists define social change as changes in human interactions and relationships that transform cultural and social institutions. These changes occur over time and often have profound and long term consequences for society. This project is focused on promoting a sense of unity within our community diverse ecology and diverse people working together in harmony equal a beautiful world. Can you speak from your heart? So, um, Ms. Shelton, you created this project for us. Yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, when she first talked about it, I was actually quite moved by the idea. Uh, I also thought that like the hatred that was going towards the Black Lives Matter protest was um, a little saddening. People can have their own views, but like, I don't think there should be hatred towards other people. Um, I um, was really excited to start doing my little index card for the seed packets. So I created a tiny little one of a wildflower from a native Texas wildflower just to um, put on the seed packet. <laughs> um, here we have some, have some examples. Have some examples. We have this one. Doesn't have a name or anything, but there's some pretty flowers. Oh, this one was mine. With that, which is a fire wheel. Um, it grows to 60 centimeters, long leaves, Indian blanket. <laughs> Can you uh, speak to what you commented on about um, serotonin? Oh. <laughs> Uh, we had a little discussion question uh, about why wildflowers are important and the effects they have. And my response was, uh, 
Wildflowers, they're, they're quite colorful. They're quite bright. They're vibrant. And they, uh, one of the chemicals within our uh, minds is serotonin, which is the happy chemical, as a lot of us know. Um, and I was thinking, well, if we were to plant these seeds, that would bring a lot of happiness to the people around us. Um, because of serotonin. So color gives people serotonin, makes people happy. So we were going to plant these around the roadways to, you know, just make people happy, bring the community together. Because it's quite broken right now. Yeah. Thank you so much. Okay. So little bitty artwork. Great big idea. Uh, and we have another person that's going to be sharing with us from his perspective. You ready? Okay, so Texas is home to many different um, pollinators and wildflowers. And um, with us making this seed project, we are uh, harvesting all different kinds of seeds and then putting them into bags and distributing them through our community. And um, the, um, what's in the flower packets is a Ladybird Johnson seed mixture. And they were kind enough to give us a grant. Um, so we didn't have to pay for any of the seeds. And we have the Indian blanket, which is uh, one of my personal favorite flowers. And then the Texas blue bonnet, which is our state flower. And there are a lot of seeds in there <laughs> with them. And um, there were also seed mixtures that are um, pollinator friendly. So a lot of the flowers in there carry uh, the stuff that the bees and the birds really enjoy. And we have a lot of biodiversity in Texas. And I do really encourage you to go out into your community and um, research what flowers are native to your state and your country and figure out what um, you can do to help because it really does make a difference. All right. Thank you so much for that. All right. Yeah, I know. I'm gonna pan around and uh, and show you what's going on in the classroom. And there are lots of kids here. And we'll stop and visit with a few of them. Okay, here we go. So this table has been, you, well, how about one of you guys wanna to talk to tell us what you're doing? Just speak into it. Yep. You've got a whole bunch of people watching. You just can't see them. Okay. Um, right now we're making envelopes with the seeds in. One of us is just cutting them out and placing them. The other one folds them. And Isaac is gluing them together so we can put cheese inside them. We're going to show them one of the. Yeah. So it started out, it starts out as a piece of squared paper. He places lines on them to where it makes a rectangle and cuts the edges. And then we fold them. And then I think this glues them together. Right. Thank you guys so much. Okay, so that's one step. And then we have another step. These are students that are working on uh, gluing the gluing the original artwork down to the envelope and uh, preparing them to be sent out into the world. We had a lot more donations of seeds than what we expected. And so we actually had to make color copies of artwork. Um, here's another group of students. They're working with um, 
seeds that were donated by uh, our local communities. So some echinacea seeds and uh, sunflower seeds and different things like that. Um, and then here is another small section. Those are some of the seeds that seed packets that are set and ready to be distributed. And so everybody's been busy, busy, busy working on um, their own separate sections, either creating artwork or uh, cutting out color copies to post to glue down to the envelopes. And uh, all while this is happening, again, like I said before, our our mayor and our um, parks and recs director are all working with TxDOT and the roadways, the, the um, Boy Scouts and everything, trying to coordinate a time, date, and place for everybody to sow their seeds um, separately but together. Um, we have areas within our parks and all along our roadways um, where nothing is currently growing and we need to get our seeds planted within the next couple of weeks. Um, because they need to be seeded uh, into the soil and then it goes through a, a time where there's um, a cold so that they can be prepared um, to grow in the spring. And so the unique thing about this project is that they're doing the artwork today and we're sending it out to the world. And then a year from now, we'll be reminded of this wonderful event, this wonderful thing that has come from um, a response to hate in our community and it will help to bring everybody together again to to remind them of the beauty that does exist in the world and we're bringing together uh, a diverse group of people to promote change in our community and also trying to um, help heal our world by spreading wildflower seeds to uh, attract pollinators to create um, some biodiversity as well. So we're helping to heal the world as well as the, um, the hearts within our community. And it's just been a, a wonderful experience. And again, like, uh, like one of my students has said, Justin has said, find out what grows in your community, um, what types of plants uh, are native to your area and consider collecting those local seeds or finding other ways to uh, to purchase seeds and send them out to the community. Create your own envelopes, spread the word. Um, it, it doesn't have to be a response to negative things that we've seen in our community, like what we're doing, but just spreading the seeds, sowing the seeds out into the world so that people have something beautiful to look at, um, something to look forward to, um, to promote change in the way that we live in all aspects. Um, it's it's a, just a beautiful, wonderful experience to see the students uh, finding out information, learning about uh, ecology, learning about um, pollinators and how they work, learning about the native Texas plants, learning about the native um, pollinators in our area, finding out how to make envelopes, learning how to uh, create little miniature works of art. We even studied um, oh, design, seed packet design. We just studied marketing. Um, we just we studied so many different aspects and it's been so hands-on and wonderful. And it's just amazing how such a small little work of art can make such a big impact in the classroom and in our community. Um, and again, I wanted to put out another um, thank you to the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center for giving us a grant to Native American Seed Company, which is uh, where we purchased our seeds from. They were able to give us uh, enough seeds to cover 5,000 uh, square foot of land. In addition to what the community has given us, we will be able to spread seed out to well over 10,000 square foot of land, potentially more than that. Um, the Native American Seed Company is a wonderful company that helps people to restore the earth and uh, and allows for us to understand um, 
our world a little bit better uh, in a very profound way. Uh, this is some of the information that we shared to them. We studied the seed packet design. Uh, they sketched out local seeds, uh, local wildflowers before they got started. Um, to try to understand that, and then we focused on, like I said, our local um, wildflowers that grow in our area. With the blue bonnet being the state flower. The last slide of the show. So we've got some such. This connects to some of these SDGs sharing from earlier. Oh, I can't wait to, to make that connection to reach out and see what I can learn from, um, from that. That's the only comment that we have. So we're open for questions. If anybody is there, you can, you're welcome to um, use the chat to find us on Twitter. Um, on Twitter, I'm smartest teacher and um, Alito underscore middle school is the, the format which, which was, we're um, posting from, posting from, and um, hashtag global maker day, of course. We have some people already shouting out, um, giving us shouts out, talking about what a big impact art can make in the classroom. And I thank you for that. Um, making seed packets with original art to promote native wildflowers. And we've got some pictures of students actually working in the classroom. Um, thank you to Katie McNamara for her shout out there. We appreciate that. Apparently we're making a big difference. I think my eyes tear up. Um, So wonderful solutions to some of the diverse problems that we're having in our world. Um, I think really truly the creative mindset of our younger generation is that it's what is going to help us to, uh, to solve our problems of our world, to help to bring love and harmony to, to our world. Jamie, are you still there with us? Hi, I think Jamie's with um, the students of the school where she was at. I love the, your project. Um, my oh, name is Finchev. I'm super excited about it because um, earlier today, David was sharing about his electricity, his uh, paper circuits, and my fourth grade is studying that, and my third and fifth grade are studying ecosystems and flowers and plants. And so I'm like, this is the perfect day. <laughs> I'm getting so many great ideas to add into what we're doing. So I'm super excited about this. Um, so you're working with your entire community on this. What has the reaction been from other people in your community? Oh my gosh. So uh, it has just been overwhelming. Uh, you know, when you first told them about, oh, we're designing seed packets, they're just like, you know, that's nice. But then when they realize all of the connections that we've made and it just, you know, I, I spoke to the mayor and I said, hey, we're doing this. And she was like, oh, we can do more. And, and then, you know, I talk to the Boy Scouts and they say, oh, we can do more. And I talk to the community members and they say, oh, we can do more. <laughs> and it's just been amazing. I, I did not intend for this to be quite as big of a project. Uh, I had just intended for our students to hand out seed packets to people and plant them in their yard. And the community said, we can do more, we can do better. That's and amazing. That's such a beautiful thing. Um, knowing that not all of us have the same um, the same thoughts and, and theories and beliefs, but yet we can all come together to create this sense of beauty, this harmony, this unity, um, regardless of all of that. So, so this is uh, Michael Dresick here uh, from New York. And uh, I just, you know, we hear Global Maker Day, you have the word global in there. You know, I've heard the phrase, um, you know, think globally, <laughs> act locally. And, and this project is certainly doing that. Um, you know, it would be pretty amazing to see, you know, some type of site or some type of resource where our students can go and get expired from your makers and then bring this to their community. So please let your students know that 
um, you know, that this is, has a ripple effect globally of what they're doing in terms of inspiring others and, you know, um, maybe even teaching uh, other kids around the world through their, uh, through their acts. So just wanted to give that shout out. This is amazing. Well, thank you so much. I would love for this to be um, a, a truly a global challenge. Um, that, that sounds amazing to make a site where potentially my students could help to promote change within the world and not just within their community. So thank you for that concept, that idea. I love it. Okay. And you know what, Arlene, thank you so much. You always come in and do such a wonderful job and your students are rocking. So thank you so much for everything that you do and share at Global Maker Day and being part of this event. Thank you. Uh, it's one of those things I, I really, uh, I don't fear failure and we don't have much time to prep. We don't have much time to plan. We've got so much going on, but we just come in and we share from our hearts and they just show off what they've already done. And I, I challenge whoever else is watching, if you haven't participated, don't worry about failure. Just go in and, and go for it and just share what you're already doing. You know, you don't have to do something new. Just show off what they've done. You know what the best part about Global Maker Day is? There's What's no that? wrong answers. There's no wrong answers. And I think that that's really powerful when it comes to being able to give, give our parent, our students a chance to be able to create and try something, take risks in a setting that they don't feel afraid to make a mistake. And Absolutely. That should be in every classroom every day, really. I know that there's always gonna be an assessment and um, addressing understanding of content, but I think we spend too much time on expecting a right answer and not enough time at coming and solving um, the problems through risk. Absolutely, just um, allowing for them to explore, to become explorers at heart. Um, it, you know, getting out there into the world, into nature, and even in their classrooms, in their own minds, just seeing what's out there, what's in your brain, what's out in your world, and, and allowing yourself to, um, to express that in new and unique ways. It's got, oh my gosh, yes, yes, Jamie, you're absolutely right. This is pretty awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Happening. They're all just thank doing their thing. Thank you, thank thank you, you guys so from Global Maker Day. We we Hi. thank you guys for sharing. Have a great day. Thanks, Amy. Bye. Bye bye. All right, I am still here in this classroom, and um, I am uh, trying not to mess up what's happening here because we have lots of virtual reality creations happening. So right now, Owen, um, what are you building right now? What are you drawing? Um, I need to know how to race because I just. That's a good quote. That's going to be something you're going to have to figure out is a race because he's created a lot. Now, what's the steps to a race? And he's actually in an art app inside of the Pico. Um, and, in, and he's having a chance to explore and create art and sound so that it's all integrated together. We also have two different headsets moving back there as well. Um, and those two headsets are the Oculus One and Oculus Two, uh, the Quest One and Quest Two. And they are, one is inside of Google Tilt Brush and having a chance to create and design inside of this 3D space. And then the other one right there is in the Quest Two and he is right now working inside of Sculptor, uh, Sculpt VR. So, um, it gives you, gives the students a chance to be able to design. He can mold and craft and um, uh, really just go in and sculpt his creation that he's brought in. He might start off with a sphere and then he goes in and starts molding it down and, and crafting it and um, designing something new. So all three are working in some different virtual reality experiences, which is pretty awesome. And I think giving them a chance to, you know, explore in a new way, design maybe in a digital way that they've never had a chance to design before. And what are your thoughts about global? Do you want to go get that picture that somebody made just oh, on the yeah. slice? So today, um, you know, a lot of this is, a lot of what we do is not 100% defined, planned out. And there's a purpose for that. You know, to be a maker, you have to be willing to adjust and modify and be flexible. And I just love that a student came in today and shared their image of this just on the fly, 
so excited about Global Maker Day and having it at their campus and um, having a chance to be able to come in and create with her teacher, Ms. Brantley. And I think, well, tell me what your thoughts are so far about this day for you. Okay, well, number one, I like the kids having the freedom that they can do what they want to do. So I have different kids on different projects at different times. I kind of give them an idea like, hey, I want you to tie in social studies. And we got to see that and they did a great job that one kid was playing on the program he's like hey there's a merch cube in here can i do that absolutely mm -hmm. you know take off with it you know and now he's my expert so i have him sharing with the other students and as a teacher this is when you're building those relationships you're building that trust and they get to see like hey my teacher believes in me and then the problem solving wow what area in our life would do we not need problem solving so this is an awesome experience for my students that's so great and they've been working on these projects in code spaces and really like conversation last week like hey did you know global maker days next week hey let's do some things hey have you guys worked in co-spaces before and this campus actually had it in the past but this group had never done it before this group had never seen co-spaces and it was really fun because i put it out in my google classroom with a code and the kids kept coming up like hey what do i do with this i'm like oh i don't know i have just got on the account can you go be an expert and come back and share with me? So they were like digging in and then like, I was like, hey guys, I learned how to code a little. Can I show you that? And they're like, oh, Miss Brantley can code. So I was like, but that's all I know. Can you go add on to this and come show me how to code? Well, they felt like they were teaching me, which inspired them to go learn it, come back and share with me. So I really, I mean, they were pumped up about this today. That's so great. And that, you know, again, seeing kids across the world not just here in texas yes um and not just in the united states but students all over that can really take this as inspiration this day is not a day that we do once a year this day is to really rethink how your classroom can and should look for our kids and exploring and creating and discovering and not being stuck to this is the end result we expect but what could they actually do with the problems that we as a society across the world need to solve right now and that we haven't solved? Our kids can do it. I know that they yeah. can. They, they're well, amazing. Like today, open the windows because like when they were doing scratch earlier and they were like, wow, I'm doing scratch with someone on the other side of the world. Like this is really happening. So I have a lot of students who have been taking notes. They're looking at doing activities to bring back to share. So it, it did, it opened up a lot of windows for the students. And all these presenters that are out sharing, I know we're about a minute out before our next uh, presentation with Jackie, but all these um, presenters are just amazing people. So if you're watching and you wanna get connected with that class from India in the future, and you wanna do projects with them again, this is the time to get connected. Go on to um, you know, Global Maker Day, get connected to what they're doing, research them, find them. We'll be happy to share out their handles. I know we do a lot of social posts on Twitter. So we're hoping that you're on there watching as teachers as well. Um, but this is a great chance to be connected to other classrooms that are really innovative. And that is the push to move you all forward together. So, And we were able to have like, I have five classes through the day. So the other teachers jumped in today. So we're all kind of like making it to where everyone gets to see it for the day. So talk with your co-teachers, plan with them like, hey, what are you doing in your class? Can I help with that? You know, social studies was pulled into the math class. Now they're taking the story that you've seen earlier and the reading teacher, Ms. Owens, is having them come up with a plot to go with it. Like she's pushing them a little bit further. So next week they're gonna be presenting to all of fifth grade what they've been doing on Coast Basics. And it makes it more interesting. It, it brings it to where, you know, the kids, it's on their level. Mm -hmm. And we need to be more on their level. That's right. So we're, we're thrilled to see what's happening through this event. And um, again, to have my daughter a part of this has been really special too, yes. because I always want to bring her. I always want to include her. She always wants to be included. Uh, but this being the first year that her school has said, hey, we want to do Global Maker Day. They, they just didn't know about it. I should have done my part in sharing it better. But now this is a chance for her to be involved and to be able to do this with her peers and her teachers as well. Her so, favorite teacher. And her, her favorite <laughs> teacher. Hopefully her other teachers don't hear about this. We'll keep it a right. secret. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Um, we're ready to move over to Jackie. Jackie, are you on? Ready to go? Oh. 
Yay, we see you. How are you? How are you? Doing good. You ready to take over? You bet. All right, we're gonna, I'll be in the background and you can go for it now. All right, thank you. Thank you. Hi everybody, I'm very excited to be here and I wanna first thank Jamie and the Hall Glover Maker team. This is a pretty incredible event. I have watched it in previous years, but I, I wanted to share what I'm doing with my own classroom. So a little bit about me. Uh, my byline is I don't do teaching for a living. I live teaching as my doing and technology has amplified my passion for doing so. <clears throat> what I prepared these activities for, which I'm gonna describe in a, in a few minutes, is because I work at three, I teach gifted kids at three Title I schools that are primarily Hispanic, Latinx. And I love getting them situated in a way that makes them competitive with other students, especially if and when they go to college. This past summer, I think you all know they, the anti-racism movement exploded and I'm thrilled about it because I've always believed in it, but it allowed me to be more educated. These amazing people gave webinars all summer and I tell people I felt privileged to sit at their feet. So that's where, what, um, where my activities stem from and my goal is to have anti-racism awareness and activities go viral. And I think what we've been talking about, um, I heard Jamie talking about inspiration and trusting the kids to change the world. I always tell them it's up to them to change the world. So that's where my um, motivation stem for, for creating these activities. So what I'm going to do is describe a good number, probably a half a dozen activities. And again, as Jamie said, these aren't really necessarily going to be completed today. In fact, they won't. And they're meant to be a series of activities. And I'd love to see on social media if you have your students do some of them or even all of them. So the first thing I created, which we all know about, is Bitmoji classrooms. So kids could explore the resources on their own. I put several videos in here. This is Jamal. Jamal is a boy who lives in a poor That are kid appropriate, discrimination. Hey guys, so today we're gonna to be talking about it. And then resources, I don't know if you know about Naomi. I think many of us At did. Aspen Tinsel, Sorry, smile for Aspen zero money down with zero work. Cued. Um, she spoke at the, Plus the paid zero interest if paid in full within hear 18. about the children the interest within 18 months so they could watch i want them and you'll see even with the next activity uh to be inspired to understand that even though they're i work third through seventh grade eight through 13 uh that they still have the power to change the world and again this is just um, resources for them to orient them to, to our unit. And then I created a Wakelet. I think many of you know Wakelets. And I actually bought all the books. And I'll show you what we'll do. We're still remote. So they're not going to be able to do, which I'll show you in a minute, the Makey Makey Talking Book. We worked on some last year and then the COVID hit and we re went remote, but I love having a library and I'm actually going to have the students pick out books they want to read. And then when we come back to school, hopefully by um, spring, they'll be able to create a makey makey book, talking book. And that's what this is. So this isn't the talking book. Um, one of these, but you scratch and a makey makey, and then they record the book, and and then we we plan to take it to the kindergartner so they could actually you hear them reading the book to them. So that's our first project, and again, I'm not going to be able to do this one yet, 
but I am going to have the kids explore the books and pick out which one. And with Scratch, they could also, we were working, not only record the content of the book, but they could add uh, sound effects, which they love doing. And again, COVID hit and we didn't finish the ones that we did last year. So the second activity, and by the way, I put a link in, the, in Twitter with the hashtag. I have a blog post that describes all these activities in, in more detail. And then at the end, I'll show you the resource that I created for kids. A lot of us know the I am poem. And if we were, if I could see y'all, I'd have you raise your hand and say who's done it because most teachers have done it. But what I'm going to do is have them create an I am poem from the perspective of a BIPOC, uh, of a young person of color. So they'll take, they'll write that I am poem, pick, they'll look through, I love this list, and not all of them are young people of color, but a lot of them are. And I'm going to ask them to find a first. Carly Diaz, I've been following her for years. What a brilliant young woman. And to take their perspective to write an I am poem and then use Adobe Spark, too many windows open, using Adobe Spark to create their I am poem. Here's um, the format. And again, the links are in my blog post that they could do electronically, so they'll write it first. So as an aside, I love that I could include activities that are cross-curricular. I don't believe kids should be focusing on a single content area at a time. We're doing math now, we're doing language arts now, um, because life isn't like that. So my projects always um, have cross-curricular connections. So poor Adobe Spark, I try, it was working earlier. Now I keep getting that error message. It's, it comes up again, yeah. But let me show you an example of one that's not with Adobe Spark, but I think they did a really nice job with it. and a heroine. I wonder what my future looks like. I hear lies everywhere. I see a world that needs help. I want to change people, maybe even to change the world someday. I'm a human and a heroine. I pretend I'm not hurt and keep on living. I feel that sometimes the world stops for me. I touch your heart every day. I worry that we will grow apart. I cry when people die. I'm human and a heroine. I understand your point. I say it's okay, I'll be fine. I dream for happiness. I try so hard and get so far that in the end, it doesn't even matter. I hope my dreams will someday become a reality. I'm a human and a heroine. Shehita. Lovely, huh? So that's my goal. Um, I'm starting to implement this after Halloween. It's been crazy. I meet with my gifted kids for a block of, to block of time, depending on the group, or a few blocks of time each week. So um, I have examples from other students here. But again, uh, this wasn't made with Adobe Spark. I don't know if any of you have used it. I was going to show you a quick, a quick demo, but it's incre <clears throat> it's incredibly easy to use and it's free. So between those two, it's it's a winner. So again, all these windows open when I'm doing this. I'm trying to get away from the Zoom one. Okay, so the next activity I have planned for them. And someone was saying earlier that what's great about maker and maker activities take on a lot of a lot of form is that I don't have an expectation of, of what the product should look like. 
I have an expectation that they should use the tools and use their creativity. But for me, it's about the process, about learning how to create, be creative in their lives. I don't think they get enough of that in school and that they have a voice. And so I provide these frameworks for it. And so for me, the ultimate goal is they learn the process of being creative and then they do internalize and become activists for anti-racism. So that's my bottom line for both of them. This was a podcast. I, I've used all these tools that I'm showing you except the podcast. So I'm really excited to use those. I even bought a mic, but again, I thought we'd be back in school by now. So this is, again, I tried to show examples of what other kids did. So these were some young girls um, who did this art butterfly project. And this was a podcast of them talking about it. Maybe. Today, I'm talking to Lily and Kaya. The world seems wrong and there's all about activism. Today, I have two. I am mixed. I am black, white, and Cuban. I'm from Berkeley, California. And I identify as an activist. Ooh, love it, yes. <laughs> All right, Kaya. I was also going to say activist. And uh, I was going to say Indian. And I love that how they describe themselves. And I want my students to describe themselves as activists. And I don't know if you know Matt Miller, I think his last name is, ditch, ditch that textbook. He's like the king of sharing free re resources. So these are directions on how to create a podcast. So again, in my blog post, I provide all these links so that it's all there for you and the students. So he, he recommends Anchor for the, prod, for the podcast. And the podcast goal is just to have them talk about anti-racism or they can even write a song. I have several students who really like music and songwriting and they make up words during our remote class. So I think they'll really jump at the chance of making a song up about, it's all about anti-racism. And I included some resources to, about how to make podcasts. I wish I could ask you if you have any questions. Anybody on Zoom have any questions so far? I'm used to interaction, so this is a little different for me, but. You could talk to me as if I was there and hearing you. That would be fine too, which was is funny. So I went to the, oh, somebody's gonna ask something? Something? Oh, I heard something, I got excited. So I there's this young woman and I have her link in my blog post who started making quilts, a young um, African-American woman. And she's doing this quilt project that just blew me away. I went to one of her webinars and I couldn't stop, get, I couldn't get enough of her. She talked for an hour and 45 minutes and everybody in the session was going, you can keep going. But what their company does is they um, help make quilts that's based on uh, the, the ones that they've been using is the Black Lives Matter. And they make quilt pieces and they put it together, but they also have to include an artist statement. Again, I like that. Um, language arts is, are, is included in a lot of these activities. What I'm going to do is we have a laser cutter at my school and I have a Cricut cut at home and I'm going to have the students design their quilt pieces and then send the, me the slide of their quilt pieces and I'm going to cut them out and uh, form them into a quilt for them. But they also have to write an artist statement to go along with their quilt piece. So again, I'm just showing you a lot of activities. And for, for me, I'm looking, again, I'm gonna start this right after Halloween and I'm looking at them working for with it at least till Christmas and possibly after. So this is really a long-term project and I sequenced it 
so that activities build off each other. So this one is a book that a uh, book creator and I love all these free online tools and take advantage. So my students, by the way, have used these tools. So for me, it's putting them in the context of an anti-racist product that they're going to make out of it. So this one was done by a fifth grade class. It was an aggregate, but I'm gonna have my students do their own. They're either going to have a choice between um, doing a book creating, book creator or a scratch project. And I know scratch has come up several times today because it's just a great tool. So they, they could choose one or one format or the other, or they can use both. And at this point, it's getting towards the end of the unit. So I want them to come up with an actual action plan. What are some specific actions they could take to become uh, anti-racist and help others become aware of what it means to be an anti-racist? So this was a one that was done by fifth grade class. And it was at the, um, sustainable goal development. And I know somebody talked about that earlier, but that's what this one created. And different kids um, created different pictures and uploaded them and then wrote about them, which I love. And there's several tools online that they could use to create their pictures. You could see how good I draw. Uh, I want a stylist. I mean, I'm gonna, I, I have stylists for my students when we get back together or I'm delivering them a care package next week. I think I might add, add, add stylists. So that's just a bad picture and then you download them. And then they can upload them into Book Creator. That's how they made it. So there's another one and I'll show you that in a second. Pixel art, kids love making pixel art. I have two pixel art tools there. Here's the list of tools that you can use. The first one was, uh, you could see this was a pixel art tool. And then you just go to Book Creator and you could upload those pictures. That's what I love about Book Creator. Zoom's making me have a, uh, there we go. And then I just upload the pictures. Let's see what it's called. Picture, that's a good name for it, huh? And then they could add their own drawings. I really like the idea of them adding their own drawings. And that was before it was done. I don't think I would create a book that looked like that. And then it's the same thing with pixel art. You would download it. And you could add that to the book. And then it also, if you, have, you haven't used Book Creator, you could change the color of the pages. You could add, a, you could even draw on it. So there's also online, and I, I'm, I'm not gonna spend time sharing, look, showing you now, but you could actually remove the background. There's several tools. You see how that was white on there? You could actually just have, um, oh, this one doesn't, yay. That was my lovely pixel art. I don't think anyone's gonna hire me to be an artist at any time soon. And like I said, uh, you can all, I'm giving them the option between doing a zine, I'm calling it a book creator zine or a scratch interactive. And as I mentioned, my students are really familiar with Scratch, but I'll show you, these were created by some other kids. This is the history of Black Lives Matter. They did a really nice job to pick your character. I love what they did with this. Hi, I'm Hannah. This is my school. 
It's 1963. Well done, Emma. Four marks again. Thank you so much, miss. Well done, Joseph. You got full marks, too. I'm glad you can see the effort I put into this. I have the man of a voice. Voice of a man. Bottom marks, Hannah. See me after class. But I... Terrible work, David. A detention for you. That's not fair. Sadly, that still goes on in some schools. Wow. Martin Luther King is so inspirational. If you know anything about Scratch, they could Hi, actually I'm Hannah. remix this. This is my school. It's 2019. They could remix it and include their own thoughts. Boy, Hannah, and David, why are you so horrible? I hate you. Yeah, why are you both so ugly? See, this is actually sad. We need more protests like this to raise awareness in society. And here's another one I'll share just a little bit of. Scratch is pretty amazing if you think about it. <laughs> I think all of anybody who's, who's used it knows that. So this is one about Booker T. Washington. And they can also, I, I really like the idea of them drawing their own characters and in Scratch, just like they could, I'm gonna ask them to do with those online tools if they want to uh, use book creator in scratch it's already there oops i didn't want that i i want to draw mine and i i'm excited and i think it's true for most kids that they do like to create their own pictures when i used scratch last year they wrote stories and they had to create a scratch interactive from it and most of them really liked creating their own characters. And that's already there. They don't have to upload them because Scratch has this ability to do that. There was a comment in the chat. Oh, thanks. Michael, do you want to just say that? You could tell us. You want to come on for a second and tell us about auto draw? I don't know about Good thing. Yeah. Um, I was just going to add to uh, the fact, you know, I know you said you were doing a lot of the drawings and uh, maybe some of them didn't uh, turn out the way you would have wanted, but the, uh, the auto draw feature from Google, uh, they had integrated that into book creator. So, so there was a feature there. Um, and I can't remember if it was pro or if it was just included in the basic, but oh, okay. um, I didn't see, I, it might be pro. Yes, because I know if you like if you start to draw a bicycle and it can sense that you're drawing a bicycle, um, it will put that into a really nice like clip art uh, drawn image for you. Um, so I just I just I, I linked it in the chat there and I could certainly share it out on Twitter with the Global Maker Day hashtag for people yeah, to, to give it a try. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, I don't, I'm saying I don't see it in the free version here. No, but this is great. Thank you. Thanks for sharing that. I actually might do auto draw as an option for the kids who really don't like to draw. Well, thank you so much, Jackie. Oh, I actually have one more thing. Yeah, go for it. We'll let you finish. Just, and come back on. I just wanted Michael. I I like the interaction. So when I saw there was a comment in the chat, so I did create a book creator. Oops, I created so the kids won't look at my blog post. It has a lot of information. So we use what's called Open Access Canvas for a resource. So I could put that right in, and this is the kid friendly version. So they have the activities in Book Creator that I shared without all the other 
um, padded stuff that's meant more for teachers. So there's Book Creator. And then finally, what I'm doing with all my activities, we used it for All About Me. I create a badge system, and that's also in open access. And since it's on Google Docs, I, when I make changes in it, when a kid earns a badge, it shows up. And they love seeing that badges show up next to their name when they complete projects. So there's the major projects. And then um, they get badges for completing them. Now you wait, now I'm done. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing. I love everything that you just shared and all the concepts and content for the students to run with. And certainly just keeping in mind at others and just really considering others and considering the fact, I mean, even Global Maker Day is, is really interesting because the challenges that are typically presented, um, you know, are, are narrow. Typically in our classroom, we have like, okay, well, these are the items that we're going to have. And most Global Maker Days, interestingly enough, um, people want to know what products to go out and buy for the event. And that's the best part about the day is that you don't need to be prepped. You don't have to have supplies. You want to, you want your students to think creatively how they can use all of these um all of these items that they currently have available to them. And even Global Maker Day has to be unique in the fact that we can't assume that you have certain things right. because across the world, it's different. It varies. Some people have access to more, more things than others. And, and some people have access to certain things that nobody across the world would have access to. So I think that that's um, you know, definitely something for us as a Global Maker Day team that we've always been aware and um, wanting to make sure that what we're doing here is available for everyone from everywhere. And um, we just yeah, think- my students, my students come from low income families and nothing I shared, it costs money and it yeah. shouldn't. That's and right. Like you said we don't know what kids have or or don't have at home. And from what I've watched today, and I'm actually meet with my class and they're at, at noon, my time, and we're going to do the meal one the, and the math art. And they're all excited for that. But again, I don't think we should assume, like you said, that our students have these materials. And I pride myself on what when I use a lot of tech like I'm using here that I don't want any of the tools to cost money. And I appreciate these companies that they do keep their tools free for kids. I appreciate it too. And thank you so much for sharing those. Drezek for sharing that too and bringing some of those ideas to light. And we thank you again for sharing at Global Maker Day. And this is uh, our transition time now to the next session. Thank you. For our next class, um, we have Scott Savet, and he is joining in from right now where Nancy Pinchev was joining, joining in, our, one of our organizers in the same area. Um, and they are at the host school from last year. Uh, Shek Halil, we had joined in and it was just an incredible experience that we had over there. And I'm so glad to see that when we left, you still have all these makers there making like they have been before and will continue to do so in the future. So um, Scott, if you want to go ahead and introduce yourself and introduce your class and the things that you guys are making, because he has class, he has students with him physically, but he also has students. Um, is that correct, Scott? Do you also have students with you? So, um, you know, our, our school is currently transitioning back to school in a staggered return. So right now it's only lower school kids on campus. Um, but next week, uh, myself and all my middle school students are returning and then the high school returns the week after that. So okay. what you're looking at now, and yes, I, I'm still teaching from home and all my students are still working from home as well. That's great. So, um, and right now, I guess we'll just go ahead and get started with the presentation. Um, well, we'll be here in the background for you, but I feel like I'm looking at like, um, just like the Brady Bunch of makers, like makers all around the, the screen right now. I love it. Okay, yeah. we'll be in the background. Let us know if you need this. We'll, we'll do. So once again, welcome. And, and it's good to see you again. Um, yes, last, last year was a lot of fun. I, I still have vivid memories of 
playing with a virtual reality headset for hours upon hours. Um, so yes, right now we, we are still um, doing school from home. So all my students are sitting inside their, their bedrooms or in their houses. And we are currently working on our, card our cardboard arcade project um, where students have to basically plan out and engineer their own cardboard arcade game. Um, and so this is our fifth year doing this project, and, but it's our first year doing it from home. Um, and I guess the differences from at school and home include, well, now that we're home and we can't rely on group projects, everybody is building their own game. Um, so yeah, we, I guess um, once this project is done, you know, we have about 86 graders, we will have about 80 cardboard arcade games that hopefully one day we could all bring to school and make a big arcade for everybody to play on. Um, so that is our project. The inspiration comes from um, when I first started working at this school, we were looking up projects and I was YouTubing and I came across a video um, called Kane's Arcade. It was about this little boy who was working in his father's garage and I guess to keep himself busy, he started making arcade games. Um, sure enough, it blew up into this big viral internet sensation and and it became viral. And here we are in our fifth year doing this same project. Um, so as you can see, all my students are actually building their games right now as we speak. Um, they just started building them last week. Before we started, they first had to plan out three different games they wanted to build. Even if they were already set on one game, I still made them plan for three just in case if something were to happen, they always have a fall black, uh, fallback plan. Um, so they had to plan for three games, they had to list the materials, draw sketches, draw what it's going to look like, and then ultimately narrow it down to their one idea and, and get started building. Um, so that is our project. Um, I was going to go over to a few students today and they were going to present their projects and I guess they could tell you a little bit about their games. Um, so talking to my class right now, it, it's lovely to see all your faces and it's really good to see all you guys are working. Um, I hope you guys are all, all being safe, especially with the uh, cardboard cutting instruments. I, I, um, so with that being said, are, do any of you want to volunteer to present first? Um, so, so yeah, Liam, um, you could take yourself off mute, Liam, and, and you could just tell us about your game. Okay, so this is a cardboard basketball arcade. And it, wait, I'm gonna take my headphones off. Liam, are you going to show us how to play your game? Oh, I think he's getting the headset run ready. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now, loud and clear. We're looking at your basketball game. It looks good. This is my basketball game. It's almost as tall as me. And this is the rim. And I, I found a net in my house, so I connected it to this. This is the backboard. This is a hoop made out of these little branches that I found. And it fits really well. I could get a ball. I can't, I can't find the ball now, but I found this little football. It's not the football. It's okay, you can practice with this. It goes in. You have yeah. to make the shot, there you go. And, it, and then I need to fix this part. I didn't, I didn't finish the bottom part. So it goes down here and it rolls out. And it's, oh, so that thing is standing up all on its own. It's not sitting on a table or anything. No. I like it. And I put designs. I might, I might take that game home for, for my son to play, if you don't mind. Okay. So what were the most challenging parts about that? Let's talk about that and how you overcame those challenges. Connect, these are two different pieces of cardboard, this and this. That was a challenge to make them stand up together and not make them fall. And the rim, trying to connect it to the, to the wood because it would keep falling. And just making this because this would flatten down. We can't this, this part. 
Let's try to roll down. Now, did you use any hot glue in that, or did you only use tape? I used only tape. Because yeah. I'm, I'm not good with hot glue guns. And I don't have one either. Well, there you go. So so that that's good. I'm, I'm glad you said that, because a lot of the basis around this project was use what you already have around the house. And let's not, you know, spend a whole lot of money buying all these materials for this and that. So I'm glad you were able to find the basketball net. Um, the hoop looks awesome. That That is one awesome hoop. So I really like it. I can't wait to see the final version of it next week. So, so thank you very much, Liam. Alberto, I, I see you like patiently waiting over there with that smile. So I'm gonna let you present okay. that. Hi, I'm, I'm Alberto Dici and this is my project. It's kind of like a street fighter game where as uh, you have to knock over the head with the arm and that's how you win. Uh, the way to do that is um, I'm gonna add a stick through this little hole and then it's gonna connect to the arm and then you can hit it. It can also uh, move with these little sticks. And uh, yeah, and, uh, the obje uh, and the objective of the game is to knock over the head. The biggest challenge I had was uh, halfway through, I had to change the whole design of the game because I couldn't get the head to move by itself by, with a string. And I had to change it. And I, I made a knocking over the head the objective instead of using the head for, for hitting. So one, I will tell you, in, in the five years that we've been doing this project at school, no one has ever made a Street Fighter game the way I'm looking at it now. Um, so, so that is very awesome and, and original. And I'm glad you brought up that, you know, halfway through, you had to completely rethink everything. Um, and like I've been telling you guys from the beginning, when we do our projects in our class, in any STEM class, really, things are rarely ever going to work out the first time you try to do it. So, so a lot of the basis and a lot of things I always remember try to teaching you guys is that when, when things don't work out, you, you don't give up. You, you take that failure as a learning experience and, and you keep going. So Alberto, I, I will say that is an awesome game. I, I would love if you could maybe start working on those sticks now and then maybe by the end of our presentation, you can, you can show us how, to, uh, how it actually plays. So, so thank you very much. The, that game is awesome. I, I, I really can't wait to see it in action. All right, so so moving on, we are, we are going down our list. Ariella, I see, I saw a hand. I didn't see your face, but I'll, I'll take it with that hand. You are ready, so when you are ready, you can go ahead, unmute yourself, and present. Okay, so first, this first, first introduce yourself. I would yeah, say. my name is Ariella Sarantel, and this is my project. I made a game where there is a slingshot. And you try from afar to shoot it into one of the holes. And when the ball gets in one of the holes, it'll roll out from the bottom. And so I made these barriers so it won't roll all the way out. And I'm not officially complete with the project yet because there's still a lot to do in the inside to make all the to make the each of the holes roll down from one of the holes. So look. Can you show us all that wonderful ball launcher that you're so happy about? Yeah. <laughs> so this is my slingshot. I made it out of cardboard and rubber bands. And I have a ball that I'm going to use for the game. I still need to make side barrier so the ball doesn't roll away. And so yeah, that's my project. So let me ask you something. When you first planned this out, did you first plan for side barriers or was that something that you saw that as you were building your game, it's something that you're gonna need to make your game more enjoyable? Yeah, so I did not plan on using side barriers because I thought like it was just gonna go straight there, but then the slingshot just goes to any side. So I need to make side barriers. And I'm, I figured this out yesterday Then I'm working on these so the ball doesn't just roll away. I'm making cardboard things to put on the sides over here so the ball doesn't roll away. Very cool. So what would, what would you say was the most challenging part of building? So games the most challenging up? part was actually the inside. The, there's actually a lot of ramps in there that make the ball go down to one of these holes. 
these three go to this one and these three go to this one. So there has to be like multiple ramps in there. Wow. And also I did get cut and burnt a lot. Okay. Well, I guess welcome to the club on, on that part. Um, we, I we, think it's actually the first time I've gotten burnt by a hot glue gun during this project. Okay. Well, <laughs> I, I guarantee you it will not be your last. So, yeah. <laughs> so thank you for presenting. Your, your game is, is another game that I've not seen. So I, I guess maybe it's just that since I'm having my students do games from home, yeah, there's, there's going to be a lot of different games out there. And, and one thing we talked about that if multiple kids wanted to build basketball games and multiple kids wanted to build uh, foosball games, that no game is going to look alike. So you could make a basketball game with one basket, you can make one with five baskets, um, and, and then you, it's always about how you launch the ball at those baskets, whether you do it through your hand or you make a launcher like Ariella. So Ariella, beautiful job. I, I can't wait to see the finished product. All right, so, so moving down the list, um, are any other students ready? Rebecca, are, would you like to present? You're currently muted. Uh, okay. So first, Rebecca, Rebecca, I would say first, tell us a little bit about yourself. I will say this, um, when you show things off with a virtual background, sometimes they don't come out. So it, it might even be better if you're, I mean, it, only if you're comfortable to turn the virtual background off. So that way we can see your game, unless you want to just talk about it, up to you. Okay. Um, uh, uh. I did uh, a simple game. It's a chess game. I want to add more, but I put prints, like I, I printed out chess pieces and I stuck them on cardboard and put a little toothpick under it. And I put holes in the cardboard so that I can it can stand up. Well, it, it sounds really interesting and I like your description because I, I was able to get a vivid picture of what that's actually going to look like because like, like I said with your virtual background on we can't see anything behind you so we, we can't see what you were trying to show us. Um, so so yeah, thank you for that. Um, I, I can't wait to see it. Um, it sounds like a wonderful idea. I, I'm glad next to me yeah but for some reason we're, we're unable to see it <laughs> I, I think it's the virtual background that's causing us not to be able to see it but up oh, there we go all right do you want are you able to tilt the camera towards it right. oh so you're pretty much already almost done can you hold yeah. up one of those pieces to the camera right, so that way you can see exactly how you made it so you so you printed out the pieces, put it over cardboard, and then you used a toothpick as the bottom so you could constantly, so you could easily put them in from place to place. Wow. That, that is also another first in, in the five years. So congratulations to you. I, I love the out of the box thinking, um, metaphorically speaking. Um, <laughs> and, and so yeah, very, very, very well done. Um, so, so moving down the list of uh, Victoria, I, I remember you said you wanted to share. Are, are you still wanting to? Um, sure. So, yeah. Okay, so I'm Victoria Iwanu, and today what I'm going to show you is my mini hockey cardboard project. So what I'm doing is in the middle, I'm putting the sign of NHL, and then up here, I'm going to fully put like bleachers and stuff as if it, they were like fans. Um, and then I got these like 3D goalie things. So I put those there, like, I don't know if you can see them. If you can see, it comes out. So that's that, it's drying up, but I have the scores. And then what I'm gonna be doing is I got these candle hockey sticks. Is I'm gonna make a hole in the middle of the in the cardboard, and we're gonna be able to move them. They're gonna be able to move because in the sides I'm gonna cut sticks in order for them to move. So it's gonna be like those games. I don't know how you call them, but 
with the ones that you move with your stick with the, the foosball, stick. like a foosball, foosball. stick. So like yeah, that. it's gonna be like that, but in a box and gonna have like fans and stuff like that. So that so you are making a table hockey game with goalies that act like the goalies from the foosball game that guard those little 3D nets. I, I love it. Um, I will say this, I've seen many hockey games in the five years, although I've never seen one that's gonna have stands in a bleacher and, and that all that cool stuff that you were talking about earlier. Um, so I, I really like that you're attacking the, the aesthetic part of the game and, and really making it look attractive and really gonna make it look like a cool game. Um, so I love the little nets. I, where, where don't, you said the sticks, the, um, the goalie sticks were candles? Yeah, they're candles. I just cut off the candle tip, as you can see. I can show you. They have, not this one, but they have little candles, like where you light the fire. I just cut them off. And they're going to be like little hockey sticks. Wow. That, that is very cool. Very cool. So that, that is another first. Um, so, so real quick um, to everybody else that is watching. Um, so yes, we are doing this project from home. As you can see, all the projects are start, starting to look a little different and, and they're all getting creative in their very own way. Um, now we didn't first start with this project, right guys? But does anyone remember what I made you guys do first before you started building your arcade game? What did you have to show me that you knew how to do first? Mia. That they show like six different ways to cut and connect cardboard. So yes, before, before I gave them the actual project, after we had it all planned out, their first project, they had to come up with six or eight creative ways to cut and connect cardboard and put them on a little board showing me that they, know, that they are pretty comfortable with cutting cardboard and they're able to make little tabs and slots and make walls stand up and use the little gusset supports and the flanges. Um, so, so does anyone have those boards next to them that they want to show off? Alex. I see your hand up. Um, I just wanted to present my project. I haven't done a lot. You wanted to present. Oh, uh, all right. So Alex, yeah, I'll, I'm going to let you go present. So okay. you, let's introduce yourself first. Tell us about the game you're making and then show us what you're My up. name is Alex Jaime. Um, I'm doing, my project is, it's a ski ball, but with a twist. It's, I'm calling it ski pool because um. You have to try to make it with a stick, like pool. And so far, um, I haven't done a lot. This is like the runway that you put the put, um, hit the ball. It's it's kind of slanted. I'm gonna make like some type of gusset supports, and then I'm gonna make it like only with one hole that you could make it. But it's gonna be hard. And once the ball drops in the hole, there's gonna be a button. And and the ball is gonna hit the button and it's gonna say like yes or woo, that type of stuff. That's, so, that's yeah. exciting. So so I, I'm glad you said that you're making a ski ball game with a twist, and then that goes back to the problem where what if multiple kids wanted to make the same game? And and, and you kind of just answered that question. You I basically I said give your game a twist that's gonna make it different. So instead of rolling the ball up the ramp, you're you're gonna Hit it like it's a pool ball. Yeah. I like it. I like it. Have you decided what you're going to make the stick out of yet or uh, what yeah. the ball is going to be? I don't know the ball, but my, um, my, what's it called? The stick, I'm going to get a paper towel roll and, and I made before. I don't have it anymore, but I'm going to make another one. I made a plate kind of things with the little part sticking out so just gonna attach it to the top and you're gonna hit it and sounds, yeah sounds like a plan okay I, i'm super excited for next week um all right mia i know you were dying to present I, we all see that that beautiful launcher sitting in front of you so so take us away <laughs> um so i have um the game here and it like you have to have the catapult and you have to slingshot it into one of the holes. And in the game, and then the balls would come and roll down here. 
And when you're not playing and like anymore, the I would put this little kind of like a door thing down so the balls don't come out anymore. I'm also gonna like cut out like slots right here because if you get if you don't if you miss the shot like here, it'll just it won't go anywhere. So I'm just gonna cut holes so it'll just go into the ball thing. <laughs> um so yeah, that's the game. You don't want to show them how it looks Mr. Savit, you're muted. I can't hear you. I'm sorry. <laughs> I will say that by, by looking at your game, you love using hot glue. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That that is that is a beautiful amount of hot glue there, which I, I guess there's nothing wrong with that. Um did you happen to burn yourself at all with any uh, any of that hot glue? Yeah, I did. Okay, but but not too bad, right? Yeah. Okay. So what were the hardest parts about this project for you? Um, to get the ramps inside of it to work because they're not all, because there's two ramps inside so it can go down and into the. Are you able to show us how one of the ramps work now? Or are you able to show us, can you launch the ball from your launcher and see if you can get it into one of the holes of your game? <laughs> no pressure. No, I can't. <laughs> no, no, I don't Okay, so you just you get the ball. Yeah, <laughs> all right, that works. So, so yeah, that 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 is awesome. Um, I, I love the launcher. The launcher works really good. Um, it, it's funny because right before we came to this room, that launcher wasn't even finished being built yet. Um, so um, I, I remember you came to class right before we were about to come over here, and that launcher wasn't even ready. And sure enough, 20 minutes later, there you go. And it, it looks like looks like you might still have some kinks to work out, but um, it looks good. It looks like a really cool looking launcher. So, so thank you for that. Um, were there any other, uh, Ariella, I see a hand up. I have the six ways to build the cardboard if you. Oh yeah. So yeah. Why don't you show off your six ways to, uh, cut and connect cardboard. So this was the pre-assignment that students had to demonstrate that they were comfortable and familiar with cutting and connecting cardboard. So, so for my first one, I actually made the slingshot that I'm using in my project because I wanted to test out if it would work before I made it for the project. Um, I made the flaps. I actually call it a sunflower because of the flaps. I like how you gave it your own name. The slots with the X, there's two and it's slot. And these are the flaps, so it makes the wall stand up stronger. And this one I used for some of the corners of my project. It makes it be like a stronger corner because they won't like fold in. It has a piece of cardboard, so it won't. And then I made a wall, a way to stand up a wall by using an extra piece of cardboard just for extra support. So, so boom, that, that is perfection. Um, so thank you for presenting that and showing that off to the class. Um, before we finish, there was one student, Harry. Um, I, I wanted to ask you, because I remember last class you were talking about um, adding all your special electronics and lighting. Um, did you want to quickly share with um, the whole world um, what, what kind of game you are building, or are we there yet? Um, I'm building a pinball machine, and when the ball goes in, I want to try to make a lighting effect that would light it up when you score or make a scoreboard. Gotcha. Did you figure out what you would use to make the lighting effect? Um, yes, I'm planning to stick on the bottom of it a Raspberry Pi to code lighting to turn on with a sensor um, when you shoot the ball up. Awesome. So for, for those that are listening in, Harry is one um, exceptional student that is already very familiar with um, coding and circuitry. So he wanted to um, go all out and add lights and buzzers and sounds to his game. So of course I said yes. Um, and then I guess that's one of the differences in doing this project at home and in school because 
um, in the years past when we did this project at school, um, there was always a lesson on how to add the electronic component to your game. Um, and in the past, we did that with the little bits. Um, those are those little snap together circuits that um, you create a circuit and students were making scoreboards and buzzers and ringing sounds. And, and so, yeah, the electronic component is always um, fun to add to the game, but I, I kind of like, I kind of like um, our bare bones games. Um, so yes, um, that I believe we are running out. Okay, with your hand up, go for it. Yeah, you're dancing. Share with us. Me? Yep. Um, wait, we're allowed to use technology? <laughs> so, so yeah, um, remember, this is your game. I'm not going to say don't add anything to it. Oh, my God, that would have been so much easier to make a slingshot. It, it just wasn't, I wasn't teaching the Like, I could have used, like, some sort of type of more odor. Or, since I remember last year, I was doing, like, this type of science project. So, yeah, and I, I used this, I forgot the name of it. And you see it went around and I think I, and I went on, am I allowed to use that? I, so I, I can put it on the side, connect it to the cardboard and then it can turn. I, I'm going to say yes. <laughs> okay. I, I really say no. So, so I would say give it a shot and, and let me know how it is. Um, so, for my class, that, that concludes our time. I know our projects are due next week. So if there are any questions um, from now till next week, don't hesitate to email me. But at this time, you guys are free to leave. I, I thank you guys so much, uh, so much for joining in on this presentation and um, having the guts to pretty much show the whole entire world um, what project you are doing. Yes, I, I believe we are in the hundreds of thousands of people watching right now. Um, so, so thank you very much for coming and, and having the guts to share your ideas with everybody. Um, so you guys are free to leave. Um, up next, I believe, is Ronell. So, so Ms. Donnelly, I'm going to let you take over. Thank you for letting me present. Um, it's great to see you again. Um, and next year, yeah, don't ever, don't ever hesitate to ask again. <laughs> we're so thankful. Let me tell you, those projects were phenomenal. I'm like, that. who, who would ever think to make them boxing with Street Fighter, um, that was that was clever. There was some great problem solving strategy going on, and lots of apparently what you said is a uh, lots of burns from those glue guns. So hopefully, hopefully everybody recovers after making their projects. But it looks awesome. Thank you, class. You guys did an awesome, awesome job. Very good. Bye. Bye. Have a good day. Bye. Bye. All right, we have our next presenter joining us all the way from New Zealand, and that is Bruce and Ronell are going to be sharing out from Kai's clan. Um, you guys just get ready. It's so fun. You're going to love them. Um, and they're going to be sharing out about robotics, AI, AR, VR, every uh, acronym out there. They do it. Um, and so I'm excited for them to be able to share this next 30 minutes. Uh, how are you doing, Ronell? Oh, <laughs> we are doing awesome, awesome here in New Zealand. Tell me what time it is for you. Uh, seven o'clock, seven o'clock in the morning. Perfect. You guys are ready for your day. You're going to accomplish a lot right off the bat. And I'll be here in the background. Just feel free to let me know if you have any questions. Thank you. Thanks very much, Jamie. Um, good morning, everybody. Oh, this is so awesome to be here. Um, and we've got an exciting 30 minutes ahead of us. So what we're going to do, we have got Bruce, the founder. He's just busy getting a few things right for us and ready. And what we're going to do, we're going to transport you to Mars this morning. So we're really, really excited. So um, just like two cents of Kai's clan, is a coding platform, but it's got it's a STEM toolbox. So we have got augmented reality, we have got virtual reality, we've got collaboration. So you can actually code your robots from anywhere in the world. We use sensors, and we're going to have a, we've got a nice surprise today. And we use robot avatars, and that is so awesome. So you can actually take Minecraft or Tinkercad or Google Poly, create your own robot avatar. 
And then whenever you code, where you code your robot to go, that is actually where your avatar will go. So this is Kai, say good morning, using QR codes. See these two little port sensors? We're going to play around with those. So we've got a lot of things that we're going to do. So I'm going to cross over now to Bruce. And Bruce is going to show you what we've got to plan all the way from New Zealand, uh, sort of to Mars. Right, we're going to cross over. Hold on, share my screen. Okay, let's look how technology all goes. Yep. Uh, good morning, makers. Do you like my sh my T-shirt? Maker expert. Yeah, I love three D printing, laser cutting, everything. I've got an LED mask over there. I've made so much stuff in my life. I've hacked my own car for self driving. I love technology. So let's get started. So what we're going to do today is I've got Nick the stick. Uh, my family friend has been in the family for seven years, and the soil is really really dry. So what we want to do is we want to water the plant um, using Kai robots, and then we're going to represent that data in virtual reality. So if you see the virtual, the virtual view of the, the mat, uh, you can see the virtual view down here. So hopefully Renal is showing you the augmented view, and you will see the ice on Mars, and we're going to be melting that ice and then we're going to be using that water, that virtual ice, to water our physical plant with Kai. So let's get set up. Let's see what we need. So over here, I've got my tub of water, which is my Martian ice that I extracted earlier. I've got a water pump that comes with Kai's plan. And I've got a little uh, circuit board that we take out of the Kai robot. So I'm going to use that. I've got a little Kai robot here. And we're going to plug in a soil moisture sensor. So this is going to sense how much moisture is in the soil. Now, if you know about um, air humidity, that's how much uh, moisture is in the air. Well, we're going to be measuring how much moisture is in the soil. Are so you going to stick that straight into Nick the stick? Well, first I stick it into Kai, and then I'll stick it into Nick. So let's place that in there. Good and proper. So we just oh, he looks very dry. It's very dry in there. Right. So next thing is just plug in our sensor for um, the water pump. So this is a submersible water pump. So we just stick that in there. Let's take our water over to our plant. This could go wrong. We could like water the electronics, which is not healthy. Okay, we'll just balance that up there. We'll put our water in there. So do it over here. Okay, so we're fully loaded, we're ready to go. Now, um, oh, let me just, oh, there we go. Now we need to monitor this. Okay, so let's get coding. And let's see the, the data, how, how dry the soil is. Right. So Nick the stick is ready, he's got the robot that's got the moisture center, he's got a robot, well he's got the inside of the robot, ready with a water pump, and then we're going to jump over, that's our physical match, you can see some augmented reality, we're going to add some robot avatars, and let's see if we can actually, with I reckon two or three lines of code, make that water pump activated. So, lots happening here. So, let's see how is Bruce doing. Yeah, I'm just switching over. So, um, I'm just doing this. So, let me create a new share so you can see my screen. So share screen. Da -da -da. So, Kai's clan can be used on your Chromebook or on your laptop, iPad anywhere that you can then use. So we're going to cross over and have a quick look. Here you'll see Bruce is just loading. 
um, Kai Clan. All the robots said good morning, Bruce. And we are just about to cross over to Mars. I think yeah. we'll have to do a countdown. 10, 9, oh. 8. Pressure, pressure, pressure. Seven, ready for liftoff. See, there's our rocket. The rocket's right there, ready, waiting. Oh, everything's happening. Five. Sorry, we can take a little pause in between our rocket launch. Four, three, two. Okay, okay, okay. Here we go. So we can cross over and lift off. Okay, so here we go. We've got um, a few robots um, with Kai's clan. And um, uh, here we go. So we can see robot one has got the moisture sensor in Nick the Stick. So uh, this means that the soil moisture is only sitting at 8%. It's very, very dry. It's going up a little bit. And we're going to then use robot 10, which has got our water pump, and that's going to water the plant. So let's do some uh, basic coding. Well, it's a little bit advanced, but I know you guys can keep up. Right, so first of all, we need some logic. We'll just put a couple of logic blocks in there. So you know logic, if this, then that. So if it's greater or less than this, then uh, do something. So what we need to do is we need to sense what the moisture level is in the plant. So we're going to use an environmental sensor, which we already plugged into the robot earlier on. So here's the moisture sensor. So robot one, and if that is smaller than, so we're going to say 30%. Uh, so currently the soil moisture is sitting at 9%. And we need to know, uh, we want to get a notification uh, when this happens. So we're going to play a little tune, bing, bada, bong, maybe the Simpsons uh, on robot one, when the soil, when we have this true condition. And then uh, the next thing is we need to do um, turn on the water pump. So the water pump is on robot 10. So here we can see the relay is off. And we want to turn on the water pump when this condition is met. Now don't flood, don't flood him. We've got a lot of electronics in that uh, Nick the Sticks uh, pot plant. So uh, what else do we need, Renelle? Well, I think we should test that first and see if it's going to work. That's a good idea. Okay, so let's... But don't we do a print block? Isn't that what we usually try and make sure students can monitor what they are doing? Yeah, that's a good idea. So what we could do is then we could print the value of the sensor so we know what it is. That's so good. So we've got a good record of it. Now, with this data, uh, we can also, later on, we could actually make a graph and, and actually analyze the soil. So if you're doing like a water and garden, you know, self-water and garden, um, it's a fantastic thing. Okay, so let's run the code. And, oh, there we go. The condition is met. And uh, Renelle, you should have the camera and be showing the watering of the plant because I think we're flooding it. Okay, so you can see the moisture level has gone up now. And if we switch to the camera, um, so, yep, so it's constantly printing the log here, and I'll switch quickly to the camera, and then you can see the iPad screen. There we go. You join, slide it down, Renal. Okay. If you join, slide it down, Renal. Okay, just a little bit of a technology. Okay, so there you go. So um, just click in the, the, the camera window for now. Yes. Okay, so here you can see, um, I don't know, can we see any water there? Oh, the water is empty. It didn't take all the water. Oh, okay. finish all the water. Okay, we're going to have to top that up. So what's happened there, it's emptied all the water and um, we've watered the plant. So I'll switch back now. And we can have a look at my screen. Switch back. It's like okay. I've done that. So here we go. So let's see what the water level is now. So it's sitting at 39%. Uh, so we're going to increase this to say 50% for our next line of code. 
And now we want to do um, affect the virtual world with our physical data. So um, let's uh, let's do that. Uh, so what we want to do is go into sandbox. Actually, uh, we'll start up our virtual viewer. All right, let's have a look here. Oh, this is going to be lots of fun. So this is where you can use Minecraft and Tinkercad, and you can go and create your different characters. So we've already got a few things. So we sort of figured out, well, water sort of comes from ice. So we're going to allocate one of our objects as ice, an iceberg on Mars. We have got a plant. So that is um, our Nick the stick that's sitting on Mars. So what I'm going to be doing now is I'm allocating uh, 3D models uh, that we've designed earlier and putting them onto onto the physical mat as virtual um, characters. So uh, what's 100? 100 is the pot plant. So 100 is a pot plant. Um, so that's going to be that. So you can see these characters coming in. So you could use Minecraft or Tinkercad. Uh, robot 4 is, what's Robot 4, Renel? Robot 4 is um, red. Oh, oh, this is, who's this? Oh, this is my favorite game at the moment. Um, if, if you know what game this character is from, you put it should in the chat. put it in the chat. I love this game. Okay, uh, next is... Have we got every, all the other characters? We have also got um, um, R2D2. How can you forget my favorite game? Oh, uh, okay. Well, my favorite movies of all time, Star Wars. We have to use R2D2. Yes, even in New Zealand down yonder, we get Star Wars <laughs> far in the land, far, far away. It feels like living in New Zealand feels like living in Mars because we're so far away from you guys. Okay, so we've got all our virtual characters. And now what I want to do is I want to melt the ice because we're extracting water from our Mars. So we're extracting water from that tub of water and we're going to, we're going to um, extract the, the ice uh, but, and make it smaller. But I think because we can do multiplayer gaming animations, effects and everything, why don't we grow that iceberg first and make it a monster iceberg. Oh, I can do that. I can do that. Here we go. 500% of KP. Yep. X, Y, Z. We work with mats. We do coordinates on our mats. So lots of different. Okay. That iceberg is now huge. Look at it. Okay. Maybe, well, okay. maybe that's a bit huge. But no, okay. That, we can do okay. this. Right. And what's next? Um, so now we want to put back our code. And no, no, I've got another idea. You haven't played with the effects. Why don't we put some ice on the iceberg? Ah, okay, okay. Right. Um, we can do all sorts of, we can play effects. So we're going to add some ice to the iceberg. So there's ice. Yeah. Oh, that's easy. Okay. And so that's on. Uh, 101 is our ice. When it's so fixed. you see these, um, each one of these characters have an, a unique ID. And on the mat, we've got these QR codes. You might have seen it. We'll show it to you again later. Uh, but on the mat, we've, each one has got its own unique QR code. And then you can move these QR codes around, or they're attached to the robots as well. So what about some speech? I think when it's starting to melt, it would be really good to say, yeah, there's our ice effect. Ice okay, is melting. So, OK, that's a good idea. OK, so but we need to bring in our main code now then. So let's put that into our loop. So let's just go through this and understand it. So we're going to print robot one soil moisture percent to the log, which is which is in this log here. Then we're going to say if the soil moisture is less than uh, fifty percent, then we're going to play a buzzer to notify us that the plant's watering, and then we're going to water the plant. And this loop will continue around and around and around. OK, so what do we need to do now? So we want a speech bubble to say that the ice is melting. OK, so we'll put the speech bubble in here. Mars ice melting. 
And then we need to see, can we grow the plant? Our virtual Nicholas stick. Oh, so, so we want we the plant to get bigger as we watering it. Yeah, I guess that makes sense. Okay, so then we want to, so the plant is 100 and we want to make that bigger. So we'll make that 200%. I oh. would be careful. I would go 100, 100, 200. Otherwise, you know, if you do it on the X and the Y, going to be a fat plant ah oh, true so we're going to make the plant grow we're gonna taller we're going to stretch it up stretch it up well maybe be as tall as me because i'm pretty tall yeah and okay. what's next um let's put some emojis i would love to see an emoji on the plant come on give him some happiness so this is the cool thing with kai's clan it's it's a stem toolbox you know so you can like you can really mishmatch and put a whole lot of technology all into one package and, and you just choose what you want to use. Okay, so I think that's it. And now, why don't we get some uh, robot action? So let's move these robots around. Um, so after it's finished, we then gonna, let's get rid of that code. We then gonna move robots. So what are the robot numbers we've got here? We've got robot number four. And let's duplicate that and say robot number eight. And you can see on our mat here, we get an overview map view in the browser. So what I can say is, okay, robot four, I want you to go and check out the pot plant. So robot four is going to be going to, let's see, uh, 29. So we're using coordinates here. So it's great for mathematics. And then robot eight, we want him to go and check out the ice. So he's going to go to 67.53, 67.53. And I think, I think we're about ready. So let's check the moisture level. The moisture level in Nick the Stick is 36%. Um, yeah, um, give a big shout out to Nick. He needs your support so shout out on the tonight. chat. Okay, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen. I'm just about to click run. And we're going to switch over to the iPad. So just one moment. Okay. Yeah, have you connected right now? Slide it down to connect. Just okay. Slide it down to connect. And then touch the screen. And again, yeah. And water pump. Okay, here's the water pump. Um, so I'm about to click run. So let's click run now. And hopefully we get to see the code running um what's what's happened um oh my code's got a bug in it um so if oh okay let's see okay there we go so just go over to the water pump so there's the ice has got smaller has, is it watering right now? Uh, no. No, you want to stop the code and just check it? Let's check it again. Uh, okay. Uh, Houston? Houston, we have a problem. <laughs> This is when the astronauts jump out and go and check if there's anything outside. Maybe we are burning up. Okay, I think we are right. Right, astronaut coming back inside. Okay, uh, I checked the Martian soil and it's still dry. So we still got 36%. We're waiting for, um, can you turn on our tracker? And then system should be go. Whoops, systems, uh, here we go. Right, here we go. Is the water pump on? Not yet. The water pump should be pumping. What's the value? Oh, yeah, the water pump 10. Oh, 
this is the this is what happens uh, when you do uh, live tests. <laughs> It's okay. Let's try that again. It's buzzing to notify the pump's running. There we go. And it's pumping water. Yes, yes. Here we go. Woo! Oh, yeah. the plant has grown. Yep. And there's our emojis. And there goes our robot. So you can see the robot, little robot avatars is following him. So you, yeah, you can see the robot avatars following the robot. So wherever the robot moves, the, the Minecraft or the, you know, your Tinkercad avatar can, can be following. So this is going to carry on pumping water until we get to 50% or run out of water. And we've probably run out of water, have we? Correct. Uh, we've run out of water. <laughs> we've, we've melted all the ice on Mars. So, yeah, so, you know, that's very quick um, demonstration of what Kai's clan is. So... Let's just uh, stop that share. Oh, actually, um, yeah, cool. Okay, so, um, right, any questions? Yeah, can you guys hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you, yes. Awesome, okay. Um, I would love for you to show the virtual aspect of it too. And maybe um, if you want to put out a link on our chat of that virtual, do you have a virtual view to be able to share for people to go and see the scene themselves? Yeah, yeah. Let me set that up for you. Um, here we go. So what you'll, what you'll find when you guys see this is that you can look at this scene that they're making right now and actually experience it um, in a, a virtual desktop situation on your computer and to be able to look around and explore on your own, which is really cool. So okay. as I was setting this up, um, I will just share mm -hmm. that all of us recognize that Bruce got his coffee today. And all of us are- <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I want some more coffee. We need that New Zealand coffee. We need it. <laughs> yeah. Um, so you should be able to- um, yeah, I'm, just, I'm just getting the share link. Um, and then I'll share it out as Global Maker on social media, on Twitter. That's and a good idea. In our Padlet. So if anybody wants to click in there, if you could just keep it active for a little while and they can see the scene. Uh, yeah, yeah, totally. And maybe Thank you me. can screen share your, your screen when you're done and show us kind of how they navigate that space and to look at it. Yeah, okay. Well, it's quite easy. So, um, okay. Um, just getting getting to that uh, thing. Um, where's your email? I'll just, doing that. I'll just say, I just threw out, you know, hey, can you guys accomplish all of this right now? But I do love the fact that if you are remote and you're learning remote, that this is still something that you can see and explore together and um, not be stuck to the physical mat and the physical robot sitting there, but instead be able to see that actually digitally happening and the movements and um, all the code come to life, which is really exciting. And when okay. I get for other people to check out and then maybe at some point you can show us. Yeah, we're just trying to share that code. Um, but, you know, Bruce designed this awesome system <laughs> and has got all these um, questions that we need to ask. So it's like saying, you know, where's walkways, where's robots, where's everything um, that we tried to verify. Okay, okay but um, Bruce is just going to log on quickly. But if people go, they can sort of get the Kai's, um, I, I'm sorry, the Kai's AR VR viewer. Yes. Um, which is on either iOS or um, Android. And then once they've got that, then they can, sorry, I'm just trying to get rid of this. Absolutely. Actually... And that, that, that viewer could be done on a mobile device, but the class, um, the virtual viewer, not virtual reality per se, but the virtual viewer that's available, um, 
when you had showed us kind of the desktop version of seeing that scene come to life and that they can explore it, um, that link would be awesome. So even if they're on a computer and they're not downloading device, uh, downloading apps. Yeah. Be, yeah. Yeah. Bruce is on his computer. He's just trying to get that link as well. So as soon as we've got that, then he will, somehow it's just not coming through to the um, email. You caught me on the fly, Jamie. Um, I just need to get that. Hey, that's what we do with Maker. We just, we roll with it, right? You okay, had- but we'll, we'll try and get that. But is there any questions? Oh, okay, here we go. Here we go. Um, okay, he's got it. You're gonna put it in Slack for me? Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Yeah, Ooh, and this is so what we see is a lot of conversations happening on Twitter, and we actually don't have attendees in here in the Zoom. They're just watching live on the website, so they're able then to add any questions if they have any on the website. So if you guys have any questions for Kai's clan, which you might feel a little bit overwhelmed right now, you might say, well, this is this is nuts. Um, how, what's what's going on here? So feel free to put in the comments, uh, or excuse me, in the questions on our website. You can do that at globalmakerday.com in the Padlet. And then um, we'll also post inside of there under uh, general comments. We'll post the link when that's done. Oh, perfect. So- Here's the link. I've posted it to everyone. All right, let me go ahead and see. So once they link to that, they'll be able to see what's happening in our virtual world. Um, and then I can uh, I can run the code again. Um, yeah, let me get this on my browser here. And what I'll do is one that populates, Bruce, is all screen share if that's okay. What's that? Once it populates on my browser, I can screen share and show what this looks yeah, like. Yeah. Perfect. So you got it up? Okay, I, I have it on my screen and I'm gonna go ahead and screen share and you can walk me through what what to look at here. Okay, there we go. So I used that link that you just sent me and we'll definitely add that in. Okay. So can, um, there's a mute button at the bottom there. Um, and uh, we'll just, uh, let me just run the code again. So from my side, um, let's go. So this is uh, cool. So um, all those Mars rovers you see there, those are sitting on uh, on my mat in New Zealand. And those are physical, uh, physical robots. If Renell moves one of the robots around, uh, let's say robot four, um, she moves that robot four around. If you keep still, Jamie, there we go. You'll see robot four is moving around. So we tie the virtual with the physical. If you imagine it's like a ham sandwich, the, the bread is our physical mat on the floor and the ham is our virtual layer sitting on top of that. So uh, when we do that, and if I um, allocate these uh, robots uh, to each I'm gonna one. Go screen sharing here. And I'm going to put that into our general comments right here inside of our Padlet so that um, people can look. And I'm going to place this link here. So under general comments, if you guys are interested in looking at this live yourself, you can go ahead and click on there. I clicked on in Safari and it wasn't too thrilled about that but it seems to be completely fine with, um, with Chrome. Yeah, Chrome, uh, Edge or uh, Firefox, um, that's good. Safari uh, doesn't like 3D stuff too much. <laughs> Go figure. This is great. Do you guys see all the characters that were being built? When yeah, were so I'm just populating those. So you can like import them from Minecraft and then attach them to the physical robots. And um, yeah, so if I run the code now, um, let's see, uh, here we go. Mars ice is melting. And it's, it's quite cool because what we're doing is we're actually um, using real physical data, uh, you know, from our plant and the watering uh, and then making those things uh, be affected in the virtual world. So if you imagine our Amazon warehouse, 
uh, when they're controlling the robots to go and pick parcels, they're not just sitting watching the robots and you know using their thumbs to control the robots to go and pick parcels. They're sitting in a control room, which is virtual representation of where all their robots are. So this is you know this is like a, a real life uh, scenario, and. The cool thing about um, Kai's plan, it's it's really good for hybrid learning because you can be sitting, you can control. Jamie, I could get you to log in and you know you can then control a robot sitting in New Zealand. Hello? I think Jamie is saying something, but it's just frozen for the moment. Hopefully it's not me. No. All right. Okay, we can so, now hear you. Um, Oh, it might be me frozen. We can hear you. We just don't see you moving. Yeah. So um, has anyone got any questions about Kai's plan while we wait for Jamie's Mars connection to come back? <laughs> we must be behind the sun. So that's why we just didn't get that signal. It takes about 20 minutes to get to Mars. Are you back, Jamie? Okay. Welcome back. I mean, I don't understand why I'm, my internet's shutting down when I'm running a computer here, a computer here, and uh, phone, Twitter, everything else, right? It just couldn't take it anymore. Maybe some Martians. Sorry, we might have sent you some Martians. We've got a solar flare <laughs> coming in. Did you send me virtual Martians, Bruce? Thanks a lot. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm going to thank you guys so much for sharing and joining in today and definitely let them know how to get in touch with you. If it's something that they're learning more, want to learn more about. Hashtag cause plan. Perfect. Awesome. Well, everybody that's making right now, this is your opportunity to take that to the next level with robotics, coding, um, artificial intelligence, uh, augmented reality, virtual reality, all of it. So very cool. Thank you guys again for joining in. And we're going to go ahead and transition over to Katie. And I'm so pumped. Thank you guys. Cheers. Cheers See ya. Bye. See ya. Bye. -bye. <laughs> all right. <laughs> <laughs> Katie, I see you here in the background. Oh my gosh. Um, I am not going to lie. I'm so excited about your cookie, no bake cookies here. This has been something that was actually an organizer request session. We all agreed that we needed to have a session with, uh, with cooking without cooking. So here we go. You're going to. This is one of the perks of being calm. So I definitely couldn't just like whip up some cookies in my library. I would love to do that because then I could share them. But now I guess I'm kind of going to love eating them all myself. I might have to share with my boys, but okay. I, I need to make that happen. Okay, so what I've done here, I've got, I'm gonna have to like adjust. I'm just worried about what we're gonna see. So I've got everything like laid out. Okay, we'll come over here first. And make sure you have your ingredients. Okay, so we've got oatmeal rocking, cocoa, because everything's better with chocolate. Um, Coconut, vanilla, sugar, butter, I need milk. Milk is still in the fridge though because you don't want it to go bad. I'm in California, it's still kind of hot right here. But having those ingredients aren't enough without the magical thing. It's no bake, but they need to set up somewhere. So this is the awesome sauce. If you don't have wax paper, no bake cookies just absolutely are not going to happen. So let's go ahead and start here. Some bacon. So oatmeal first. Three cups. I got this all here ready. Rock and roll. Okay, one, two, four, three, and then half a cup of coconut. And I love coconut, so I just measure it kind of over the bowl. So while there's a science with baking, but we're not baking, um, it's okay to go a little bit over and then see it explode in there. I'm okay. Okay, then it doesn't get on the counter. So nothing's being wasted. It's all going to get in my belly. Okay, so I've got that and three tablespoons of cocoa. And that's the big guy, tablespoons, not teaspoon. They'll be disappointed. Okay, and it's a lot of it. So we got one, two, four, and three. And so like we're getting the recipe at the beginning. And so like on the blog, you get the story at the beginning. So while this has to do some magic, I'll do some of the blogging part, tell you some background about it. 
Okay, so I got that in my big bowl. I know I had to mix up that awesomeness just so it's ready. I don't forget because this becomes a very, very time sensitive creation. So I just got those three things in here, the three cups of oatmeal, half cup of coconut, and three tablespoons of cocoa powder. Okay, that's in here. Now I got my pot. A stick of margarine. Stick that all in there. I'm looking back at my recipe because I can't keep it all in my head. So it's always good to write down good recipes. And two cups of sugar. And I'll just like not even think about what two cups of sugar means. It means it's um, less sugar than goes into fudge, which we can bake together later. That's also like no bake, it's all stove top. Okay, two cups of sugar. And now I need my milk. So different measuring thing because it's liquid. Liquid means the glass. Don't cheat, it makes a difference. Okay, so on the counter, grabbing my milk. And also when you're measuring liquids, you can't like do it up above. You gotta look at it eye level, but you can't like hold it in the air because it's not level. So I'm gonna put my measuring cup on a level surface. It is on a level surface, promise. And then I'm gonna look at it. First, I'm gonna find my mark what really is half on this particular measuring cup. And then pour, staying kind of level. So see, like I'm getting exercise in, I'm squatting so I can eat more cookies. Okay, so about half a cup of milk. Dumping that in here and I need a tablespoon of vanilla. And if, if you have like the fancy, like real vanilla, you will notice that it tastes different. But you know, if there's reasons why that just doesn't work out, the um, imitation vanilla still makes it taste yummy. Just don't skip the vanilla. Okay, I gotta turn this stuff on. Careful, I don't want my computer to get too hot. Watching my flame. Come on, there we go. And it's gonna have to boil, so. I also need to stir this stuff because this is chemistry happening right now. So I got in here my stick of margarine, two cups of sugar, half a cup of milk, and one tablespoon of vanilla. And we're mixing it. It'll dissolve really quickly. And anytime you heat up sugar and butter, you know you're on the pathway to some super yummy stuff. Okay, while that's getting extra warm. Okay, I first learned about these cookies when I was in high school. And the recipe that was given, I didn't like it so much because I wanted those weird people. I love peanut butter, but I don't like peanut butter in my cookies. So the first no bake recipe had peanut butter and I'm like, no, we can make this better. So I already started like crafting and, some, and that's a stage of making too when you take something that someone else has done and you tweak it and make it your own. You don't have to start everything from scratch, scratch. And how would you really start from scratch? Is that like, you think about it and poof, it just exists in the air. I don't know, I didn't think about that. The other thing about cookies is a lot of people like them. So there's been times where like I had no money and I gave everyone cookies for Christmas present. And the next year I got a job, I was so proud of myself. And I got everyone a present that I bought. And you know what? Everyone was disappointed. They're like, where's the cookies? So <laughs> I go back to make more. You just need to know like who you're making your goodies for. So like I have friends who need to be gluten-free for like various reasons. So sometimes the cookies don't work out. This cookie would though, because it is gluten-free. Fudge is also gluten-free. So knowing about any food allergies, if there's nut issues. Okay, this is just about getting ready to start boiling. And then when it boils too, it has to boil for exactly three minutes. You can't speed it up. If you're like, okay, it's hot. One minute, done, let's go. Nope, it won't work. You'll have like this crumbly mess. 
which the crumbles are still yummy. Then it's like you made trail mix. So you just like throw in some cranberries and almonds and you'll have a trail mix, but you won't have cookies. They won't be able to form. So stirring, do we have any questions rocking out there? We're all just really hungry. <laughs> I would so love for you guys just to be here. And um, my husband's already chopping up the bit. He's like, when are you gonna be done? Because I need to get the, the meat on the smoker. So one year we will be here and my husband will make us like a fabulous, probably tri-tip, we'll smoke a tri-tip, we'll have some uh -oh. cookies, all that jazz. You know what, here in Texas, so we love tri-tip. And uh, that's probably our favorite meal, honestly, here. And in, in Texas, you can't find it. Nobody knows what tri-tip is. California, that's like the thing. And so we found this one place that does like all these cuts. It's like a butcher shop. And they do tri-tip. They, they sell tri-tip. But boy, it's like the hidden jewel. When people start finding out about it, it's like gone, you know. But mm -hmm. let me tell you, I love me some tri-tip. I do have a question about um, the baking aspect of it, uh, or excuse me, the cookie, like how you're cooking it on the stovetop. Well, you said there was some active ingredients that were stirring that were kind of allowing this. Is that essentially what you're doing when you're putting it in the oven? It's a little bit different. So with the oven, it's, it's still chemistry either way, but the oven, your measurements have to be super, super precise. If anything is like a little bit off, it's going to come out different. Even um, your difference of if you use brown sugar or white sugar, it'll make the cookie different. They have different um, chemical structures and so that will make your cookie turn out different. Similarly, if you take the same recipe, this could be a cool science fair project. Take the same yeah. cookie recipe, make one with butter, make one with margarine, make one with Crisco. They will all look and taste different. Well, I think right now, speaking of science, my husband, I think his class is watching us right now and he's a science classroom. So he's a seventh grade science teacher here in Texas. And uh, he said, well, I don't think I can join Global Maker Day. It's not part of my standards. I'm like, what? everything's part of your standards. This is what kids need to be doing, trust me. But you know, it's funny just to think about, you know, the, the connection to everything that we're doing and making and how, how important it is for our kids to have these skills in order to learn and grow and, and to flourish in any career that they would have. So how is it looking so far? It just started boiling, so I'm super happy setting my timer because I don't have a lot of patience. Anyone tuning in, you know that about me, so I use timers like crazy. So let's see what this looks like. Okay, so now it's boiling. You got that magic rocking. That's when you know it's boiling. You just let it keep doing its thing. It has to be that full three minutes, and we want to stir it sporadically. And I've got um, a Teflon pot, so I'm making sure to use a plastic spoon. If you get one of those middle spoons, someone's going to yell at you and it might be me and that would not be good. Middle spoons would mess up this pot. Okay, so stirring it and watching my time. Now we've got two minutes and 20 seconds. I don't have my wax paper out. I gotta have that already. So I'm gonna scooch all this back out of my way and laying out that wax paper. That's that magical part. So it's not going on the cookie tray. It's going to go on this wax paper. I don't know, maybe there really is a difference on which side, but I've never paid attention to that. So we're just rolling it out and sticking it here on the counter, ready to go. I have to move my recipe because I don't want it messier. I kind of like looking at my old recipes. It tells a history when they're like handwritten, you know, how old it is. And that kind of stuff just kind of warms my heart. But I've also made sure to do, oh, I keep stirring, got to talk and stir. Okay, I have my big bowl still right here. So since it's super time sensitive, I have all of this stuff close to each other. I got my pot with that boil action. This is what's going to make the cookie form together. And I have my bowl with that well in it from when we stirred it earlier. So I am pour into that and then my wax paper, bam. So it's an assembly line here rocking as well. Okay, we're down to one minute. 
like, oh, I'm nervous because, okay, sometimes even though I follow the directions because I can read, it's real important to read. Okay, they can make anything following a recipe. Okay, sometimes even when I do follow the recipe, I get that crumbly stuff like that granola I was talking about earlier. It's still yummy. So I'm crossing my fingers, this works out. Otherwise, we'll have to try again. But then, you know, the benefit of trying again, I would have granola, plus I'd have cookies. <laughs> and sometimes my boys will put that granola in their cereal. It works. Okay, 25 seconds. Like getting excited, nervous, like how's it going to turn out? Okay, 15, are we on the countdown? Okay, watching it and still stirring because it'll stick and if it sticks, oh, you don't want the butter to burn. So that's why too, you keep stirring. Even though my hand's getting a little warm, burnt butter will make any cookie taste nasty. <gasps> there we go. Okay, turn that off because I don't like the sound. Getting my flame off for safety too. Get that off, off, come on, I told you to go off. Okay, putting this on my wax paper because it's going to be really messy, out of the way. Dumping it all in here. See the steam? Woo! Okay, and it's time sensitive, so we're stirring fast, fast, fast. Stirring, mixing it all the way in. It has to be completely covered with that boil goodness. So stirring. And the oatmeal is what I watch here to make sure it's covered since um, the oatmeal being a lighter color, I can notice it better when it's mixed well. And I have the two spoons over here on the side because I don't want to touch this with my finger as I'm dolloping it onto my wax paper and I already made a little bit of mess, that's okay. I'm going to go fast so I got a heap on a spoon using the other spoon to get it off because I don't like to burn myself. Making sometimes I get burned like with the iron or a glue stick, not a glue stick. Glue sticks would never burn me. Hot glue gun. That when I'm baking or doing no bake, this stuff's pretty hot. It was boiling for three minutes. Oh, science teacher, how hot does something have to be to boil? Oh. Okay, PJ, you know? Uh, I'm hearing 210. I don't know, I can't confirm right now if that's right. We'll go with it. Okay, getting this out. Ooh, and sometimes I kind of like count of thinking, okay, these are looking pretty awesome. How many can I sneak away and have just for myself? And I live in a house to go away. So sometimes that's what I have to do because I will eat like one today and then one later and one the next day. And my boys will come in here and eat like all of them in a fraction of the day. I'm gonna eat the rest of this. all of it out and if it doesn't all go in the little dollops we're making that's okay don't don't miss with trying to collect it on the wax paper because that's time and if you try to use what's fallen separately on the wax paper then you won't have enough time to keep dropping the other ones okay get one more cookie i'm like oh, do i want to get one more cookie or do i want to just eat what's in the bowl because the stuff I'm putting on the wax paper, you gotta wait for it to set up. You can't just eat it yet. You gotta be patient again. So see, ooh. And you'll be able to tell when they're ready to go because they'll lose some of the glossiness. And it's a little bit of a mess. So I can, let's go ahead and taste that. There's a little bit. Is that yummy? Oh my goodness, that is so good. Okay, so sometimes I'll do that. Oh. I don't think I shared this. I had to do a couple of things before we started that are also super important. Like having all your ingredients is good. But see, I'm like, trying to make another cookie. If I had not done a very important step, that would be super gross. And no one would want that cookie. Now I make sure you wash your hands. Super important, even if you're just making for your family because like we touch all kinds of things throughout the day and it gets kind of gross. And I have long hair. So I made sure my hair was pulled back because no one wants a big old strand of hair or even a short little strand of hair in their cookie. So, bam, those are setting up. I think there's enough for me to get some and my boys to have some, so it's a good day.
Okay, what about the team? How are we supposed to get some? Well, um, you're welcome to come over. We'll have like a party in the front yard. <laughs> I'll give you some greens. How long, how long are you waiting till they cool down? It really just depends on a lot of things. So the temperature even makes a difference. Okay, so the, I just want to talk to your husband right now so bad. It's like, there's so much science in this because elevation is a factor. Your outside temperature is a factor. Your inside fa temperature is a factor. Sometimes even in a house, there's like one room is a different temperature than another one. So how is your kitchen? And even in my kitchen, like this is a hotter area because it's next to all the electronic -y stuff, the refrigerator, the microwave, it's always pulling stuff. That other end is cooler. So my cookies would be different there. So it'll be, I could probably like get away with eating one in 30 minutes. But if I was planning for like a party, mm -hmm. I would make them the night before and let them have overnight to set. So I wouldn't have to worry about it. And then I would know they're like solid because if we're plating them or packing them up for someone, you want them to be fully formed. Otherwise they'll be like a big blob. Is there any way to make something like this in the microwave? There's cookies you can make in the microwave. I've seen the recipes. I have seen like brownie mugs. I've never done those. Okay. Yeah. Well, I wonder because, you know, if you need to do them on the stove, and that might be something, obviously, it is something that might be you want to do with your parents. Yes. <laughs> Make sure your parents are with you. Um, and, but for a student, you know, that maybe doesn't have a parent there and, and maybe they, or the parents not right there sitting with them doing something, but microwave, I'm curious what, you know, again, the science behind it, I'm sure changes everything. It does. And uh, usually the microwave, I, I don't like it for like making, making, I always go back and thinking about cooking chicken in the microwave. Yeah. You know, I love using my microwave to defrost or reheat, but the, the science gets with it. I, I did try a cookie thing once. Yeah. And I remember, but it was, it was that good. I only tried it once. I yeah. didn't even tinker with it. What do you, but I'm also like old enough to where I don't have to ask anyone to use my oven. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. So what about, what about the taste when you compare what's done in the oven compared to what's done on the stovetop? What would you say is, is the better cookie or is there a better cookie? They're just different. Okay. So like there's people that will forbid you to bring chocolate chip cookies, but people that have had my chocolate chip cookies will say, okay, that's for everyone else, but you, we need your chocolate chip cookies. <laughs> it's, just, it's a different taste. This particular recipe and most no bakes, there's no flour. So it's more chewy. You, you'll usually have like a harder something in it, like the coconut or the oatmeal, or you'll have nuts, something to really get your teeth into. And my husband makes a no bake that we love that's cornflakes and it just somehow works. There's peanut butter in that one, but oh my goodness, it's magical. But cornflakes gives you that crunch. So you don't have the, the moist chewiness. There's more of a crunch to the cookie. Yeah. And so if you tried to eat it right now, what would it taste like? Would it just be goo? Okay, well, it, will, it won't be goo because it's still got that stuff. Okay, so I took a little one. Oh, I don't know, this piece yeah. dropped off the computer. But yeah, it's kind of goo. Oh, yeah. And yeah, <laughs> my fingers. But it'll still taste yummy. Yeah, so it's still edible. It's mm -hmm. just... It's almost like cookies or like a cake that you, you know, try to go too quick on. It still tastes good. Just right. doesn't make big fat yeah, mess. Yeah, can't rush it. But okay. this is the cool thing though. The little bits on the spoon, those harden faster because it's not as thick. So <laughs> that has more crunch. It's not going to fall on my computer, see? <laughs> no computer is damaged with what's left on the spoon. Which is not your school computer, right? Okay. Anyways, <laughs> so where can they get their recipe from and what would you recommend looking for? All right. Well, I put the recipe on the, in the schedule and the recipe is on Twitter in a pretty buncy going out. Um, let's go ahead and say it one more time too. Because see, this is my recipe right now. So I made a pretty, 
Oh, if I can screen share, I can get to the pretty. Yes, please. Okay, let's do that. As we got your fingers all coated in cookie goodness. I know, I'm like, which, which finger am I going to use here? I'm hiding those floating thingies, get them out of my way. Mm -hmm. Hey, there we go. Oh, let's get all this other stuff out of the way. Sorry guys, I'm going a little bit slower because I'm driving with one finger since Jamie made me get a cookie that wasn't yet done. <laughs> That's what happens, right? All over. <laughs> that is beautiful. Yeah, so with Fancy, what I do so much is I'll just look at what their latest graphics are that they've put in and let it inspire me. And there's a lot of Halloween stuff right now. Oh, now we can make it in the microwave. Okay, I didn't think I can talk about that. We'll have a couple minutes. Yeah. But Fancy, I'll see the new pretties. And this graphic popped up like that is perfect to write a recipe on. And my big plan, oh, he's gone, he's at work. You know what I really wanna do? When, for my son's wedding gift, I wanna have a recipe book, a digital recipe book. And I have pictures of how we've cooked together throughout the years of his life. I may put them all together and that be his wedding gift. And yep, Bensie's gonna make it real easy to make it look amazing. Oh my gosh, what a great idea. I love that. That's such a great idea. I love the idea of it, even having all of your, um, you know, recipes and your recipe book in, in a Bunsy. I think that's so cool to have something digital so that people can actually use it and print it at different times and not get stuck with that one book, you know, or sheets that we have that get dirty. As we <laughs> Or if you did see mine, you know, maybe you couldn't read it because my handwriting is not that great. I even got D's in handwriting in elementary school. <laughs> you didn't <laughs> back then. <laughs> it is. Okay, so let's talk about, <laughs> uh, let me stop sharing. I might need your fingers. Oh, there we go. Okay, so the one cool thing I can make in the microwave. Okay, you want your glass measuring spoon, measuring cup? And milk teas. Is milk teas a word that goes like across? Oh, my son wants to make them, so he's already pulled them out. Is milk teas an international word? Well, seeing how I don't ever cook, I have no idea what that is. Okay. So it's like the little chocolates, not quite chocolate chips, but they're made for like making cook making candy stuff. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. okay. So we dump that. In my cup, about like a cup of it. And this is a two cup one, so it's cool because there's some space. And I like using this because it's tall. So we're going to do a cup of Melties and a tablespoon of Crisco. Pop in the microwave for 30 seconds, stir it, open it back up. It won't be all melted, but just like we didn't want to burn the butter, we don't want to burn chocolate. Like right. anything is kind of just like, ugh. Yeah. So stir it again and wait till it gets like melted just right. And then, oh, maybe he ate them. The bag is right here. Here they are. The gigantic pretzels. The pretzel rods. Dip that in the chocolate. And then we'll put like sprinkles on it for the seasons. Like right now you can get some Halloween inspired little candy sprinkles. Put your wax paper on a cookie tray. And I'm going to lay out my pretzels. Put the pretzels in the freezer, only five minutes, and they'll be all hard. You can eat them right away. So there's something you can make just using the microwave. I love it. Ingredients. Well, I used to do this, but I didn't do it in the microwave. I would put it on the stovetop to cook. It was just harder to control with the chocolate, with it mm -hmm. getting cooked. So um, one thing I learned about those is you never, ever, ever add water because it hardens it immediately. Mm -hmm. So that's like the bad, again, science behind it. Um, but yeah, I loved making those and I think we're right at two o'clock and we have, uh, Nancy Pinchev, who's going to be sharing Woo! right into math. How does that work? I don't know. Perfect timing. Katie, thank you so much for sharing what an incredible time of learning and baking and no baking. Thank you. All right, Nancy. Yeah, take that was amazing. Now I'm like, I got to go to my kitchen, but I can't because I'm in here. So I'll have to do that later. 
All right, guys. So my name is Nancy Pinchev, and I am from Shet Khalil Community School in North Miami Beach, Florida. And today I'm going to be sharing with you some of the ways that we make math fun. Um, in my class, I teach a, um, a math class for students who um, are a little bit above their grade level. And so they need some extra challenges because they already understand what the math program is about to say. So um, we do our math program and then we put in some fun stuff. So my kids have created some videos for you. They couldn't join us live because they're in classes or they are um, doing other things right now. They might have PE. They're, at, they're not at school yet. They'll start next week. So we're, we had to create some videos for you, but I wanted to show you some things that we use. So Legos, we have a ton of Legos in my class. We have a Lego wall and we like to use the Legos to show our math. So we can display addition problems, subtraction problems. We can create arrays and we can create division and multiplication um, using Legos. It's just a fun way to create and not just have to write on paper and pencil all the time. We also, um, I buy, you know, bulk stickers. So then we get our stickers out and we can do um, lots of different activities with our stickers. We made arrays with stickers. We did multiplication, we division, addition, subtraction. That's um, kind of what we're learning about right now. So that's what's fresh on my mind, but we have lots of stickers. Um, I give students stickers either in class or I mail them to them when we're doing home-based learning so that we can do our activities. We always try to have hands-on stuff. So one of the hands-on things that we have are our um, fractions, the different fraction pieces. We have uh, fraction cards. Um, we use these gigantic playing cards. They're huge. I think they're more fun that way, but it's also a lot easier to use the cards that are big when you're teaching online. So we have, they're really big, and then we'll pull them out and do multiplication problems um, with them. So I'll pull out, say this one. So our multiplication problem would be five times nine. So we have to figure out what that answer would be. Um, and like I said, it's a much easier to do it with these big cards. I also have smaller ones, but it's easier to pull the big cards when you're doing distance learning because it's easier to see. Um, the kids always think it's a lot of fun because, you know, we have giant cards instead of just the regular ones. We also use them in the class. Um, got them on Amazon. Pretty cheap. We also have Jenga blocks. And on the Jenga blocks, we wrote multiplication problems. So we can build up a Jenga, um, big rectangle. They pull it out and then they have to give the answer. Now, we also use these when we were doing arrays because I put, I put out an array of four by five and then they would have to, um, they were upside down. So you only saw the blank side and they would say row four block two and we would pick that up and then they would have to solve the problem. I got these at Dollar Tree and then wrote all over them. So we have the entire bag here, lots of ways we can do it. We can just pull one out show it and then we have to draw it we have to write it we have to create a um, math story problem using the block so lots of fun things there my challenge for you today um, is one of the things that we do the most in our class and that is turning math into art so i would like for you let me share my screen and pull up our presentation here <clears throat> oh. present here we go um my challenge is for you to look at artwork by Mondrian where he used all the different squares and the different rectangles and colors look at Picasso's work Matisse Escher or another artist and figure out how to let their work inspire your own math art piece we do a lot of math and art and I'm going to show you one of the activities a couple of the activities that we have now I have my um, um, canvas here. You can use canvas, you can use paper and pencil, however you want to do it. And you just create. So you can use shapes, you can use numbers, you can look around and find shapes around you or numbers around you in your house or at school to create your artwork. So I'm just going to do a quick draw with a few different shapes. 
you will notice that in some of these um, examples that I have, there's repeating shapes. The shapes repeat and they end up forming something else. So how can you create something with art that uses math? You can hide numbers within your art piece as well to see if people can find them. There's lots of fun art and math activities if you just take a look around. So this is just my quick one. I haven't even colored it in, but you might notice there are numbers hidden in my art. There are shapes in my art. You see this started out as a circle and then I added the three. So now I think it's gonna be a duck when I finish with it. So see how you can create art that's math. That's your challenge for today. So this is one of the things that we did um, when we moved to home-based learning in March. We were just starting to learn about fractions. We were starting to learn arrays. We were starting to look at multiplication. So we looked around our house and found food and made arrays with them. So over here, you see Brody's, he has his cookies here and he wrote out the addition problem, the multiplication problem, how he sees it, the total. Here's some tomatoes that Eddie found. Here's some Shirley's cookies. Everything just like our last presenter with Katie was amazing, delicious, can't wait to, to grab onto it. And then we posted our work onto Padlet. Padlet is an online bulletin board. It's one of the things that we're um, posting work on today. If you can't post on the Twitter, you can post it onto our Padlet. And um, the Padlet is just a way for me to be able to collect work from my kids. And so the kids can see what other people were using and other people were thinking about with their math. So we use Padlet quite a bit to collect our work. Um, I teach at a school from um, that has 18 month olds all the way through 18 year olds with high school seniors. And everyone in our building uses Padlet in some way. Um, the babies use it, um, the baby teachers use it for creating their schedules and posting their schedules online. <laughs> posting the work that they want the parents to have or the kids to have. And our high school teachers use it for discussion boards even. But it's a great way to collect work. Um, so this is Eddie's um, progress that he's going to show you. Um, when we first um, did this, this was a few weeks ago, we were looking at arrays again. We ended our year with arrays. We started our year with arrays. And I said to the students, I want you to create an array city. And you'll see some other examples um, later on. But... Um, I said, however you want to do it, you can use paper, pencil, you can get, you know, you can make it on a canvas, you can do it on a computer, however you want to do it, just create an array city. And then in your um, Flipgrid video, because this is, this is a video from Flipgrid, I want you to tell me what the arrays are, I want you to tell me the totals, tell me what you were thinking, why you did this. So um, I had three classes of those fifth graders, because I mean, third graders are all in different classes. So we met at three different times. And in the third class, somebody said, can I do what Eddie did? And I said, well, what did Eddie do? So I went and looked and he had created, um, he had explained to us in his Minecraft about a race. And I said, sure, if that's what you want to do, go for it. So here's Eddie's presentation to you about arrays and Minecraft and why you should use it at school. Oh, nope, we didn't start it. Let's try that again. Here we go. This game called Minecraft, many schools use it. You think I'm just playing this game for fun. This game is for fun, but it's also for studying. Like, I built this whole city. It took me a long time to build it, but I'm going to explain these buildings in arrays. Like, this building is a six by 12. It's 12 blocks high, six blocks wide. You already know. This orange magma building is a seven by nine. Now I'm like, hi, it doesn't look like it is, but it actually is. You, you see these little outlines? Those are how big a block is. One. So Eddie went into his whole city to show us every building that he has and taught us about the array from that building. I absolutely love Flipgrid because that's what Flipgrid has offered to us. It's offered my students a way for them to share their math learning that's not on paper and pencil. Um, when we um, were learning about fractions for the first time, I said, hey, guys, go into your kitchen, just like Miss Katie had her uh, measuring cup. I said, grab a measuring cup. Look at the one half, the one third, the one fourth. Tell me what you're thinking. Tell me what you wonder. What questions do you have after looking at that? 
And Eddie actually had a great video where he was showing us and he was like, look, the bigger the number, the smaller the amount. And I was like, yes. And then surely one of the other students that you'll see in just a few minutes, she went ahead and got glasses and set them up and filled it, half, filled the measuring cup half and third and fourth and showed us the different ones and talked about how it was strange because the bigger number, you would think it would be bigger, but it was actually smaller. So my students were able to use Flipgrid in a way that really got to show me their thinking um, where they didn't have to write anything down unless they were just jotting notes about something, but they're able to tell me some information. So all of these videos you're going to see are videos I've downloaded from our Flipgrid. Some of them they made especially for this. Some of them I pulled from different classes, um, different activities that we've done. So this is Naomi. She's going to tell you why she loves Flipgrid. That's her favorite thing that, um, that she wanted to share. Hi, today I'm going to be telling you about my favorite thing in Miss Pench's class. My favorite thing is this app called Prodigy. Prodigy is an app. Well, she changed her mind. Hold on, let me go back. So she was supposed to do Flipgrid. She's doing Prodigy. That's fine, too. Here we go. Hi, today I'm going to be telling you about my favorite thing in Miss Pench's class. My favorite thing is this app called Prodigy. Prodigy is an app where you can solve math, where you can solve math questions and more. You you can solve math questions to to defeat the monsters that you're that you're fighting, and you can and you can um save the monsters from the puppet master. When you when you finish the game, you defeat the the puppet man master and it, and you can earn more monsters once once one it, it when you when you try to, when you try to def, when you when you try to hit the other monsters that you're fighting you have to solve a math question to to do it if you get the math question one wrong it's okay all you you all you do is miss your monster then the monster hits you and then you try again that's my favorite thing in this pension <laughs> class. Bye. Have a good day. So again, Naomi was talking about Prodigy, which is a free game. You can always, of course, pay for stuff, but it is free. My students' biggest worry when we moved to home-based learning was, well, how are we going to have our math battles on Friday? Because every Friday we had a Prodigy battle. The students who had finished their work um, for the week got to got to battle in Prodigy and when Prodigy you can actually everybody can join in the same space and battle each other online with your different characters so that was their biggest fear what are we going to do how are we going to battle each other because we didn't have class set up on Friday for my class so I said okay here we go 9 45 everything else you should be finished with by that time so around 9 45 10 o'clock join in on my zoom we will have a math battle you can come and just talk you can come and battle it's just our social time and i had anywhere from 5 to 15 or 20 kids to show up to battle or just to play around and just to talk to each other and spend that social time because that's really what my kids were missing is that social time so that was great um prodigy was actually brought to me by a student a couple of years ago and I have enrolled kids every year who were in my math class and then other kids who are coming to me through their iLab class or whatever classes, they'll come in and say, hey, can you add me to Prodigy? And I'm like, sure. So I add them in and they do um, the assessment, which sees where they are, and then it gives them harder work. As a teacher, you can assign stuff too, which I like because I can assign them the work that's based on what we're learning <laughs> or I can just let them battle with whatever. So this is Tali, and Tali's going to tell you about sticky note arrays. Now, this is one that she reworked. Um, her original sticky note array we had done at the end of the school year last year, and it was huge, but that's what she wanted to talk about. So she remade her sticky note array for you. Let's see. Hi, so this is my sticky note array. My name is Tali Smith, and my, I love when we did the sticky note array in this Penjus class. It is four by four equals 16. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Four plus four plus four plus four is 16. And I hope you like what I did. My favorite thing in Penjus class is bye. So last year, Tali and her brother both joined me to present for Global Maker Day. They presented what their um, PBL projects had been <laughs> with Maker for the previous year. 
Um, and I was very glad that she was able to share with us. And again, we looked at, I, I Googled and found a ton of pictures of um, sticky notes where people had made art with sticky notes. So we looked at those examples and then kids made their own. And I, I sent them the sticky notes. And then sometimes they grab sticky notes from their parents as well to create beautiful. I mean, there was some really pretty artwork that they created with their sticky notes. And it was to grab in that art piece, which gets them excited because they get to make something. We even saw some that people had made with superheroes and it was phenomenal. So it gave them a lot of ideas. We saw flowers, we saw just lots of stuff. And then we can also take the sticky note arrays and work them again to into area and perimeter. So it's a great way to, <coughs> excuse me, to really um, get kids interested in math. Um, math is not my best subject. When I first learned that I was gonna be teaching math and everybody else learned that too, we all laughed because math is not my strongest subject, but being able to go into math and find um, the fun ways to make math exciting um, and to be able to build on what our program already has has really been great for me and for our students. So this is Joel. Um, he's gonna tell you his favorite part. <coughs> I liked when, he, when we stacked all of the cups because I had so much fun with me and my family, and I really enjoyed it. Bye. So um, we were learning about measurement. I had sent the kids, uh, I had given the kids before we left, the Friday before we left, um, these little small cups. And when it was time to do this lesson, um, I said, use the cups that I gave you and anything else that you have. And kids created these huge sculptures out of cups, and then they had to measure them. Um, so this is Joel's. Um, you can see this was second grade and now he's in third grade. You can see how he grew up some. And one of the best things that happened out of this unit is my cousin, Kai, who lives in Charleston, South Carolina. He's a big Lego fan. And I said, hey, Kai, can you create a challenge? Can you make a video and send it to me? Do a challenge to my kids to make something um, either out of Legos or something else that's 10 centimeters because we were learning about centimeters. And he was like, sure. So he got out his measuring tape. And he made a Lego sculpture that's 10 centimeters and he made a video and showed my students and he said, but don't worry guys, you can use anything you have. And so then we were talking about it on our family chat. And so my mom was like, here, and she sent me a picture. She paints rocks. So she sent me a picture of her rocks um, that were stacked 10 centimeters. My cousin, Michelle, sent me a, a, a stack of Clemson magazines that were 10 centimeters. My cousin, Tammy, sent us a picture as well. So lots of people in my family just joined in and sent me pictures, which I posted to the Padlet, which the kids then got to see. So we all got to make things together and it was so much fun. And they love seeing my family. So that was another way to integrate um, and connect with my kids. Even though we were distant, they were still able to see my family, um, which probably wouldn't have happened if we were in class, but it was so, it's a great thing. So Joel loved working with the cups with his family. And a lot of the math things that we did with the buildings, with the paintings, with the art was families involved. Um, getting families involved in the fun part makes it even better when we're learning because then we think back and we're like, oh yeah, when my mom helped me with this, this is what I learned. So it, it just is helpful and it makes it more fun for me too, to get to see their families and what they've made. So this is Alan and he filled this um, slide in for, um, for you. So you would know, and here's his video. It's a little noisy, but you can still hear it. Oh, hold on. Let's try it again. There it goes. I feel like I have a well, I like the most that we did. I like the quizzes the most because they were fun and they really teach you a lot and and they could teach you a bunch about math and like so Kahoot is one of my students' favorite, absolute favorite things that we do. Um they, they don't equate it with learning, although he did say you can learn a lot of stuff. They think it's fun. So I tell them, hey, once you learn the information, then we'll be able to do a Kahoot about it. So let's hurry up and learn. And so they're more eager to do the work to get to the Kahoot or the quizzes or um, a Quizlet or um, lots of other things that we use. But they really think Kahoot is the best. So we have one coming up um, this Friday in our math class um, because they've worked so hard to get there. So they, they love it. They'll do anything that they can. My science classes, I just started teaching a science class 
um, for third, fourth, and fifth grade. And that's the first thing they said is, hey, you going to do Kahoot with us? And I said, if you learn the information, we'll get to do Kahoot. Um, so that game-based learning is super important um, to the students because, again, it's I get to learn this. I get to show off what I've learned. I even let them create some of the Kahoot questions and put them in there. And one of the best things that we did toward the end of the school year last year as an entire school, lower school, is I said, hey, teachers, send me a picture of yourself when you were a kid. And so the teachers sent them in and I created a giant Kahoot of all the teachers in our school. There was a little poem that went with the picture and the kids had to guess who the teacher was. And first we played it as teachers. We came together one night um, and uh, everybody logged in. They played the Kahoot and it was hilarious. People were laughing. People were competitive. And then the next week, the, the kids from uh, three through five and then K to two or EC through two also got to play with their families. And so the kids got to see the pictures of their teachers and the, and the parents were laughing because a lot of our parents know our teachers and had our teachers too. So some of them were like, oh, I know who that is. And it was a great relationship building time. And it was phenomenal. I'm so glad that we did that. So this is Yair. Um, he's going to show you his. Here is my city. Uh, one of them is <laughs> five times two. The other one is six by one. The Another one is eight by two, then it's 12 by four, and then six by two. So that is his array city that he wanted to share with you guys. He, li he likes to do the artwork as well. So he really enjoys making things to show his math. Um, this is Sammy's array city. You can see he did it on a computer. Um, they are in third grade, which is the first year they get their Googleiness, And so, um, we have been working on some of the things that they can do with their Google stuff. And so here's Sammy's. Well, I loaded it twice. It might not work, but that's okay. So we'll just go on to the next one. Okay, so here's Shirley and um, she's gonna tell you what her favorite thing is. And then we just so happened to, I was able to find the video where she shows it too. So here we go. Fraction are something very important to learn about. And when I think of fraction, I think about a pizza. Because in math, we did something that helped me a lot. We did a pizza, a fake pizza. We put whatever we want on it. And after, we divided it into eight pieces. And we ate three. So it's three eighths. And every time that I do a fraction problem, I think about a pizza and it helps a lot. <laughs> and then maybe one time I I having probably I having a hard time with a problem, <laughs> I do a pizza and it actually works and it gives me the answer. And so very easy to do it if you know how to do it. So that's how I learned fractions and I really like to do it. And so here is her pizza fraction that she made last school year. This is my pizza box. This is my pizza. I cut my pizza into eight pieces and ate three pieces. That means my pizza fraction is three eighths. In my pizza, I put tomato sauce, bread, cheese, and olives. It's called perfect pizza. All right. So, um, here is Sasha's. We, when we were studying fractions, we had a choice board. So some of these activities were from the choice board. And Sasha chose to wrote a, write a poem about herself using fractions. Hi, these are my fractions of me. One sixth of me is a karaoke girl. It is fun to sing. Two sixths of me is a puppy lover. I love puppies. One sixth of me is a reader. I love to read. One sixth of me is a Lego builder. I love to build Legos. One sixth of me is a big sister. I love being the oldest. Mm -hmm. One six plus two six plus one six plus one six plus one six equals six six. The whole of me by Sasha. And Sasha is a reader. She's always one of our top readers um, at our school. And she any book about puppies, she's going to read it. So that's very true about her. So this was a, Birdie doesn't say anything in this video, so I'm not going to play the video. But one of our activities from the fraction um, choice board was a fraction art where they had a hundred chart and they had um, 
a dice and they rolled the dice and whatever the dice landed on, they had corresponded that with a color. So they colored it in based on um, what they had rolled. And then they wrote their fractions at the bottom. This is a video with Naomi. Um, you met her earlier as well. And she's going to tell you, um, we're going to fast forward through some of these. Um, she's going to tell you about, um, or she would have told you about measuring the shins of their family. That was part of our math um, workbook that they needed to measure the shins of their family and then compare them. So she talks about that. Um, this is Natan. I'll let him share his cooking with you. <laughs> so I did um, a cake that had one and a half cup of sugar, one and one fourth cups of all purpose flour, a half of table tea. So in this activity, they were, they had cooked something and they had to share the recipe with us. Um, if they didn't cook it, they could still share the recipe. So he had found that recipe that he loved um, and he was sharing it with us. Um, I'm going to skip Nassim's as well because he just um, shows us his uh, his uh, Minecraft world. But I'm going to post this on, on Twitter so you can go ahead and look at it. This is one that we are going to do also on Friday. It's a geometry fast draw. And when you click the spinner, um, this is just super teacher tools. You can make your own spinners there. So we've been studying these words and geometry. So when I spin it, whatever it lands on, they will have to include that um, part in their, in their art. And if it lands on it more than once, they have to keep including those things. Um, so that one's a lot of fun. Um, we do that with my early, with my kindergarten and my first graders, we did it with letters. And so whatever letter it landed on, the kids had to go find something that started with that in their class. I mean, in their house. And then I have some other things that I found online, like this is a shape cow, which I thought was super cute. Um, this is from Facebook. Um, and then this is a leaf graphing, which is awesome right now, except for in South Florida, we don't have colored leaves. But my mom is going to collect some leaves in South Carolina, and she's found out that you can double dip them in Mod Podge, and they're supposed to keep their color. We've tried for many years now to mail me leaves to um, try to get the leaves down here so kids can see colored leaves and it doesn't really work. But this is a great graphing activity. So you can include your math fun and they're laying on the floor and they're, they're, they're grabbing their leaves. You can go out and do a leaf walk and collect the leaves. You can then turn the leaves into art, uh, making shapes with them and all kinds of great things. Um, this is one that I've actually done before as well. I saw it online, but I've done this. It's with the book, um, 10 Black Dots, and you need to give the kids 10 black dots and they get to make something to show and you create a, your own book using the 10 black dots. And again, here is our challenge um, where you are going to make art math. So while we were talking, I added a few things to my math. So I made my duck and then I made a bird, which is also a three. And there's a fish out of different shapes. So your challenge was to make some math and art. And um, I would love to see what you've made. If you want to tweet it out, that would be great. Um, if you want to post it on the Padlet, that would be great. And I can't wait to see everything else that we're going to be learning about today. It's been a, a phenomenal day. I've had so much fun being here with you guys. Does anybody have any questions before we go? I'm seeing a lot of snapshots of your session here. You know what I loved about it, Nancy, is that it really applies to any subject at any grade level. You were showing how to be interactive with your kids despite being remote. And I think that people are, you know, really looking for those types of resources. So really great inspiration. What my favorite part about your session was, is hearing from the kids. I yeah. love I it. wish they could have been here live, but it was trying to wrangle. <laughs> that was a little bit much. And I thought... I thought we were going to be back at school. So I was going to see if we could get them into a room, but they're not back yet till next week. So I was like, I don't need this. Is, yeah. So, but I, but they recorded stuff for us and I'll be sure to post the, um, the, uh, the link to the uh, slideshow so that everybody can see the, um, all of the videos and stuff. Cause it, they are some really cute things that my kids put out there. So. Well, if you don't mind also sharing that link inside the Padlet. So if anybody wants to mm -hmm. click on that, they're not on Twitter. That will yep. give them a chance to go back and see that resource too. That would be awesome. It, we're, we are perfect timing um, for our next session. Nancy, you know what's really cool about Global Maker Day 2020? 
is how many of our organizers have presented today. That's yeah. it. You know, we don't. Have more I that. have this. I've gone back and look at the past years and, and all my kids who got to present, and some of them are even in high school now. And it's been just a phenomenal because we've been doing this for several years now. And and like Shalom Lev is in high school this year. And it's just so phenomenal to me to go back and look and see how much they've grown and go, oh, my God, look at that. And it's it's great. And some of our kids have gone on to become like the the one of them. Sarah is now in the um, school. She's like the eighth grade, I guess it's eighth grade, seventh grade or eighth grade this year uh, president. And just, you know, building up those skills of talking and doing it on Global Maker Day has been so phenomenal for our students. And it's been wonderful. We love being a part of this. Well, we're so thankful to have incredible people like Nancy. I mean, looking back at David and Katie's session um, and just seeing kind of just how everybody is sharing just their own passions, but yet really important for other people to learn those same um, resources and concepts and way of thinking. So thank you, Nancy, so much for sharing. Thank and you, I think we're ready to move on. Believe it or not, we're going to transition over to Scotland. Oh. We are totally going to Scotland. I want to go. Oh, we're not going to Scotland. We're going to Ireland. <laughs> Ireland. Ireland. Well, same difference to me. I want to go to both places. Um, <laughs> David, I know you're on right now. I don't know if you guys could turn on your cameras. Perfect. And Colin, awesome. You both got it. Thank you so much. I'm so glad to have you guys join. I had the privilege of seeing David a couple years ago sharing at the Digital Citizenship Summit with Mary Alice. <laughs> and I got this little inkling into what Mary Alice just hoot and hollers about you all the time. And um, I was like, we got to have him at Global Maker Day. So I think she's kind of asked you every year and every year there's always something, but you know. I'm just trying to avoid her at this stage. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the benefit of having you guys at home and available. So thank you so much for sharing and we'll let you take it away. Yeah, that's brilliant. Thanks so much for having us. We, we got a little bit of, of Nancy's talk. Uh, it looks sounded really interesting. So looking forward to catching up on all of the talks afterwards. And uh, yeah, Jamie, it's uh, nice to, to be part of this. I still have your book here in my room that you sent over to us. So much appreciated. It's been useful for us. Um, so yeah, Colin, if you want to you share, we can, we can kick start what we're doing and give people a bit of an insight into what's going on here. There we go. Over to you. Great stuff. So yeah, as Jamie said, um, myself and, and Mary Alice have gone back a long way. We connected in on, on Twitter and then uh, Mary Alice came over to, to Ireland and we ran a digital citizenship summit in Dublin for the very first time, which was really exciting. So there's a lot of people over here who know uh, the work that you're doing um, with, with that, but also as well with Jamie and the rest with the Global Maker Day. So it's been uh, something that the Irish community has been really excited about and, and thanks for running it we really appreciate it so to give you a quick introduction to who we are myself uh, and Colin <laughs> although individuals also uh, come together and we work as a team called sapien innovation and really what that means is that we look at uh, new ways to do things and we try and help other people to solve uh, challenges that they're facing as well so that's really what we're always about um, I come in from a, a background of construction so my background is actually as a builder making things so we used to do up old houses here in the country of Ireland so that's really what I what I love is that uh, hands-on uh, element but also that problem solving piece there and as Colin will mention a little bit later on uh, Colin comes from uh, a very interesting background as well which also has to do with uh, creating and making uh, as well so it's been really fun to, to work together and we're going to show you a little bit about how to do that and hopefully you can bring this back to your school or maybe if there's some teachers out there, you can be, uh, you can have a look into that as well. And my background as well is as a teacher, so an educator working with young adults with uh, mild to moderate intellectual disabilities and uh, also uh, autistic students and um, always looking for new ways to, to do things. I think that's always been uh, on my mind as well. I'm currently uh, personally doing a, a PhD in uh, inclusive design and creative technologies. So again, looking at educators as designers. So this, I suppose, is for both the students there and for the teachers as well. So Colin, you can flick on to our, our next slide. It's great to be part of this. And we're going to take you quickly through 
a, a really interesting model. And for some of you, this might be the first time seeing it, even for some of your teachers and others, you might go, oh, I recognize this. This is from the, the Stanford D Design School and absolutely it is. And we're gonna take you through the, the different stages here and try and help you understand what some of these uh, words mean and, and what they mean in, in reality as well. So we have this word empathize and you may have heard it before and you may not have, but really what it means in a nutshell is looking at trying to understand somebody else putting yourself in their shoes. So, you know, if you've ever been driving along in a car and it's been raining outside and you saw someone standing out without an umbrella and you looked outside and you went, oh, you know what? I can understand how they feel. You're not outside, you're, not, you don't, uh, you're, you're sitting in the comfort of your car, but you can understand what they might be going through. But in reality, you may actually have to go and ask that person, you know, how they were feeling uh, to really understand what the challenge was. So, you know, maybe they wanted to be outside. Maybe they were enjoying the rain and they wanted to, to feel it on their skin and were, you know, was part of a, a meditation piece as opposed to just being out there, you know, getting soaked. And uh, so really trying to understand where a person's coming from can be really important, you know. So making sure that if you see a, a challenge, that you understand who it is that it's affecting and you're not just creating solutions for that person without having and involving them in, in that solution as well. So you're going to ask that person questions. And that's a big part of this process is, you know, making sure you're asking the right questions uh, before you even start something as well. And we know that a lot of you are makers. So that can be, uh, you know, a really exciting time, you know, when you just want to go and make something, but it's okay to take a second and go, okay, well, hold on a second before I make this, who am I making it for and why do they want it and get them involved in that process as well. So at that point, then we're going to go to this define stage. And that's where you're gathering all this information. You've asked these questions, you've understood who you're going to be working with, and you're trying to get this all together. And you're going to go, okay, how can I define this problem as, as, as easily as possible that someone could understand? So trying to put it into maybe one sentence. And that can be, that can be really uh, powerful as well, because when you can get something into one sentence, well, then, you know, everybody can understand it as well. So trying to understand that. And we'll show you an example of what... Uh, you can do with this uh, at the, towards the end of this when we're making this prototype of uh, a prosthetic hand. So uh, one of these problems could be, for example, uh, somebody uh, may not have the use of their hand um, and you may be able to try and go, okay, well, how can I uh, solve or try and create a solution for that as well? So then moving on from there, we try to understand someone from their information. We try to go, okay, well, here's the challenge. Here's the problem that they might have. And then we kind of go, okay, well, how am I going to create a solution for this uh, problem that they have or this challenge that they have? And at this point, then you're going to try and create as many ideas as possible. And this can be really fun part. It's the part of the design that everybody loves because you get to create uh, all kinds of ideas and you can have bad ideas, you can have crazy ideas and all of that is welcome at the early stage of this ideation process. So it's called ideation and it basically comes from the ideas. And we're going to try and create as many ideas as possible but then it's not about just creating those ideas. You want to try and find those ideas, the solutions or the ideas that you think can affect the challenge that you can actually you know, put into practice as well. So you're going to go, here are all my ideas up here and then start to narrow that down until you've only got maybe two or three. And then you're going to go, okay, well, this is the one that I could potentially go and, go and solve. Uh, so from there, you can go and you can kind of steal ideas from other uh, areas as well. So, you know, if you're working in education, for example, teachers, uh, you know, you can go and look at, at other uh, spaces as well and go, okay, well, that worked well over there. What can I do to bring it here? And actually in education, one of the things that I've done is, you know, taken this uh, design thinking model, it comes mostly from entrepreneurship side, corporates and all of that, but can be implemented in it. And if any of you are working in you know, technology in education and things like that. Uh, you may have used models that although have different names, so for example, like an Addy model, uh, but actually use the same elements of this just slightly sliced up in different elements as well. So at this point, we're now going to go on to the last two stages. So once you've understood, you've defined your problem, and then you're going to try and create all these ideas for it. We want to try and make this a reality. And I'm going to pass you over to our engineer amongst us because I'm not an engineer by trade. So I think the best person to talk about prototyping and testing is Colin Kyo. So Colin, do you want to jump on there and take it from here? Yes, thank you very much. So yeah, prototyping, as you can see from my camera, I am an engineer. Even my home office has pieces of Iron Man and fancy machinery there. So that's how much of an engineer I am. I bring it home with me. So 
as David had outlined, this kind of five stage design thinking model is something that's very, very common in entrepreneurship, very, very common in innovation, very, very common in the world of startups, but it can be applied to anything. And as he just said, the three earlier stages of empathize, define and ideate. When you have your ideas, you then need to actually, as he said, see do they work in the real world. So you get into prototyping. So what you want to do is you want to build your solutions to show that your basic idea works, no matter what it is. So to borrow an example from David standing in the rain for no apparent reason, if you're standing in the rain, you know, you want to build a prototype of your new form of umbrella. You want to make sure it keeps you dry in the rain. So, you know, you want to learn it to build as you want to build it to learn as much as possible about how it works and how it interacts with your problem. You know, how big does it have to be? How heavy does it have to be? You know, do you hold it? Do you need a support to hold it? So the prototyping stage is when you build it. And prototyping can hike any form. You can build a website. You can write some scratch code. You can use a 3D printer like I use. Or, you know, something as simple as most people, ourselves included, prototype on paper. You know, draw it as a picture, draw it as a process, or even make it out of paper and cardboard. You know, building a prototype doesn't have to be expensive doesn't have to be complicated. It can be arts and crafts at home just to prove your idea works. And that's the whole goal of it, to prove that it actually works. And then when you have that idea and you have that prototype, hopefully it's working. What you want to do is you want to test it. You know, you want to test if your prototype solves the problem you've identified previously. So in the case of the umbrella, does it actually keep you dry? Like we, you know, we might have prototyped an umbrella with lots of holes in it. And then when we get into testing it, we realize it doesn't keep us dry at all. So, you know, you need to make sure your prototype actually works. And if it doesn't work, you want to know why does it why does it not work? And then you want to improve your design, you know, so cover up the holes and then test it again. So this whole process is a cycle, you know, feel, um, kind of try and get a feeling for what the problem, the person is, uh, the person that's having the problem is like, try and define the problem, try and create as many solutions as you can prototype it, then test it, and then run the process again or move back stages or move forward stages. This is fluid and this is the process of invention. This is the process of design. This is the process of innovation. And what it basically is, is it's a kind of more complex version of something that's called the engineering design process. So if you can see it here, the engineering design process is a very, very simple kind of three-stage process. You know, define your problem, develop your solutions, and then test and optimize them. And all design thinking does is break that down into some easier understood sections and help you create it. And this is the process an engineer like myself undergoes to solve specific problems, no matter what field they're in. So, you know what I mean? As we said, define it. What's the problem you're trying or challenge you're trying to solve? You develop your solutions or you ideate, you know, what possible solutions are there and how might they work? And then you optimize, which is your prototype and your test prototype it, test it, compare it, and improve it. So this kind of cycle process is how all the world's innovations came to be, how it's a process that most kind of engineers, makers, creators follow of coming up with ideas, solving them, testing them, and improving them. So what we're going to do is we're going to just show, give you some examples of some of the projects that we work on in this engineering disability innovation space. And then we'll introduce you to our kind of maker challenge and the information to support it in making this kind of tri um, basic tri uh, prosthetic hand. So I'll give you back over to David to explain how he does some of this in the space of disability. Yeah, thanks for that, Colin. That was that was really interesting <laughs> for, from even my own perspective, listening to that, because I think that's really important is just making sure that everyone is aware that, you know, once you get to the end of the process, if you're trying it for the first time, you know, it is one of these things that you do again. It, you don't come to the end. I think that's one of the, the things that you realize with any of these is that you're constantly changing things, adapting things. And I think that's part of the maker uh, kind of spirit really is, you know, being comfortable, you know, make it, you know, not having it perfect and being willing to accept that and being comfortable with trying things out and, and doing things in new ways. So that was really uh, interesting. And I'm going to give you a, a quick insight into what I do at the moment. So I've told you that I come from a builder background and then also in education but part of my role as well is uh, in innovation and I suppose innovation is trying to find new things and how they add value to current challenges and current society and part of this is I work with a company called the rehab group and my role there is as an innovation manager and we look at all the new technologies and new things and go okay well how can we support someone who has an intellectual or a physical uh, difference 
and to be able to support them to be either more included in society, in work or in education. And, you know, it's not just for us. This is also something, this maker movement, although we want to, to really embrace it, is that this is also something we're calling out some of the, the bigger organizations as well and saying, you know, how can you do something different? And one of the things that was done really well, and this is uh, one of the young men that I work with, with his carer, and this is his very first time ever playing uh, PlayStation or an Xbox game in this case. So they were using an Xbox and he'd never played a video game before. And using this controller, so he's got uh, use of uh, one hand um, and he's got limited mobility with it. But with this new controller and how it was connected together, uh, he was able to actually control this car that was going around the track for the very first time. And this is very exciting. And he was able to do this because he'd been using his wheelchair with one finger uh, for uh, over the course of years and was actually really adept with being able to control it, but had never been able to have a controller. So if you've got one at home and you can think to, to your own controllers, you know, you hold them with two hands. The buttons are very small. There's a lot of them. And that can be very challenging for someone who might not have the same mobility uh, as, as you might have. So in this case, Xbox created a device and it has two big buttons and one smaller one. And then you're able to adapt it and change it. And you can see that I'm holding the, the joystick there for him to be able to control it. And that was something that was really powerful, but also as well in the design of this, they also said, well, you know, someone buying this, they're going to maybe only have one hand. So, you know, in this case, we want to make sure that they can open the box as well. So they designed the packaging to be opened using one hand along with everything else. And they would have gone through the similar process to you. And these are some of the bigger companies. So that's very exciting to be able to see it. So Colin, I'm going to get you to, to move on from, from that there. And I suppose part of what we do then is trying to bring in this mindset, trying to bring in this mindset of, you know, trying to create a difference in society. So we look at uh, accessibility hackathons and we get, uh, and, and a hackathon basically is going, okay, what are the challenges we have? How can we get people together over the course of, you know, two or three days or one day and try and fix that? So people from all different backgrounds come together and say, well, I'm a designer, I'm a developer, you know, I'm an educator, whatever it is, and let's work together to try and create these solutions. And we've done this uh, here in Ireland. Uh, I've also been over to Saudi Arabia and some other countries where we've been able to support uh, and, and encourage both uh, from a government perspective, but also in uh, local areas as well, local uh, maybe uh, councils or whatever, to be able to say, okay, we may have some challenges with accessibility. People may not be able to come into our restaurants. Maybe some of our streets aren't accessible. Maybe our schools aren't accessible. So someone maybe with a wheelchair may not be able to, to get in because there's a step up to the door. And we go, okay, that's that, we accept that that's how it is right now, but we don't want it to stay like that. So how can we go about taking this design thinking process, bringing people together and getting them to step through it? And that's a big part of what we, we do at the moment. And we try and encourage this. So if anyone is listening to this and going, oh, that sounds really interesting, we'd love to do that, reach out to us, we'll have a chat, we'll show you how to, to go about that and see if it's something you can bring back to your local area or even your school itself. So Colin, you can uh, skip on ahead there. And again, you're going to see this in a little bit. We do a lot of outreach as well. So we've been part of uh, Dublin Maker. We've been part of these uh, gaming conventions that are run by uh, disabled students. Uh, and also as well, looking at how this can be used in the space of, of health uh, uh, as well. So that's, that's something that's very, very exciting from our perspective to be able to do it. Uh, and in one case here, we looked and you can see Lisa down in the, the bottom left hand side of the, the screen. And uh, she's someone that we've worked with and uh, she had a uh, very uh, limited mobility and she wasn't able to communicate uh, verbally using words to us. Uh, but what we wanted to do is be able to allow her to be able to control her environment. And over the case of maybe six to eight months, so it was a long process trying to understand, you know, what she wanted and what she uh, wanted to be able to do within uh, maybe a room. We, we decided, okay, well, you know, to be able to, to watch uh, maybe Netflix, to be able to turn on and off lights, uh, use it maybe a blinds that were there, maybe lights that uh, were, were available to her as well. There were the areas that she wanted to be able to do and also to be able to send a text message as well. And in that process as well, what we did was we, we talked a lot uh, with her and with her carers, tried to understand the problem, define it. And then from there, we're able to develop a room using simple things like Amazon Alexa to be able to develop that out and be able to, to showcase it as well. And so from there, she was able to, you know, 
make conversation and, and things like that using that and be able to control her her netflix and her lights within a specific space so that's something that we're still trying to to work on more and to be able to develop it so that other people might be able to benefit from that as well um, so yep i do a bit of teaching so we'll skip on from that <laughs> and um from there as well we, we obviously go to other countries too so i'm going to stop talking as much about that now as, as possible that hopefully that gives you a bit of an insight into it and i'm going to pass you over to colin and he's going to talk to you a little bit about how he uses this process as well just before we move into our, our challenge for you and hopefully that'll be something that you'll be able to join us in over the next few weeks excellent thank you very much so to give you some idea of the what you can do with innovation and engineering and design thinking when it comes to having an impact on the world I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the projects I've worked on um, with a numerous different groups doing exactly that. So these images I see here come from a foundation I was one of the co-founder of a few years ago called the Rapid Foundation. And we use innovation and 3D printing systems to make an impact in developing regions around the world. So these photographs here are just an example of some of the projects that we've worked on overseas. So these are images from India and um, Africa of some of the projects we've supported. So what we did is we sent them uh, 3D printers to schools in these regions. We taught the kids in the schools how to use them. And then we encouraged them to solve their own problems using design thinking and innovation. And we just let them at it. So, you know, some of these examples here is they made educational tools. So that's a map of India you could see that they could use to teach the kids about the different regions and provinces in India. You know, simple medical devices like simple wrist braces and then, you know, tools for larger activities. So the bottom left is an image from um, Rwanda in which we supported a science uh, program that encouraged girls in Rwanda to stay in school and study science by showing them the really interesting things you could do with science and engineering. So, you know, you can have an awful lot of impact when you be creative and you design things for the betterment of other people. And then we do similar here in Ireland as well, you know, so education shows and kind of design programs and like outreach events in which we show people cool and interesting technologies, recycling waste materials, using 3D printers to tackle these sorts of projects. And then kind of more recently on a much larger scale, David and myself, along with a group of thousands of other volunteers, pure kind of makers at heart, decided makers wanted to contribute to coronavirus and we wanted to help create medical devices. So we generated lots of different machines and solutions and inventions to help the medical field with equipment and, you know, educational tools, education guides, uh, protection, protective equipment, anything and everything we help people create. And over the course of a few months, we had, I think, six or 7,000 contributors in 159 countries around the world, all creating these sorts of things from really great groups making free face shields that they know they donated to healthcare professionals without any kind of concern or cause for profit or you know even covering their expenses lots of people volunteered a huge amount of their time and interest to it and other kind of educational guides in multiple languages to help people around the world so this was done with design thinking we played out the process in real time and had a significant impact. And then similarly to David, these are consultancy sessions that we've run at specific events. They don't look like business. They don't look like kind of boring, kind of me and David in a suit having a board meeting. This is innovation in action. This is real time creativity and innovation in, in like firsthand. So these are the kind of things we do. Very interesting with lots of different people from lots of different backgrounds in different countries of different ages. Innovation is for everybody, making is for everybody. And you can use it to do really, really kind of interesting things, you know, from environmental projects in Africa, encouraging local girls in Africa to great, create these amazing animals out of waste materials from the beach up on up to the project we're going to talk to you about now. So which is 3D printed prosthetics. So one of the, the projects we've worked on in the past is manufacturing these 3D printed prosthetics. So if you've not seen a 3D printer that's one right over my shoulder right there. And it, tr it, uses, it uses plastic to manufacture anything and everything. So from gears to tools, right up to kind of branded by large corporation kind of interesting toys. So, you know, you can do an awful lot of work with it. Uh, but one of the things you can do is make prosthetic hands. So here's an example of a prosthetic hand I fitted to a little girl in Ireland. She was only six. And we made the, managed to make her a prosthetic hand for about $20 and it took about eight hours to make. 
and had a significant impact on her life. So what we're going to do is to show you guys, uh, it points you towards the directions of a great workshop in which you can make a version of the same thing. So here's this workshop me and David did this time last year in a big event in Dublin, making a paper-based prosthetic hand. And that's what we're going to show you how to do today. It shows you how it works. It shows you the concept of design and engineering. And then it also normalizes the use of prosthetics. So kids that need to use an actual prosthetic don't feel as excluded or different in the general, like in the general population. So I'll give you back to David to talk you through this guide. That's brilliant, Colin. Thanks, uh, Emil, for that. So yeah, we're going to put a bit of a challenge to you now at this stage. So you've seen uh, in that Maker Fair uh, a young guy who had, had designed over the course of maybe 15 to 20 minutes a, a cardboard and a twine or string a prosthetic prototype. And this was something that he was able to open and close. And we would like you to be able to you know, try out the same and start to think about, okay, well, how can I use my maker skills to, to make a difference? And, you know, this is something that, okay, you might initially design on paper or cardboard, but then you might be able to go and do something uh, with different materials that could make a real impact on someone's life. And, you know, don't be afraid, even if you've only got some things lying around the house, that is absolutely fine. There's no problem with that at all. That's what I did today. So I'm going to show you a hand that I created. And I'm going to just show that up here <laughs> so you could see uh, I actually went and I, and I picked up some uh, cardboard um, cardboard straws because we're trying to you know protect the environment to make it all recyclable uh, and then I had some paper that was lying over here as well that you know I'd printed on and started to put it all together and I'm going to show you a couple of things so what we're going to do is we need uh, a couple of elements you know so you're going to need some you know maybe paper or cardboard or something flat like that you know, I'm not going to go give you permission to cut up your, your parents' newspaper or books, but, you know, if you want to, just you can blame us uh, on, on this side. So also what you're going to need is you're going to need uh, uh, a scissors. So that's very important uh, from this side. You might need some, some string or some, some wool or some thread. So I'll show you that there as well. And don't worry if you're not following us along with this. This is something for you afterwards. Have a watch of it later on and try it out in school maybe next week or, or at home. Uh, you're also going to need some glue. Now, I've got some, <laughs> some crazy Loctite glue, which I actually dropped on my desk a little earlier. So over on this side, which you can see, I've got this pool of, uh, of water that I'm trying to soak my, my super glue off my, off my uh, table here at the moment. So be careful with the glue. You know, if you're using glue, try and use some maybe Brit stick or something like that, uh, or sellotape, but you can use other, other uh, adhesives as well. And um, from there as well, I'm going to show you these straws that I have. So I'll show you those. This is actually fully recyclable. So something to keep in mind. And of course, then the straws that are in there as well. Um, so within that then as well, I think that's pretty much everything that you need um, to do this. And we're going to, to walk you through how to do it. So what we're going to do is we've shared with, with Jamie and with Mary Alice uh, a link for all of you that you can uh, get a little bit later on. And it brings you through uh, the kind of the guidelines and the instructions that you can either print out or go and look online for free about basically how to build uh, a hand, how to build this, this prototype. And it calls it a robot hand, but you know, it can be anything. And I think that's something to, to bear in mind. So you can name it whatever you want to name it at this stage. Uh, so we're going to share that link with you, or you can go and you can uh, take a photo of that link there. You can go and check it out right now if you want to as well. So Colin, I'm going to get you to flick on. And this is something that we really want to, to say as well. It, it comes down to you know, collaboration, working with others. And I think that's all part of the maker spirit. And recently over the summer, during the, the lockdown, uh, Microsoft ran a, a, a STEAM, uh, which is you know, looking at uh, science and technology and engineering and arts and, and maths uh, within this uh, uh, kind of a, almost like a TV program that was there, but it was online. So it was all through YouTube and things like that. And trying to put all of these ideas, all of these ideas into people's houses because they were locked down, they were with uh, their, their brothers and sisters at home. And we ran a project uh, with them. And I think this is something that we want to, to show you uh, and, and really bring you through, you know, what it looks like to build this handout. So we'll give a big shout out to, to Kaylin for uh, over in Microsoft in the dream space for, for going through this. Um, but we'll also share the link with you afterwards and you'll be able to go and, and watch that episode, uh, which was based here in Ireland and also how to, to do this. And you can pause it and stop it whenever you want to as well, because I know it's quite hard to keep up with a live uh, presentation. So Colin, I don't know if you want to do that there on yours or um, it might be just as, as easy. Uh, 
Sure. So what we just go so just to kind of finish off our talk, we're gonna play this. It's like four or five minutes long, and it will just talk you guys through how to work and complete this activity. Again, completed by the great group in Microsoft. So watch it now, watch it later. The links are available. Work through the process, and then we'll just kind of finish off in asking you to show us your work at the end. So I'm gonna play it, and then as soon as we it's finished, we should be done. Can you go on mute there, Colin? And what we can you do that on mute down bottom left? Perfect. And what we can do is we can do a quick walk, talk over um, uh, and and kind of talk through what Kaylin is, is doing here at the sure. moment. Um, so, go on ahead. so I see we have a notification saying that there is a session starting soon. Uh, I'm, I'm aware of the time. So what we might do is we're going to put this into fast forward for you. You're going to see it uh, in super quick time. Uh, okay. And Colin will flick on through it. Let so we've me gone. run through it and we can find it out. So, you know, first of all, your first <laughs> step should be to trace out your hand on one sheet of paper. You then cut out your hand and cut it out on a separate piece of paper. So you're left with two hand models. Okay. So when you have your two hand models, one acts as the base and the other acts as the support. So what you do is you mark out the joints of your finger. So at all of your knuckles on one of them, you mark out all of the joints your hand has and at those points, then you want to cut them out. And when you cut them out, you cut them off out into individual sections, and then you stick them to the other copy of your hand. And those two will give you then an articulated hand joint. So you will have a hand, in this case, the white hand is the base, and then the yellow pieces are stuck on top. And this will give you the individual joints of your hand. So what you do is when you fill it all in, you then get out your straws and cut your straws into individual short sections. And what you want to do is you want to have a little short section of straw for each joint in the hand. So when you cut them all out, you measure them, cut them all out. And then what you do is you stick them to the individual joint sections of each hand. So you stick them with super glue or tape or whatever you want. So each finger will have three individual little sections of straw on it. And then the palm will also have um, five individual straw sections on it. So you do that for each of the fingers on, e on your hand. And then what you do is when you have all of them included, you tread your string through all of the individual uh, straws for each of your fingers. So it'll go through the palm and then the three individual sections of each finger. And then you stick the string at the end of the finger and then you're left with a joint. So what this does is this acts as a tendon in your hand. So very like the actual formation of your real hand that activates your fingers. You do that for each of the individual fingers until, and then you'll see when you pull on the string, the fingers bend. So this gives you an articulated motion like is in your hand, but also the same motion as in your prosthetic hand. So you're left with an articulated um, hand. And then what we want you to do is test it out. Test your hand. See, can you pick anything up with it? Can you pick up glue? Can you pick up bottles? Can you pick up anything? So those instructions are there and that's the quick gist of it. So you'll be able to find those instructions and you can follow them through at home or in school or yourself or whatever. You can kind of follow these instructions through. And what we want you to do is, like David here, make your hand and then show it, show it to us and show it to each other. So, you know, use the Global Maker Day hashtag and our Sapien Chat hashtag because we want to see them. You know, send us your pictures, send us your images and let us know how you got on with your hand. You will learn then the process of innovation. You'll learn the process of engineering and then you'll create these great devices. And then that is kind of it from us today. So enjoy it. I hope you have fun doing it. And I'll give you back over to David and Jamie to finish it off. Awesome. Thank yep. you, guys. Uh, Jamie, off you go. <laughs> well, if you can please share that link, we would absolutely. Oh, it looks like we got it. We got the YouTube link already. Uh, we'll make sure to share it on the Padlet on Global Maker Day's website as well as uh, social media so that people can jump in and do this themselves. What a cool way of getting students to think about somebody else first. And I think that is the ideal. When you're making and you're making it for yourself, that's one thing, but when you're making it for other people, that brings it to a whole new level. And I love seeing that. So thank you guys so much for those amazing resources and content and for joining us from Ireland, not Scotland, from Ireland. <laughs> um, sharing here at Global Maker Day. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank Good you. Luck to All the it. best. Enjoy. All right. Bye -bye. All right. We have our next session joining us um, from Pennsylvania. 
we have Rochelle joining us and sharing on being an entrepreneur. And all right, now we'll see fingers crossed if I can share my screen, that will be the, <laughs> the real test, right? Okay, we should be good to go. Let me know if you can see it because always got to say that. Absolutely, looks beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, hello, everybody. I'm sorry for the delay, but uh, when you have the backup to the backup plan, everything for whatever reason, you know, it never works the way that you want it to. But you have to be flexible in your thinking. And I think that's the key behind this entrepreneurship and the skills that students need for the future. So prime example of thinking quickly and working around it. So what I would like to share with you today for Global Maker Day, which Jamie, thank you for all the things that you said um, about me earlier and about my students. It is a lot of fun to learn with them, to get ideas from them and to see what they create. So I have loved using Buncee for I think the last five years. I use it in all of my classes, the Spanish classes, my STEAM course, which is with eighth graders, for pretty much anything that I can find a way to use it for. Um, connecting with their other classes so that we're kind of collaborating and they're creating you know, really meaningful, authentic projects, but that they have a ton of choices. So today, going to share with you some of the Buncee business cards that I made, how I taught my students to kind of get started on their own. And in this presentation, I will share some of their examples. Uh, we took it to like two parts. One was I had them create a Buncee business card. And then we also created flyers. And we were talking about, you know, what are the skills that they need for the future? I also had them answer a question using Flipgrid that was about, you know, what, are, what is a job that you think that you might like to have in the future? What are some careers that you think might exist? Just to kind of see what their interests were. So the whole purpose behind this was they had to create both a business card and a flyer and connect it either to a personal interest that they have now or if they just wanted to make it for STEAM, like some of them just did what I did for mine and it was focused on computers and technology, but I really wanted them to see all of the possibilities of what you can do when you create with this, how you can use it to kind of share your experiences, um, things that you are learning and to let people know about you. And for me, in the past however many weeks, I think six or so weeks we've been in school, we've been fully virtual. And so I've been getting to know my students by the things that they're creating, our interactions through Microsoft Teams and the different tools that we use. But I really enjoyed learning a lot about them through what they created with Buncee. So how I did that and the challenge for everybody out there is to make your own business card. I had created some of my own Bunsy business cards. And when you print them, you can send them anywhere and get them printed. They are just as beautiful and colorful as what you see on the screen. And so I encourage you to take the challenge and create one today. What I chose to do with my students was I picked one of the templates that were available and I'll show you how to do that. And this that you're seeing right here, aside from my own information that is on the screen with the images and the Bitmoji, I just changed everything that they already had there for you. So if you're looking for quick ideas to get started, you don't really need to start from scratch. Although I will say it is a lot of fun to start creating with Buncee from scratch and to explore all of the thousands of graphics that are available and everything that is ready for you in the library, especially when the students find a lot of the things that they do. And I often say like, where did you find that? Uh, it's always fun to log in every day and see all of the new backgrounds and everything that's available within Buncee to get started with really quickly. So I made this business card and I even added on, uh, Jamie won't be surprised at this, but it's a 3D cat. So not that if you print out the business card would somebody be able to see that this object is in 3D, but what I share with my students is Imagine that you want to share a business that you're starting. So a lot of them relate to Etsy, for example. And some of my students are interested in technology, arts, creating things, writing stories, sports, you name it. And I said, if you want to share your message, but you were worrying about the time to get the information out and the printing or the cost that might be involved. So I said, you can create these business cards, these flyers, and you can just send them by email. And what's even better is you could put in a QR code. You could put in a video where if somebody opens it, they hear you talking about your business. So this was the way that I did my first one. And my students, I encouraged them as I was going through to just kind of change, put their information in. Of course, reminding them, please don't put your actual address 
or your real phone number because the identifiable information. Uh, this second one is the exact same thing that was on the one I just showed you. I just changed the background. And so I told them, maybe you like the layout of it, the font, everything is set up for you. It's lined up nicely and you want to see what it's like on different backgrounds. Have some fun creating. So those were the first two that I had done. And then also, and I'll show you this too, I chose one of the templates available for a flyer. This one was actually for a school and I had my students do the same thing. I kind of talked them through it. I gave them some ideas of what they might want to change it to. Uh, I put a video in, not one that I recorded then. I just pulled one from the library and made it up and said, just create whatever you want. Now, the next couple of pages that you'll see are ones that were created by my students. So here is one that wants to be a scientist and an animator and added all kinds of different graphics and animations in the background, keeping you know information, private websites, phone numbers, but just took a different take. Started with the template that I had, but then decided to add some other background that was more personal to them. Uh, here is another one that was the flyer actually for the same student that wanted to create a business focus on animation. And so a lot of fun for them to go from what was the template to then add in the animations or their characters and their own information that they want to share. Uh, I love this one and Jamie would know why, but this student created you know, their own business card from the original one that I had done. So the fun thing for me was while I was going through and explaining, like I'll show to you, you know, here you might want to put a picture or maybe you don't want to have an address or maybe you want to link your website, for example. Then when I could go back in my teacher dashboard and see all of the different business cards and then later on the flyers that they had created, it was a lot of fun and it was a good way for me, like I said, to also get to know my students. Um, these creations and here is that same student's flyer for her business. So her services, computer website, promotional, the color of it, again, taking it from, if you remember what mine looked like and changing and adding her own backgrounds, images and everything to make it more personal to her. And I'll show you a few more examples. This one again was from that same template that I used, but this student wanted to be an illustrator, an author and a current role as a student and changed the background and added some of their own information and pictures. And here again, same template, but a different look. This student thinks about being a sports writer and an agent and added some information in, made up an address, had some fun with it, of course, and so did I. Uh, a student who was interested in making clothing created this from that original flyer and changed and added some different fun animations, backgrounds to it. And then, the last one, another same thing. It was the original flyer that I had, but they changed it, added their name for their business, listed the services available, and kind of just added a couple of other images in the background. So each of those, and I have many more examples that I could share, but in the interest of time, I'm going to show you how to go about getting started with um, Buncee. So you need a Buncee account, and the best thing to do is to hit Create and you choose version 3.0. Now, the wonderful thing about this is every time I log in or when you log in, you have so many choices available and when we don't have a ton of time, it's great to have something that we can get started with right away. Also, when it comes to having our students create, whether we're teaching you know, languages like me or a STEAM class, or if you're doing things like project-based learning, anything that you teach, you can find something that's already created that you can get started with or you can start from scratch. Now, if I scroll through, if you log in and create your account, there are so many new ideas that have been added and you can just take them, change a few things, just like I did with the business card template. But these are the steps that I did with my students. So going on the left side, choose business cards if you're going to do the challenge. And when you scroll down, you can find a lot of different examples. You click on it, it pulls up, it gives you kind of the overview. You can decide to use that specific one or you can keep searching. Now, when I first did this with my students, I chose this first one just because it had those circles. It had some prompts to tell you to put in a photo or to add a sticker. And it had all of the contact information that I think would be important to have. So that was one option. Uh, this one I think I'll go with today. So if you click use this one, 
pretty much everything that is already in there, you can change. So if you don't like some of the colors in the background, if you don't like the font or the size or anything, most of the things you can change. And I tell my students, if you click on something and you don't get the red dots, that means you can't change it. But any of the colors. So let's say that these colors don't necessarily align with maybe what my brand is or what my business is, for example, and I want to change them, or maybe I want to kind of move some of them or get rid of them. I can do any of that. I can even decide if I don't mind those, maybe I want to change the background. So you can always go back and change things. And I had a student who actually chose the uh, one of the Halloween themes for their business card background, but hey, why not? If your business is maybe you have a Halloween store or it's just for fun, you can do that. And of course you can always go back and change it. It auto saves, which is great. So let's just say you're using this template and you wanna change some of the colors. So now that I have this lit up, has the red dots, your toolbar is at the bottom. So anytime you're working on the text, if you're changing the objects, if you wanna put links in, you always want to look at the bottom. And so I'm gonna change that color from being the light blue that it is to a darker blue. And I could go and change all of these. So I'll just change a few really quickly in the interest of time. And maybe you decide that you don't like part of it. You can delete something and if it, it prompts you and says, are you sure? Yes. And maybe you want to extend. So you can always drag the items around on the screen. You can also make them longer or shorter, whatever you decide. And I'll change one more. And you can also change the border color of the objects too, in some cases. And how you know that is if you look at the bottom. So here I have the border color. I could choose to make the border color be yellow or white or whatever color that I wanted. So for now, I'll leave this the way it is. And putting in your name, so everything is nicely aligned. You don't have to worry about the correct alignment, which saves you time. However, you may find, like I tend to, that your name may not necessarily fit. So you have a couple of options. You can drag the dots across and kind of stretch it out is one option, or you can change the font. So that's one thing I could do. Cursive writing, you may not particularly want on a business card. So again, at the bottom is where you find all of your different options. There are so many different styles of font. So you can pick something that kind of suits your preferences, but I will tell you that when that happens, depending on the original font, you may find that it's really large. So you have to decrease the font size until it actually fits. Okay, so there's the name, I can move that around. Even let's say this line that's here, you could extend this line that's underneath my name if you wanted to, or you can even get rid of it, doesn't matter. Job title is something you want to add. So when I told my students, okay, fill in something, what is your interest? If you could create a business, what would it be? What is some type of job that you might want to have in the future? And you know, have some fun with it. So I could double click and type in whatever type of job that I would want, or it could be my current role. So if I type in educator and attorney, I'm not gonna type anything beyond that. And again, I could change the colors of the font. So if I don't want it to be a lighter blue, if I wanted it to be darker, whatever you choose and apply that. And then typing in phone number, email address, website. So I could change all of those. And the only one that I'm actually going to take the time to type in for right now, in the interest of time, is I'll type in my website and I'll show you what you can do. Now, granted, if you are printing the business cards, this wouldn't actually be a hyperlink that would work. You could use a QR code that somebody could scan and then take them to your a website that you wanted. But what I've told my students is if they were emailing some information, they created a flyer, they made a business card, you can email these and then somebody could open it up and have basically the digital business card, but I could type the link. So if I click the link and I have that text lit up and it's highlighted and I type my website in here, then whenever anybody would actually click on that link, it would take them to that site. If I wanted to have some fun and add in, let's say a video, I can't record a video right now since I'm using the webcam, but you can record a three minute video. So what I can do instead, just to show you how that works, is choose one of the videos that I had recorded before and I could add that in there. And again, like I told my students when they created their business cards and their flyers, 
I said, this is something that you could basically send to somebody. And it's like a sales pitch, an elevator pitch where you could introduce your business, something that you're interested in. And they could see that. And the best thing about it is if you were sharing things digitally like this, you have the code, you can change and update it whenever you wanted to. So the information would always be current. Now, if I hit preview, this won't be the best business card you've ever seen because who has a video in the middle of it? But you'll see that it's actually embedded in there. So if I did email this to somebody, they would see the business card and they would also be able to play my video. I can always go back in and edit things. So if I click the edit, and Jamie, feel free to interrupt me at any point because of time. But the last thing I'll, I'll kind of do is I'll click the plus and you have all of these choices. So all of the objects, you have like 35,000 or more objects available in the media library. And so if you do have a business where maybe it's for computers or I have students who think about having a store for clothing or arts or sports, you can search all of those categories. And if I type in sports, It'll search every category that's there and give you all of the options. So let's say somebody is thinking about opening up a gym. Look at all of these amazing images and graphics that you can add. You can also search by type of um, if it's an animation, if it's a 3D object, if it's a sticker, which is just basically the image. But if I also type in, uh, let's see if I type in school, since I'm saying I'm an educator, what are some of the images that I can add? So you can pick any of them. If they are animated, uh, you can get a preview when it plays. So scrolling down, you see there are tons. Uh, just a side note, people who make the virtual classrooms use Buncee for that. I'm gonna pick, I'll pick this one right here and add that one right on. Now, the other thing that I will tell you really quickly is if I were to go through and click every single object that showed up here, I could add them all onto my canvas at the same time. It would be a little bit of a mess, but I would be able to just take it and drag it and place it into whatever position that I wanted to. So again, I'm not too crazy about this video being here. So I'm going to decide to delete it. I get that, are you sure? Yes. And just to pretend if you wanted other things that you could do is you could have a QR code. So if you do have a website or if you do have a video or something that you wanted to share, you could post that, I mean, place that actually on your business card wherever you wanted to. If you wanted to add something else to it, like often I have my students create like they did with their business card and their flyer in the same project, you can always add on another page. Uh, business cards can have the back to them as well. And again, if you're changing the colors or the font or anything, the toolbars are at the bottom. So you can change the color, you can make it bold so it kind of stands out a little bit more to whatever it is to your liking. You can add all of those different objects, but the idea is for students to have fun kind of creating. And I'm always curious to see what they ultimately decide to create. And it was a lot of fun to see what businesses they decide that they wanted to actually create. So I'm just gonna have some fun here with this one and see what that looks like. We'll open it up and preview it and see. So your challenge, a couple of things, make a business card, choose one of the many templates or go from scratch, which some of my students did, or just use the template and have all of those, the information, all of that lined up so it's nice in a row. And then you don't have to worry about lining everything up on your own. It's already set and good to go. So there is that one. And I actually had done that same example a little bit earlier today to show one of my students. And it came out a little bit better than this one actually did. So I'll just open up that one so you see what a finished one that was changed a little bit from that template. I did have the video in there, but at any rate, there is potentially what it could be if you change from that original with those colors that are there. So, Michelle, honestly, that is so awesome. I it's love so much it. fun. Do you like, do you prefer to start from templates in? Do you think that's the most beneficial way to get started? Uh, you know what? It depends. Like I like, I like that you can go in and then you can explore everything. But for some people, and even my students, they say like, just tell me where to start. Like, I don't wanna start from scratch. I wanna at least see the structure or have an idea because sometimes you just need that first idea. And then it kind of like, you end up totally changing it anyway. But yeah. I, I, I like finding some examples and at least getting started with, and then it helps you. I mean, it, it helps me become a little bit more creative too, to think about, 
And I make multiple copies of it to think about the different possibilities, the styles, the colors, the fonts. Uh, but it's, it's fun for me because I get to do this with my students. And then when I see what they create, like I was commenting because you can comment on the Bunsies. I was sending messages like, this is amazing. I was, it was amazing to see what they were coming up with in terms of like a job, a career or something, or just their interest and what they put into it and how they changed what was the original, like what I started them with to how they made it their own. So lots of fun to learn with them and definitely from them. Rochelle, thank you so much with all the technology glitches we had today. I'm so thankful yeah. that you stuck it out and you shared and um, also thankful to Buncee for allowing us to use their platform every year um, as our landing page. So it's worked out such a great way to be able to deliver information even through a global event like this. So we're really thankful. We're thankful for you to be able to join in and share and uh, just rush out of one class and come right to us. So thank you so much. Thank you. I loved your 3D cat. That was, I, I figured that was for you. <laughs> Thank you. All right. We are going to, I'm so excited about this session. Um, this is like, oh, I, my heart is full when we get to hear from this session. We have um, Shireen joining us from Deaf Kids Code. And this has been, we had a session last year. And while we were watching, I'm just going to, I'm going to tell you openly and honestly that I had tears coming down my face as I was watching, just thinking, this is something we've wanted every year. And now Shireen has actually brought three different groups, two different groups with us today for the presentations to be able to share. And we are just overjoyed to have them here. I see Victoria on right now. And Victoria, I had a chance to meet with her and her awesome girls just a couple days ago as we were prepping. And, um, oh man, she's just, I felt like she was like one of my friends. I was like, ah, oh, I hate to get off the phone with you, but I guess we got to work, you know? I don't know. Um, <laughs> Victoria, thank you so much for sharing. Uh, do you guys have a plan on who's going to go first? Because I think Tony's in here as well. I don't see her video up yet. Um, but if Tony wants to join in, that would be wonderful. I was going to have... Um... Victoria and her little sidekicks uh, <laughs> do their presentation. And then I was going to have uh, Tony, um, you know, pop in and give her the remainder of the time. So she has eight students and Victoria has her two brilliant daughters. So without further ado, go for it, Victoria. Victoria. All right. Thank you so much for the introduction. Hello. We are the Wright family. I'm Victoria. I'm Quentin. I'm Layla. And I'm Ariel. And this is the Wright Academy of Excellence. We started homeschooling our girls in kindergarten. Layla is eight years old and Ariel is seven. They're only 14 months apart in case some of you may be wondering. We didn't plan to have Ariel start kindergarten at just four years old, but she was interested in everything her sister was doing and she kept along with each grade, each consecutive year. Ariel has normal hearing, but Layla has bilateral cochlear implants because she is deaf and she's had them since she was a toddler. They are now in third grade, which means this is our fourth year in our homeschooling journey. We are so excited and blessed to be working with Deaf Kids Code and to be a part of the phenomenal Global, Global Maker Day. We've really enjoyed seeing all the activities today. It's been so inspiring. And as a homeschool mom, it's definitely made me be happy that I have already incorporated some of these things into our curriculum and just our everyday life. I've always been big on loose parts play and Lego STEM activities. We recycle. So the girls love to imagine, create and innovate with just all kinds of things every day. Um, and during these unprecedented times, Deaf Kids Co. thought it would be a great idea, as you see, to decorate face shields and give them a little bit more pizzazz with LED lights. I'm going to cut our light off here so you can see them a little bit. Go ahead, Lila. If you look closely, you can see that the lights can even change colors. The lights are connected to a lithium battery. Like a little button cell battery. With two lines of conductive string. There's one line of positive and one line of for the negative. 
tube. It had to be carefully threaded to complete the circuit with the battery so the lights will work. So what happens if we were to accidentally crisscross the positive and negative sides? What would happen? They wouldn't work, even though you have them in your All right, and now I'm gonna kind of move the computer a little bit because our next activity are electric cars. And so we need to put this on the floor so that you can see. All right, Ariel's gonna go first. All right, you can bring it closer if you like so you can explain it. When I put um, my flashlight on my sensor, it only goes in a circle. When I put both lights, it goes back from it. And there's some cords next to it to make the lights work. They are, are opposite. Black is with the white and white is with the black. And this is the brain. All right. And now Layla is going to show us how her car is doing. Uh -oh. Okay. I have book, two book lights uh, on my car so we can have conse consecutive lights. So, have constant lighting, right? Yeah. Oh, you can put it. Oh, you want to show? Go ahead. This one. So you see the. Uh, now, Layla's. Remember, Ariel's had opposite. Layla's have the same, right, Layla? Yes. So go, go ahead. I'm sorry. And uh, the book lights are have to cover the light sensors. So when I turn on the turn on the car, the car is going to move. <laughs> This one moves really fast, doesn't it? <laughs> oh, can we see it? Can we pull it back? All right, you both can show a little bit. That one's going really fast. It has a lot of light power, doesn't it? So we're still working on how to control it a little better, correct, girls? Yes. yes. <laughs> you both want to work on it? Now, tell everyone what happened since they're photo censored when we went outside. We took these outside on a very sunny day and tell everyone what happened. Well, the cars moved by themselves because the, the sun was shining on both light sensors. And did they go in a circle or did they go in a straight line? A straight straight line. line. That is correct. Okay. Thank you so much for watching our presentation today. We are animators! All righty. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Awesome. Very cool. Fabulous. Okay. Well, thank you guys so much. And now we're going to switch over to the Phoenix Day School for the Deaf. Hello, my name is Tony McGinn. I'm here at Phoenix Day School for the Deaf in Phoenix, Arizona. And I have students who will be showing you their projects that they've created in class. Hi. Hello there. My name is Isaac Nubis, and I'm a junior this year. And hi, my name is Jorge, 
and I'm a senior this year. First, we want to show you um, a project that we've been working on. We have not gotten to the final product yet, but it is a boat. And it's solar. And the reason um, we chose this uh, because it runs off of the sun and doesn't require the use of gas or energy. For the criteria, um, that had to do with the equipment. Um, we have a fan, we have the motor, we have foil, we have electricity that runs through um, the boat. Uh, we use tape as well, um, and it has a wooden base. Our limitations were came with the weight uh, because at first it was very heavy, and so we had to adapt to make it a lighter model so it would float easier. Hello, my name is Kenneth Black and I'm a junior this year. And hello, my name is Daniel Espinosa and I am a junior. Um, our issue uh, was we were looking at problems all over the world and we're in the face of a pandemic. And my partner and I talked about going ahead and building a moving vehicle out of fully recyclable materials. So different things that other people's haven't used um, anymore and have thrown away, glass bottles, steel, different items. Um, and we really wanted to work on a, a project that was most beneficial for the environment that protected the environment. And um, this is the interpreter, the screen is frozen on my end. Um, but we wanted to really use items that had been thrown out uh, and everything is fully recyclable here from the wires um, into what was uh, taken in the electricity. Um, now, this really needs to have more electricity. It doesn't have a very solid power base. Um, so it, it's got, if it has too much weight on it, it would be thrown off balance. So something we would like to improve this uh, vehicle is to make sure it's sturdier. Um, and next we'll show you how it works. Um, so we had to go back a few times to do some repairs and make sure it works and make sure that the electricity could stay with the vehicle and it could go for a longer distance. Um, and we've tested this prototype and we will show you now how it works.
and that's how it works. Um, we use the magnet to balance out the vehicle. Um, so we would have to work on the magnets. Um, once it starts picking up heavier objects, it would weigh down the vehicle and it is also used to balance the vehicle out. So that's another area we need to work on. Hi, I'm back again. And this project I worked on um, a, a big problem that I see in my neighborhood um, is we see a lot of bugs eating up plants and different flowers that are around my neighborhood. So I wanted to come up with something that would deter the bugs from eating all the plants. Um, so what I came up with was having this, um, which is, you know, more environmentally friendly and it runs off the power of the sun and it radiates, it reflects the sun. Um, so you're not using any chemicals. And it also has a good solid um, shell on it and uh, the what's decorating the vehicle is what keeps bugs away. And the wheels, um, can also handle rough terrain. And you can also add more decorations um, and more things to the body of the vehicle. Um, and it has, it's run off of solar energy. And it, it also it is protected from anything that may hit it. So it's got a good solid um, body. So. Um, and it works. Yeah, it works. It can go on a road. Um, it doesn't go off balance. It stays on track. And I'll show you how it works before I talk about how I want to improve this prototype. So I need to um, put in more wires so that it has a stronger electric current um, and go faster. That way, if a bug were to see it, it were to just it would just flee and avoid it. But this is the electrical system I'm working with here. Um, and. I, I wanted to stick to two batteries because I was trying to keep it lighter so it wouldn't be weighed down, but the wheels work very well on this. All right, that's it. Thank you, <laughs> bye. <laughs> Hello there, I'm Osmar. Um, and I have a project that I think will work in the new, near future or sometime in the future. So the, the problem that I wanted to overcome was if you had noticed since COVID-19 um, has hit, um, we've seen a lot of division throughout the world. Um, and people are afraid to come in contact um, and spread this disease around. So I heard that FF, FAA, the Federal Aviation Administration, um, that they did approve for Amazon to have a drone um, bring, deliver packages to individuals' houses. And that gave me a good idea since that was approved um, and their results were to, you know, for safety reasons. And my reasons were to just make it easier, better and quicker 
by making a RC slash drone slash um, assistive vehicle that would assist with making sure packages are arriving earlier um, and on time. So this is my prototype here. This is the R it also it has um, on road and aviation capabilities. Um, and this would help with, you know, if a drone can't, if there's a no fly zone and a drone can't go in there, then it would land and drive until it has reached a fly zone. And it would be powerful enough to go through wind or snow. And each state would have their own product um, that was adaptable to the environment. So if it were Colorado, where there's a lot of snow, it can um, also have a high profile snowboarding um, device on it. So that way it could land in the snow and snowboard through there. If it's in a area that has a lot of rain, it would be waterproof and have that hydraulic system so that if it would, it would get there fast enough and that means less contact, um, human to human contact, um, because, you know, just by one person touching something can make uh, hundreds of people get sick. So that way this helps the world um, and the better way to do it is by remote control. So you'd be at home, you would remote control when you see that this drone has entered your area um, and you don't have to worry about it chasing you. You can control where it would land and you don't have to worry about the dogs chasing it because the dog would attack it. You can just say, good boy, um, and it would fly off. Now, this is my prototype. Unfortunately, it didn't work because of um, not being strong enough, and I'm still working on that. Um, the back, it's, it needs work. It's a little flimsy, um, and we need the uh, drone flying capabilities. That would be where the propeller would be attached so it could fly and it would have more power. It would um, fly, drop off the package. It would then open up or close up into the shape that it needed to be in. And that's what it would do. And that is my project. Thank you for watching. Thank you. Thank you for so much for watching. Take care. Wow, that was so good. Very, very cool. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We really appreciate seeing all of the work that you've put into this and the fact that you're taking it so many steps further, taking your education and applying it in such cool, unique ways. And to be able to see both from the classroom perspective and the homeschooling environment on how that making is important for everyone and, and everywhere. So we are so thankful to have everyone joining us and Shireen, um, especially by bringing these groups together and highlighting these amazing groups of students. Did you want to share anything with them? Um, I can't seem to turn on my video for some reason. Okay, let me go ahead and get that for you. If I, um, right. There we go. Oops. Can you see me? I can. Oh, okay. All right. I can't see myself, but that's fine. <laughs> hey, um, it was, it was such an honor to um, have our kids participate again. And yes, we are in weird times. And I think that it was extremely important to give our incredible, I mean, Victoria is a, a, an incredible mother and you can see her phenomenal girls. And I'm just, can't wait to see what the future brings. 
and um, and the Phoenix Day School for the Deaf. Tony and I have done programming, and she is a incredibly dedicated teacher. The world is blessed to have educators like her in it. And um, thank you for you know for including um, our kids and giving them. Um, you know, a voice into, you know, sh sharing their ideas and participation in this. Well, we are so incredibly thankful. And you always know that you're the spotlight of the event. And what you're bringing to these students is just amazing. And I'm so thankful that they're able to share, you know, in this kind of platform, it being virtual, being at home, um, just being able to communicate and share out to the world. We just love that. So we're so thankful for you to be a part of it. And I know Mary Alice um, is not on right this minute, but she was the one that connected the dots with Shireen and Global Maker Day. We're so thankful for that connection. And we are just incredibly grateful for every presenter today. This is, if you have been watching and joining and seeing all the making going on, we, we're, I can't get through Twitter. I cannot, I, I know I'm going to lose a bunch of tweets, so I'm sorry, but to see all the work that you're doing and, and I don't know if you guys know this presenters, but you're on uh, captured by pictures and, and some video capture and being shared out there on the things that you were just presenting on. So it's great to see that everybody values what you bring to the table. Every maker is important and getting this transition to getting our students being creators instead of consumers, I think is just absolutely skyrocketed in the past few years. It's been wonderful to see. So again, we thank you all for joining us, all the organizers that are in the back, background right now, um, you're welcome to join on and, and kind of end Global Maker Day. Everybody's gonna be a part of this with us, um, if you can. All right, Nancy, Michael, Dresick. Wonderful. Um, I think Katie's in the background and Amy. Um, and so we'll, uh, we'll end this here with um, a fantastic, perfect day. And the truth is nothing is perfect in the maker world, but that's the beauty of this. We ran into some technical issues and we solved it. We figured things out, we worked around. And when we can keep on pushing through and being diligent in what we're doing, then this, it, it will come to completion. It will continue to get better like it always does. And um, again, just being connected to this incredible group of presenters and other makers out there is really important to continue to build that community. Um, Nancy, Katie, or Drezek, did you guys want to end something, something that you want to share to, to end Global Maker Day? <laughs> Nancy's shaking her head no. <laughs> yeah, just... I just have to add that it was just an amazing day from start to finish, um, getting to tune into all of the sessions. Um, you know, to, to pick a favorite would be impossible. They were all so unique and special and I uh, was so grateful for everyone taking the, the risk and putting themselves out there and sharing with the world, um, you know, and creating to make their classroom, their community uh, a better place. So just really appreciative of just wrapping up this day with everybody. Definitely. I am so impressed of everyone's candor about things don't work out perfectly the first time and that it's okay and we just roll with it and watching the students be so real with that and okay with it. Oh my gosh, that was probably the highlight of my day to just have that knowledge about making, not always working that first or second or third time and it's okay, let's keep going. So I need the kids to keep teaching these old adults how to like rock and roll things properly the truth. Nancy, do you want to say anything? I, she, this is her first year organizing Global Maker Day. Last year, she was the host school. So mm -hmm. this is her first year. What was your thoughts on this background? It's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I was doing this and I taught three classes today and I was going out and back. I'm like, it's okay. I can do both. I can do both. It was a lot today, I have to say, but it was amazing. And I've been so excited to see so many things that I can take and use in my classroom and share with my um, teachers. And I know um, I had other people from my school presenting. I know everything. We are just so grateful to be a part of this. And um, I have had emails from parents like, I can't wait to see it. I can't wait to see it. So they're going to be watching later after everything is over. They're going to go back and watch it all again. So I think it's going to be great. Thank you so much for letting us be a part of it. 
Thank you. And thank you all for joining in. And with that, we will close down Global Maker Day 2020. And next year, I anticipate 2021 is going to be the best year yet. I mean, couldn't get any worse, right? So we just got to keep going forward and we got this. So thank you all again. Have a wonderful day.